graphic audio. A movie in your mind. Graphic Audio presents John Sprunk's The Book of the Black Earth, number two, Storm and Steel. Narrated by Terence Aselford, with performances by Thomas Keegan, Thomas Penny, Nora Ashrati, Colleen Delaney, Christopher Sheeran, Steve Wanall, Todd Schofield, Tim Getman, Ken Jackson, Jeff Allen, Paul Reisman, Richard Rowan, James Konachek, Jonathan Foyer, Dawn Ursula, Eva Wilhelm, Andy Brownstein, Tony Nam, David Harris, Eric Messner, Chris Gennebach, Scott McCormick, John Dow, Elliot Dash, Bradley Smith, Nanette Savard, James Lewis, Michael John Casey, Matthew McGee, Gary Tells, Joe Brack, Christopher Walker, Elizabeth Jernigan, Dylan Lynch, David Jordan, Rose Elizabeth Supan, and Mort Shelby. The Book of the Black Earth, number two, Storm and Steel, part one of two. Omens of misfortune roiled the night. The mutton they ate for dinner dripped blood, though it appeared fully cooked. The yard bell fell from its yoke, breaking the foot of Brother Kelko's, the house's sergeant at arms and a black bird got inside the rectory during evening vespers, making an awful racket with its cawing and flapping before the brothers chased it away. So when Captain Apan Amor left the warm confines of the main keep to perform his first rounds of the night, the crimson orb hovering above the city did not surprise him. A blood moon. Bats carved through the swarms of night flies hovering above the grounds of the chapter house, their leathery wings flapping at the end of every dive to regain altitude. Torches along the compound walls held the night at bay as sentries walked their posts. Captain Apan pulled his cloak tighter around his shoulders. Winter arrived early this year, bringing a brittle crispness to the night air. Out in the yard, a squad of his soldier priests huddled around a flaming brazier. He angled his path to meet them. One of the soldiers turned as he approached. Good evening, Captain. Be at ease, brothers. They made space for him, and he held out his hands to the flames in a show of camaraderie. How goes this night's watch? The group looked to the first soldier. No trouble so far, sir. Apan could see the tension in their expressions, the wariness in their eyes. He took note of it, then pushed it to the back of his mind with the rest of his worries. Many of these men were campaign veterans. They knew how to weather a siege. With a nod, he left to continue his rounds. His knees creaked as he climbed to the battlements. He would be 44 this coming spring. He stopped at the top to gaze out over the parapet fortifications. Fires flickered in braziers spaced along the streets surrounding the chapter house where units of the Queen's Guard stood behind wooden mantlets. The siege had entered its third month. The Temple of the Sun destroyed, brought down like a child's sandcastle. Amor's cult evicted from the city by the Queen's command. He burned the decree in the courtyard in front of the entire cohort. He half recalled a speech about never abandoning their post. Afterward, he sent a report to Sayasa explaining the situation. His last report, as it turned out. An hour later, the first royal troops arrived outside the house. The waiting began. Apun went along the wall walk, greeting each man on watch with a few words. They were tired, but he was impressed by their morale. He tried to reflect it back to them, although he felt like a fool. They faced a dire situation. He'd lost more than half his roster when the temple fell. He barely had enough full-rank brothers left to man the walls. It was taking its toll. On top of the long shifts for everyone, they had another problem. The chapter house hadn't been provisioned for an extended siege when the Queen's Fiat came down. Every morning he went over the inventory with Sergeant Provost Urlun. Even cutting back to half rations, as he'd ordered just days into the siege, they had less than a month left before they starved. He had faith they would be relieved before that happened. If not... We will die like true soldiers of Amur. Apan paused at the Northwest Tower. Across the street, stood the townhome of Lord Nidintugal, 
requisitioned as the headquarters for the Queen's forces. Somewhere inside slept the scheming lackeys commanding the siege in Her Majesty's name. He reached out with his Zoana, allowing it to trickle through his senses. Through the Kishargal Dominion, he could feel the solidity of the stone rampart under his feet and the deep flows of energy that passed under the streets, the hidden lifeblood of the city. He followed those currents to the foundation stones of the enemy headquarters, as he had done a hundred times over these past couple of months. All it would take was a few nudges in the right places, and the house would come down like the wrath of the sun god upon their heads. But he resisted the temptation, as he had many times before. Apan glanced northward out of habit and winced as his gaze searched the empty space in the city skyline where the temple once stood. It fell to the queen's pet devil, an evil spirit in human guise. He had never met this Lord Horus, though he heard enough from the late Menarch Ramesh to know the westerner was the tumor infecting Aragash. Apan made for the gatehouse. He checked on the brothers on duty before descending back down to the bailey. Everything looked to be in order, and yet an uneasy feeling turned in his stomach. The same sensation he usually felt when a fight was imminent. He glanced along the walls one last time as he walked toward the central keep, half convinced his nerves were playing tricks on him. No good allowing my imagination to run. What? He halted in mid-step as one of his sentries on the south wall disappeared. The moon shone down on the city, its screen of clouds temporarily lifted. But he watched a shadow move to engulf his soldier as if it had come alive and eaten him. The hairs along the back of the captain's neck stood up, tickled by the subtle itch of sorcery in the air. For a brief instant, the urge to run toward the safety of the keep nearly overwhelmed and unmanned him. Then he drew the sword at his side and called upon the full might of his Zoana. Its power bolstered his courage. But what was his target? Shadows dancing on the walls? Give me light on the south wall! A few seconds later, spheres of golden light appeared, throwing the house's fortifications into stark relief. The wall walk was vacant, no sign of the soldier who stood there only seconds before. Searching the ramparts for his missing soldier, Apan ran toward the nearest stairway. He was about to shout the alarm sign when he felt a burst of magical power. A rent in the immaterial fabric of the other world, followed by a quaver in the air as if a vast presence had just arrived inside the house. He turned at a flicker of movement on the edge of his vision and watched in dread as the sentry atop the southeast tower vanished inside an undulating wall of shadow. Appen could not stop the curse. God's blood! By Amara's holy name, what deviltry is this? More lights! Flood the bailey! Light orbs flooded the bailey. The repaired yard bell began to ring. While his men focused on banishing the darkness, he scanned the walls. The south and west wall were bare. Priest soldiers emerged from the barracks, many of them only half-dressed, but every man carried a weapon. He directed them to take up the empty sentry positions as he climbed to the top of the wall. By the time he reached the top, he was sweating under his armor despite the coolness of the night. He spared a quick glance over the wall. In the street, the Queen's troops watched, but he was surprised to see they weren't massing in formation. He assumed this shadow play was the prelude to an attack. Don't be lulled. This could be the work of the foreign devil. The gods only know what cursed sorcery he possesses. Mindful that the lights made him an inviting target to all the archers below, Apan kept his head down. Be vigilant, brothers! An icy chill ran down his back. A light orb over the eastern wall fizzled out like a snuffed candle wick. Darkness rushed over that section of the wall. He started to run in that direction, pressing past his men who watched with uncertainty when another ball of magical light disappeared over the southeast tower. The captain stopped as all the light orbs between him and the tower vanished, plunging half the compound into darkness. Gray figures shambled like hunchback wraiths along the battlements. They appeared in several places at once, and every priest soldier they touched fell senseless at their feet. Oppen focused his wrath. With a prayer to the Sun Lord on his lips, he unleashed his power. The cracks of shattering stone nearly deafened him as the battlements of the southeastern tower exploded. A cloud of dust filled the sky. One of his soldiers summoned a new light orb in the heart of the shadowed area. Its sudden luminance showed the extent of the devastation. The allure atop the wall had collapsed for 20 paces on either side of the tower. Tattered crimson uniforms lay strewn amid the rubble below. 
Oppen said a silent prayer for his fallen brothers, commending their souls to paradise as he looked for the grey ghosts. His chest tightened as he found no trace of them. They had vanished as quickly as they arrived. The earth groaned as the tower shifted. Oppen turned at the sound. The brothers on the wall behind him lay slumped at their posts. His gaze swept across the grounds. Priest soldiers littered the courtyard, sprawled and slumped over each other. None of them moved. Not a sound broke the silence over the chapter house. Oppen stood alone. A rush of cold air blew over him. It smelled faintly of old rot, like a moldering tomb. He tried to extend his zoana around him in a tight cocoon of protection, but it was gone. He reached for the power, a part of him his entire life, painstakingly cultivated under the tutelage of his superiors until he became a living weapon consecrated to Amor. Nothing remained. He felt as if something had reached inside and hollowed him out. Only decades of training and rigid self-discipline kept him from howling in frustration. Then he saw it, a shadow in the courtyard. Not gray, but black, like a spike of darkness fallen from the night sky. It moved, and Oppen saw the ripple of fabric. A long robe, its hem brushing the ground. A deep cowl obscured the being's face. No regalia or sigils on its clothing. Nothing reflected so much as a sliver of light. Oppen pointed his sword. Be gone from this holy house, spirit of evil! In the name of Amor, I cast you out! The figure stepped forward. The time for posturing is over, Captain. I have come with a message for your hierarchs. Oppen clenched his jaws until his teeth ached. At the critical hour, he failed the men under his command. He now bore a shame he would never forget or forgive. Speak, and I shall deliver your message, Demon Spawn. Yes, Captain. You will. A sudden pain sliced through Oppen's midsection like he had been cut open by a knife. <gasps> He clutched his stomach, but found only the unbroken bronze scales of his outer armor. He saw no blood or sign of injury. With a grimace, he took a step toward the figure in black, but halted. Another line of agony ripped through his innards. Lord of Light, shield your servant from this creature of darkness! The torment moved through his body in sudden, excruciating bursts. Sticky wetness filled his throat. He stared in shock as a stream of blood poured from his mouth. It spattered on the stones at his feet, as black as tar in the moonlight. His sword dropped from his hand, hit the parapet, and fell over the side. Then he followed the weapon, tumbling through the air. His head spun past his feet and around again. He landed on his back. Multiple bones shattered on the impact, from his ankles all the way up to a meaty crunch at the back of his head. He had no idea how he remained conscious. The pain flooded his brain, too vast to comprehend. He squeezed his eyes shut as he rode the tide of it. He wanted to scream, but a great weight pressed down on his chest. Blood trickled from his mouth, his nose, and drenched the padded tunic under his armor. The agony forced his eyes open. The stars glittered above him. He longed to see the sun rise one last time. Oppen looked down past his toes to the figure standing a score of paces away. His killer said nothing. He made no gesture. He merely turned and walked away across the yard. Oppen couldn't form a word as the figure stepped inside a shadow and disappeared. The locals called it Labri Abnu, the old stone. Situated atop a low tor of bare rock, its limestone walls surrounded an elevated platform topped by a brick dome. Round towers protected each of the structure's six corners overlooking the dusty road that cut through the wasted landscape, worn into a knee-deep gully by the wheels of countless wagon trains. The road ran southward along the eastern edge of the Iron Desert until it eventually crawled eastward to the great city of Aragash. A fortress old beyond memory, no one could say who built it. It was certainly centuries older than the Akeshian Empire, its current occupant. Jerome crouched by the two large boulders, studying the fort through a gap between the two huge rocks. A cool wind blew down from the north, kicking up dust devils on the lonely plain. The sun touched the horizon. It was almost time. Scouts, we'll be back soon. <laughs> Jerome nodded as Eminon settled down beside him. The man's nearness was comforting. 
Eminon crouched, alert, his eyes always moving across the rebel fighters scattered amid this cluster of rocks, then to the fort, then the road. The burden of command. Better him than me. Jerom didn't expect the scouts to bring back any new information. The fort would be hard to crack. He tried to settle his nerves, though a useless pursuit. They would calm once the bloodletting began. You sure about this, Em? What do you mercenaries say when you are about to rush into some damned fool situation? We'll eat and drink in hell tonight! Jerome looked sideways at his paramour. It was just a job, Em. Not some romantic brotherhood where we drank each other's blood and pledged our souls to the cause. He had often thought of his fellow mercenaries as brothers. He sometimes missed those old bonds. The rebels, for all their zeal, weren't as tightly knit. That was something he thought of often. He had certain skills valuable to these men, but they weren't his followers to mold. If your plan doesn't work, we'll be caught out in the open. Those archers on the walls will cut us down by the score. Uh, too late to worry about that, handsome. It's time. They crept back through the field of boulders to a gravel-filled depression where 60 fighters in makeshift desert kit Loose tunics and pants, bleached scarves wound around their faces to protect against the sun and wind, waited out of sight. They'd trickled into Eminon's net after the Battle of Omicur, a few at a time, until he and Jerome decided they had enough to form a decent-sized strike group. Then they started to put Eminon's master plan into motion. It was classic hit-and-run tactics. Every few days they emerged from their desert hideout to attack a different target. They sacked merchant trains and supply convoys and took out small outposts on the edges of the wastes. Jerom devised the tactics and Eminon led the operations. So far, it had proven to be a good partnership, both on the battlefield and during the rare quiet moments they'd stolen together. Jerom allowed himself to think about those moments, so few when examined from a distance, but each so blindingly precious. Then he pushed them away as the anticipation of combat pulled at him. This was their most ambitious attack so far, and Jerome wondered over the past few days if they were pushing too hard. The fortress stood well situated, manned with an ample garrison. Jerome considered pushing Eminon to reconsider, to move the attack to a less formidable target. He believed in the rebels' cause, believed all men should live free of the yoke of slavery. Yet a part of him wanted to avoid escalation. He found something romantic about their paltry campaign for freedom. He feared a larger struggle would swallow up too many of the ideals for which these former slaves fought. In the end, he held his peace. He promised to trust his captain, and he would, whatever the outcome. The scouts arrived like silent ghosts and huddled around him, their heads bent low. Nothing unusual happening at the storm. Mahir, the scout leader, a big, stocky Isorani, moved with the grace of a dancer. His bushy eyebrows nearly touched as he spoke. But Song saw something interesting. Jerome glanced over at the smallest member of the scout guard. Sung hailed from the east, from some country none of them had ever heard of before. He claimed to have been an explorer, searching out new trade routes when the Akeshians captured him and put him in chains. Jerome had a hunch, based on the little man's clandestine abilities, that Sung had been a spy. But he allowed the man to keep to his story. Four wagons approach from the north. Coming fast. How did we miss this? Jerome, didn't our source say there weren't any caravans due to come through until next sen night? What about the escort, Sung? Akashian medium cavalry. Two score. Ah, blast. Jerome frowned at the small scout. Cavalry regulars? Are you sure about that? Sung folded his arms over his chest and nodded. They displayed the sigil of the yellow mare. Eminon dismissed the scouts and hunkered down in front of Jerome. That's the sign of the Golden Charge outfit. Tough bastards. How do you want to handle this? They must be heading for the fort. If they get inside, it almost doubles the size of the garrison. We can't handle that many. We'll have to postpone the assault. With luck, the wagons will move on in a day or two and take their escort with them. Eminon's left eyebrow rose slightly. It was an expression Jerome found distracting. Or... Or what? Or we could incorporate this new wrinkle into our plan. How? Eminon bent closer and explained his idea. 
Jerome had to fight not to shake his head as he listened. It was crazy, foolhardy, reckless, and unscripted. But Emanon made the call, and all Jerome could do was go along with it. They quickly passed the new plan to the squad leaders, adjusted assignments, and gave the signal. The rebel fighters moved with quiet efficiency through the rocks and onto the plane. Jerome hurried ahead with the advance units. Timing would be critical. The gathering darkness would help, but any errors would alert the fort garrison and end all chance for success. While Jerome oversaw the positions of the fighters, Sung relayed that the caravan would arrive in five or six minutes, cutting it damn close. He could make out a blurry cloud on the road. He wished he had time to plan this better. Pikes and pole arms would have been a great help against cavalry, but they had planned for a fort assault, and so he was stuck with the tools at hand. Mahir came over beside him while the others set up. This is a bold move, boss. Jerome nodded as he scanned the array of forces. Problem, soldier? Changing plans at the last moment doesn't make one feel comfortable. Plans change. Sure, only... Only what? A couple of the new recruits have been grumbling. Jerome turned and looked him in the eye. Anything I need to worry about? Nope, not yet, anyway. I just wanted you to know. He winked. Covering my ass, you know. Jerome motioned for him to rejoin his squad. As much as he appreciated the vote of confidence, he wished the rebels didn't place so much trust in him. Once all the units were in place, Jerome could barely see them. He peered back in the direction of the fort. There was only one place an ambush could be sprung without any chance of alerting the garrison, and that was directly in line with the boulder cluster. Everything looked good. He waited until the last moment before he found himself some cover behind a stunted olive tree. The ground trembled as the caravan approached. Ten soldiers on horseback rode out front. Some reported true. They were Akeshian lancers, the flower of the Empire's legions. Chain hauberks, round shields, and polished conical helmets rushing past in a storm of gleaming steel. Jerom wiped his forehead. It was too late to reconsider. He had to roll the dice and pray for the best. He didn't have to wait long. The caravan's vanguard passed by his position just a dozen heartbeats after he found cover. They rode past without slowing or changing their demeanor. Both good signs. Jerome counted in his head. When he reached 10, the first war cries erupted behind him. He didn't have to look back to know that Eminon and his squads had ambushed the vanguard. The clash of steel and animal screams told the tale. Jerome drew his sword and started running. The Asarana blade gleamed like molten iron in the dim starlight as he ran to intercept the first wagon. A pair of cavalrymen flanked each vehicle. At the first sign of attack, the nearest horsemen couched their lances and put spurs to flanks. They galloped toward the front of the caravan, granting Jerome a clear path to his prize. The oxen bellowed as the driver yanked back on the reins. He reached for something behind his seat, possibly a weapon. Jerome grabbed him around the throat. A blow from the sword's pommel laid the man out. Jerome jumped up to the driver's bench and slammed home the handbrake. Only then did he peer into the back of the covered wagon. Twenty faces stared at him. An entire infantry platoon filled the back of the wagon. Fully armed and armored, they sat on benches on either side of the long bed. What the... <clears throat> Jerome drew back and swung with both hands. The sword's blade chopped through one of the support poles and the wagon's canvas covering dropped on the sitting soldiers. He stood up and looked around for the closest assistance. Mahir's scouts were engaging a pair of horsemen a dozen paces away. Within seconds, the cavalrymen were down on the ground. Narrow-bladed daggers found the gaps in their armor and helms. The first infantryman to emerge from the back of the wagon received a clip to the temple with the flat of Jerome's sword. Blood flew as the man fell over the side. Then the rest of the soldiers shoved the tarp aside. Jerome found himself facing a hedge of spears. He dove off the wagon. A twinge ran across his shoulders as he hit the ground and rolled away. A horse nearly stomped on his head before he could get back to his feet. The soldiers from the wagon jumped down to meet him. Jerome raised his sword as he faced them. Fear exited his mind. A placid tranquility came over him. The soldiers spread out as they came toward him, their spears held low, as if he were a rabid boar preparing to charge them. Jerram remained still, willing to grant them the first move. He saw mostly young faces confronting him, lacking many scars. Then he noticed the iron collars around their necks, dog soldiers. For a moment he found himself back in the Queen's training camp, struggling to survive its brutal measures. He ultimately shed his collar, but some part of him would never leave that camp. Inspiration struck him for the second time this night. He lowered his sword. 
the dog soldiers glared at each other. Two advanced, the rest held back. Jerob held his ground. A heartbeat later, Mahir's squad rushed from behind the wagon and swarmed over the dog soldiers, knocking them down. Within seconds, the soldiers were disarmed and bound with heavy ropes. Jerome surveyed the rest of the operation. The fighting was all but over now. Most of the cavalrymen had been dragged off their mounts, which evened the odds dramatically. A few soldiers threw down their weapons and ran off. Jerome gave the signal not to pursue. Far to the north, beyond the profile of the fortress, the sky grew dark purple, verging on black. He helped the scouts secure the dog soldiers and then moved down the line. The third wagon had also contained an infantry platoon, which the rebels had uncovered and dealt with, albeit with more bloodshed than Mahir's team. The second wagon remained intact. Its driver slumped on the front bench with a javelin through his stomach. Jerome didn't see any movement within, but he remained wary as he stepped up to the bench. A quick look revealed there was no one inside. He pulled back the canvas. Three long, rectangular boxes sat end to end down the center of the bed. They lay anchored to the floor with steel chains. Jerome spotted Emanon talking to some of the sergeants near the first wagon. Emanon waved back and headed in his direction. Are you all right? Take a look at this. Emanon hopped inside the wagon to examine the boxes. They were wooden, reinforced at the seams and corners with iron, with two key locks each. <laughs> Emanon took a war axe from his belt and attacked the chain securing the middle box. They parted after several blows and he tossed them aside. The rebel captain raised his axe to smash the locks next, but Jerome held out a hand. What if they're inspelled? Emanon lowered the axe to his side. <sighs> I don't know much about Akeshian witchery. You think they could be cursed? Perhaps, but they went through a lot of trouble to protect these chests. They must be important. Aye. Perhaps very important. What if we... Before Jerome finished his question, Emanon chopped down on one of the locks. The blade of the war axe lodged in the iron sheathing. Jerome froze in expectation, but nothing happened. Em, someday that luck of yours is going to fail. <laughs> Probably so. Emanon hacked again, and splinters of wood flew from the box. But that's why I have you to pull my sorry ass out of the fire. When the second lock had been shattered, Emanon heaved open the lid. <clears throat> Jerome clambered up beside him. Ah, I don't believe it. Jerome leaned down and lifted an ingot from the box. He borrowed Emanon's axe and scratched the surface of the bar. The steel blade bit deep into the soft metal. He dropped it back in the box with a solid clank. Gold. <sighs> If the other two boxes are also filled with ingots, what we have here is a big damn pile of money. A king's ransom. Or a queen's. Aye, this must have been heading to Ergash. I wager its tribute from the northern territories, meant for Her Majesty's war chest. <clears throat> Emanon closed the lid and sat on it. And that means we've just stuck a finger in her royal eye. She's going to want this back badly. Jerome played out several scenarios in his head. Emanon was right. If this was intended for the royal treasury, the queen was going to be hot to get it back. Thus far, the rebellion survived by living in the shadows, striking at easy targets, fleeing before the empire's might could come down on them. Seizing this booty could change that. If she wants it back, she'll have to come get it. And in the meantime, I have some ideas how we can put this to good use. Something in the way you say that makes me think you're going to get us in serious trouble. Is there any other kind? And what about the old stone? If we don't strike now, we won't get the chance later. The gathering is almost upon us. Emanon heard rumors of a rebel gathering over the past few weeks. Finally, they got official word. The captains of the various bands would convene. Ever since, Emanon launched a tear, hitting the Akeshians like never before. Leave it. We don't have time. Jerome indicated the storm clouds brewing to the north. Shit! The captured lancers were put to death, quickly and without sympathy. The dog soldiers were freed and given the choice to join the rebels or flee on foot. Not surprisingly, most of them chose to stay once their collars were struck off. The rebels and new recruits climbed aboard the wagons and set off. 
sweat dripped down Horace's face despite the cool breeze blowing across the long, narrow courtyard. It ran in his eyes and in long rivulets down his naked torso. His skirt clung to his thighs as he circled around the patio's confines, sandals scuffing across the pavestones. His left hand was bunched into a fist, his other splayed open like a fan, both ready to react at the slightest provocation. Across from him, his opponent circled as well in a long robe of black silk, face hidden under a deep hood. A slender tentacle of water snaked across the courtyard. Horace lowered his right hand to block. A burst of heat erupted from his palm and the water jet evaporated in a sizzle of steam. He punched with his left fist while visualizing an image of a burning rope. He shaped the Zoana inside him into a fiery lariat to hurl at his foe. The flow sputtered and fought against his control. Before he could compel it to obey, a force seized his ankle. He fell hard on his back. <clears throat> Horace rolled onto his side and leapt back up, just in time to be struck square in the chest by a swarm of tiny white balls. <clears throat> the swarm shoved him back while they exploded against his bare skin in a shower of icy needles. He reacted out of instinct. A barrier of pure Shinar energy formed in front of him, deflecting the remaining cold spheres. Their impact thudded against the invisible energy and spread webs of frost across its surface. Hissing from the sting of the icy splinters already lodged in his flesh, Horace tried to channel a flow of Imuvar into a sudden gust of wind. He felt the power pressing against his ka, building up inside, but again it refused to conform to his control. He grasped for it, and suddenly the Zoana filled him. Instead of summoning a strong breeze, a streak of bright gold, almost like an impossibly long icicle carved to resemble a tongue of flame, sizzled across the courtyard. His opponent darted sideways to avoid the evocation, and it struck the wall on the far side of the courtyard, drilling a hole as wide as a bread plate completely through the stone blocks, the edges of the hole rhymed in hoarfrost. Horace stopped and stared. What in the world just happened? Before he got an answer, a sharp pain tore through the center of his chest. <laughs> Then, not half a heartbeat later, a blast of frigid air swirled around him, freezing the sweat coating his body like he'd been dropped into a barrel of ice water. Bright light blinded his eyes as he felt himself falling. Horace tried to brace himself with his hands, but he fell on his back for a second time. All at once, the Zoana drained out of him. For a moment, he was consumed by a terrible feeling of loss. Then a shadow loomed above him, blocking out the midday light. What say you, Lord Horace? Horace raised both hands. <laughs> I yield. Lord Ubar pushed back his hood and squatted beside him. Are you injured in Ganas? He who does not bleed. The nickname the young lord had given him after the first time he used his power to deflect a chaos storm in the desert because he did not display the Immaculata. Pinpricks of blood dotted his chest in crimson constellations. <laughs> I don't think so. Nothing more than my pride. <sighs> He climbed to his feet with Ubar's assistance. <sighs> a wave of dizziness took hold of him, but it passed quickly. For the past couple of days, he had taken to dueling in the private courtyards of this, the Queen's Villa, in the small oasis town of Hikok, two days' sail up a northern tributary of the Typhon River. It was Her Majesty's retreat from the city. They arrived eight days ago, the Queen and her private entourage, including some members of the court and a small army of guardsmen. As first sword, Horace attended as required. He felt glad to leave the city and his official duties for a while. The queen assigned Lord Ubar to take over his magic tutelage. Queen Byleth chose to retain Ubar in her court, despite his father's treachery. Or perhaps because of it. Horace still did not understand the intricacies of Akeshian politics. In any case, he found the young lord smart, capable, and good company. Ubar peeled off his robe as he sat down on a tall stool at the edge of the courtyard. A court physician hurried to his side and began binding the several long gashes covering the young lord's limbs and body. Horace felt a twinge of guilt at the sight. I'm sorry you have to suffer for my training. My teachers used to say we suffer the Immaculata because the body is too frail to contain the Zoana. I don't know if that's true. It was all very metaphysical. Perhaps you are blessed, First Sword. I wish there was something I could do to repay you. Just learn well, and swiftly. <laughs> I'm trying, but I'm so unsure of myself. He looked over at the hole in the wall. What was that? Ubar nodded toward the newly made cavity. A complex weaving. I believe it was Giru and Morda blended together. But there was something else involved as well. 
Horace suspected he knew what that extra component was. He could still feel the echo of the void in his chest, wanting to break free. I can't control it sometimes. It's like the power wants to explode out of me all the time. The sage Masanapuda said all Zoanii begin as larvae, and it is only through rigorous study and self-examination that we emerge from the cocoon of our own ignorance. He sounds like the kind of person who has an answer for everything. Horace's exploration of his powers seemed an adventure in frustration. Sometimes he felt so strong he could move mountains, but again and again he failed at the simplest tasks. Exercises for young children such as lighting candles required all his concentration, and he still botched it half the time. Duels were the worst experiences of all. Time and time again, Ubar bested him because he could not control that strength. No wonder Lord Ubar called the Shinar Dominion the Unseen Realm. You are doing better. You're just being kind. You finished me with ease. Not so. I was forced to use every trick and tool in my arsenal to defeat you. That's the point. I'm so much stronger than you, I can feel it sitting here next to you. This is true. Your aura shines like the sun. It's almost blinding. Exactly. No offense, but I should be able to win every time. Battling another Zoanii requires more than pure strength. It takes control and experience. <sighs> Ubar slapped him on the back. It will come to you. You must not be impatient. It was difficult for me, too. As a child, I wanted to know everything right away, always trying to run before I could stand. But to unlock the mysteries of the Zoana, you must steal your mind and open your car. Only then will the path present to you. Let's go find a cool drink. They exited the courtyard through an arbor of vines with beautiful orange and pink blossoms that led into the villa's enormous gardens, surrounding them in a riot of colors and scents. Stone pathways wound among beds of well-pruned topiaries and burbling fountains. Statues in alabaster, marble, and bronze decorated niches carved from the hedges. <sighs> Horace wiped the sweat from his forehead with the back of his arm. Lord Ubar smiled at the gesture. Whew, I find it difficult to believe you are not cold. What, this? Horace looked up at the clear blue sky. This feels like a fine spring day back in Arnos. You don't know anything about real cold. Snow on the ground, all the streams and lakes frozen solid. It sounds dreadful. No. The change of the seasons is quite magical. You appreciate the warmer months for sure, but there's something beautiful about a blanket of fresh snow covering everything. Like the world has been reborn in virgin white. You miss it? Huh, I suppose, sometimes. But it's not as simple as being homesick. After my wife and son died, no place truly felt like home. I was happier at sea, to tell you the truth. Then, when I washed ashore here, it was like a new beginning. A fresh start. On the other side of the garden stood a gate leading back into the villa proper. Sunlight gleamed off its high walls and narrow minarets built of white and red stone. Ubar paused at the gate. He opened his mouth as if to say something, but then closed it. Is something wrong? I was not sure how to broach this subject with you, Enganas. Forgive me. I have news that you might find disturbing. <laughs> Just spit it out. It concerns the town of Omikor. An uneasy feeling gripped Horace's stomach. He hadn't heard much of anything about the town since the Queen took him on a tour to see the siege firsthand. The memory of the massive storm ravaging the Crusaders' defenses still haunted him. I have heard the Royal Legions conducted a new assault just days ago. Did the town fall? Not yet, Enganas. But it seems to be only a matter of time. Horace felt the sudden urge to sit down. If Ubar's account was true, then hundreds, perhaps thousands, of soldiers would die. The Great Crusade would end. What does that mean for me? Should I be angry? Should I want revenge for men I've never met and didn't know? What does it mean if I don't? They were soldiers. They knew the risks when they signed up. But what soldier could understand the risk of a Keshian sorcery? As thoughts flowed through his mind, Horace realized he wasn't angry. The feeling stirred inside him a melange of sorrow and disgust. Those lives were being wasted. Fathers, brothers, sons dying because their rulers could not find a peaceful way to resolve their disputes. Kanadu, thank you. I'm glad you told me. It is an unfortunate affair. Horace reached for the handle, but the gate into the villa opened before him. A man carrying a thick leather valise walked through. Mezim. Horace's new secretary stood before them. 
Nearly a head shorter than Horace, with dark bronze skin, he wore a long skirt of white linen with a straight red border, as befitted a member of the Khalata caste of freed slaves. After he was named First Sword, Horace soon realized how much responsibility the post entailed. He made inquiries and found someone to help him navigate his duties. Mizim understood the Akeshian system of government backward and forward. Every day, Horace said a prayer of thanks for him. The secretary bowed when he saw them. Lord Horace, pardon my interruption. I have been searching for you. Ubar nodded to Horace. I will see you later in Ghanas. Tomorrow, at the third bell? Very good. They clasped forearms, then Lord Ubar went inside. Mizim handed Horace a bundle of flattened scrolls. I have some dispatches from the city, as well as a petition from the Royal Armory requesting that your lordship approve the purchase of five tons. What do you know of Omikor? It's an outpost town. Sixteen leagues northwest of Erugash, on the fringe of the Iron Desert. Aye, Belum. I am familiar with the location. I assume you are referring to the recent attack on said town? Hmm. What do you know of it? Nothing was mentioned in today's reports. Shall I request a detailed update from Lord de Patusu? No. Don't bother the High General. As you wish. Horace entered the villa, and a chill touched him as he entered the huge house. The Queen's Villa covered a parcel of land the size of a city block, with numerous abutting outbuildings. Her Majesty seems well pleased by the recent developments in the war effort. Mazim followed behind Horace. Yes, she would be. Horace stopped in the middle of a broad corridor. He wondered if this could be his opportunity to build a bridge between Akeshia and the West, now that the invasion had been blunted. Both sides might be willing to come to the bargaining table. I need a lever. Something to convince the Queen of my good intentions. Mazim juggled the documents in his arms until he came up with a particular scroll. Your inquiry of Omikur reminds me. I have information about that other matter. Hmm? Are you talking about Jeram? The first assignment Horace gave Mazim when he hired him was to track down Jeram's whereabouts. No one in the Queen's court could or would share the information. Horace learned through various officials that the legions did not keep records for dog soldiers, the derogatory term they used for slaves drafted into the royal army. Horace did not believe them. He saw firsthand the meticulous Akeshian practice of recording everything. Somewhere, Jeram's name lived on a list. Horace intended to find it. Don't tell me. I have confirmation that a slave by that name was transferred to Omikur a little more than three months ago. That would have been right before the Tamuras. Forgive me, Belum, but I have found nothing after that point. The siege appears to have been a rather messy affair, with many dead and missing on both sides. The commanders of the Third Legion report they have no soldier named Jerome among their surviving forces. I'm afraid I must conclude this man likely died in battle. No. Horace started walking again at a swift clip. I do not accept that finding, Missy. Keep digging. I want to know for sure. We will not give up until someone produces a body, do you understand? I will redouble my efforts. Good. What about the chapter house attack? They'd heard of the killings at the Fortress Temple of the Order of the Crimson Flame just a few days ago. Details were sketchy. Horace ordered Mazim to find out what he could. I'm sorry to say the latest reports don't convey much more than before. The soldiers surrounding the house testified they heard noises coming from inside, screaming and such. It only lasted a short time, but the commander in charge decided to break down the gates and investigate in any case. They found everyone dead. The injuries are supposedly quite brutal. Decapitations and disembowelments, yet no signs of who or what killed them. Horace frowned as the description reminded him of a night some months ago when he and Alira fell under attack by Idimu, demons, at the royal palace. I'm gathering quite a collection of those. It's like a curse hanging around my neck. Come find me if anything new turns up. Horace turned to a flight of stairs leading downward into the foundation of the villa's main building. One final matter. Mistress Alira has returned. Horace froze. Not long after the events at the Sun Temple, when he thought they agreed to stay together to see where their relationship would lead, she left. Vanished two months ago, leaving a cryptic note about tracking down loose ends. In that time, he neither saw nor heard a word from her. He did not know if she was alive, dead, in trouble, or out. Thank you. He continued down the stairs. Warm, humid air washed over Horace as he descended into a long, brick-lined chamber with a double-vaulted ceiling. 
One of this villa's most interesting features was the underground bath. At the far end, taking up most of the floor space, lay a pool large enough to bathe the crew of a twin-masted schooner en masse. Men and women lounged by its edge, eating and drinking while they soaked. He went to a row of wooden stalls along the north wall to change out of his clothes and was intercepted by a young slave girl. She stood nude but for a silver collar around her neck. The collar and her pale skin, much lighter than most Akeshians, reminded him of the first time he met Alira at the palace. The parallels to this moment made him uncomfortable, but he allowed the slave to lead him into a stall and stood while she undressed him. Horace tried to think of other things, but his thoughts turned to Alira, escalating the awkwardness. When he was disrobed, the slave escorted him down to a smaller pool of very hot, foamy water. The steaming water grasped his calves, washing away the tension from his muscles. The sensations became more intense with every step he descended. He had been looking forward to this all morning. After a thorough washing, she led him to the main pool. Horace didn't look any of the other bathers in the eye as he lowered himself into the water. Not quite as hot as the first pool, the main bath was the perfect temperature to relax. The pool's edge was slick under his palms, where his burn scars touched the polished stonework. He lounged against the side of the pool. Some of the other bathers looked over at him, but they kept to their private clusters. Horace sipped from a chilled cup of wine, trying to rest, while a multitude of problems jostled inside his mind. Jerome's disappearance, Alira's absence, the duties of his position, his problem controlling his powers. Now he faced the new campaign against the Crusaders at Omicur. He had hoped his life would ease after the Timorus. Instead, it grew more complex. He wanted to run to a place quiet and peaceful. I could always go back to sea. A tempting idea. Life aboard a ship followed routines with hard work. No women to distract him, no politics to muddle his head, no sense of impending doom. Just the wind and the water. But he couldn't go back. He'd witnessed too much to be content as a ship's carpenter ever again. As much as it frustrated him with its elusiveness, the Zoana coursed through him now. It was the salt in his blood, as the sailors put it. May I join you? Huh. Horace nearly spilled his cup when Alira came up behind him. For a moment, he couldn't say anything, could only stare at her in mute wonder. He'd almost forgotten how beautiful she was, especially unclothed with the water lapping about her hips. Her long blonde hair flowed down, curling around her shoulders, down to the upper slopes of her breasts. Horace blinked and forced his gaze back to her face. I heard you were back. Yes, I just returned. He wanted to ask where she had been, but held his tongue. Something about the way she regarded him, a wariness he'd noticed before she left, put him at a loss for words, afraid to say the wrong thing. The slave girl brought more wine, and Alira accepted a cup. Horace allowed his to be refilled while he watched Alira, trying to read her expression to garner some hint of how she felt about him. So, did you accomplish your mission? Horace kicked himself mentally. If anything was sure to drive her away again, it would be prying into her affairs. She'd made that much clear. It's difficult to say. <clears throat> Will you be staying long? I don't know yet. I'd like... It would be nice... I mean... I'm trying to say I missed you. <laughs> I missed you too. Horace breathed easier. Then he remembered they were both naked, sitting just a couple of feet apart. His awkwardness returned in force. How have you been getting along while I was away? Well, I haven't received any challenges since that night, so that's been good. Alira turned to watch a pair of noble ladies waiting nearby. Do you think they like you better now that you've saved their queen's life? Or are they just too afraid to confront you directly? That's tough to say. No one at the palace speaks to me except for the queen and Lord Ubar. Yes, I've heard that he was recalled to court. An odd development. I thought so too. But I'm glad Byleth brought him back. He's a good man. Nothing at all like his father. Be careful, Horus. He's still a Keshian. And Zawaniai. Backbiting and deception are bred into them. He frowned at her depiction, but nodded so as not to start an argument. I'll keep that in mind. While you're at it, keep both eyes on Byleth as well. The queen is no blushing ingenue. Uh, point taken. 
While you're here, you can help me avoid making any disastrous mistakes. You're the first sword, Horus. Any mistake can be disastrous. However, I'm not as adept at court politics as Lord Mulsabar. You'll need to find your own way. The mention of Mulsabar's name sobered Horus and doused his mood. He missed the old nobleman. Part of him still felt responsible for his death. He finished his wine and set the empty cup on the ledge of the pool. Queen Byleth entered the bath chamber with a small entourage. The queen strode to the hot pool where her handmaidens removed her clothing and jewelry. Lord Jantu, as ominous as ever in his black robe, stood nearby as the queen was washed. He had taken to growing out his hair, which now hung down to his collar. Beautiful, isn't she? Alira gazed at the queen. <coughs> I... Uh, sure, yes, I suppose. She still hasn't selected a new bodyguard to replace Lord Gilgar? Not yet. She's been genuinely upset since, well, you know. I bet she has. Everything felt disjointed, as if they'd reverted back to being strangers again. Horace tensed. As her attendants rinsed her, the water sluicing down her body, the queen locked eyes on Horace from across the chamber. He felt her terrible magnetism working on him. Keep your mind on Alira, fool. I've missed you. You look like you haven't been getting enough sleep. The way she tilted her head gave him hope of an invitation to speak more intimately. I worry about you when you're gone. I've told you before, Horace. You don't need to worry. Just like that, the invitation vanished. Horace didn't know what to say next. In the same moment, the attendants dried the queen and she departed the chamber without coming to the large pool, taking her retinue with her. Horace could not stop a sigh of relief. Finding himself in the presence of both Alira and the Queen was beyond uncomfortable. In fact, he'd prefer to continue this conversation somewhere more private. He turned to Alira, but before he could suggest it, the slave girl interrupted with an invitation to dine with the Queen. Ah, of course. The slave backed away. Horace wondered how Alira would react, yet nothing in her demeanor changed. If anything, she appeared amused by the situation. Can I see you tonight? I'll be in my chambers, if you can get away from the Queen. Before Horace could think of a witty reply, she left the pool. <sighs> the landscape of his mind extended like a vast sheet of leaden glass, devoid of features or landmarks. Pale light filtered down from the hazy sky, where the sun, a distant orb of deeper gray, pulsed with fierce energy. It was his ka, the gateway to his power. Horus focused on the endless plain. This was his hidden inner world, constructed with Lord Ubar's help. Here he found solace from the pressures of the outside world, though they never left him completely alone. His zoana, for one, was something he couldn't escape, not even here. He felt it throbbing behind his ka, calling to him like a siren's lure. Early in his training, he often accessed it from this relaxed state of mind, but lately he found it problematic. He realized he was focused on the gateway to his power again and tried pulling his attention away, but the orb pulsed faster. A moment too late, he noticed it had opened, just a crack, but that was enough. A rush of Shinar uncoiled across the ethereal sky of his hidden world in streaks of violet so deep they were almost black. Horus did nothing for a little while except observe the display. It was beautiful in its terror. He reached out to the bands of energy. He did not force it back through his ka, instead aiming to coax it. This was something he'd worked on. The power would react to the manner in which he handled it. A harsh grip caused the Zoana to gush like a bursting dam, but a softer approach yielded a more measured flow. So far, he hadn't been able to make it work. This time wasn't any different. The Zoana refused to return of its own accord, as if it was playing coy. Horus pushed back against the frustration building inside him, threatening to unravel his concentration. Ubar was a dutiful instructor, but there was little he could tell Horus about the Void. The Shinar Dominion was a mystery to most sorcerers. Not even Lord Mulsabar could deliver much insight about its workings. Horus hoped to find his own path through trial and error, but the way continued to elude him. The feeling that there was something wrong stayed with him. As he couldn't pinpoint the source, the feeling grew. Ultimately, Horus gave up on coaxing the flow of Shinar and went straight to the gateway. 
With a firm shove, he slammed it closed. The purple bands evaporated, leaving the sky hazy gray once again. The uniform blankness calmed him once again, soothing away his qualms. His head buzzed with a pleasant euphoria. It was almost like floating. Absently, he noticed that the muscles in his physical body had begun to unkink themselves. He allowed himself to drift along on these sensations, not pushing his thoughts in any one direction, content to simply exist in this tranquil moment. A face shimmered in his consciousness, its soft edges surrounded in golden hair, delicate eyebrows pinched together as her lips arched in a delicious frown, the blue of her eyes dazzling like a clear midsummer sky. Passing underneath this vision, Horace gazed up at the woman he loved, or thought he loved. Things had become complicated. With his first wife, Sari, he remembered they had just fallen in together like two old friends, as comfortable with each other as if they shared one mind. But it was different with Alira. She tested and goaded him, challenging his every decision. Being with her was intoxicating and demanding. Points of bright light flickered on the edges of his awareness, disturbing his calm. Alira's face shuddered like a leaf caught in a stiff wind and gently faded from view. Horace fixed his gaze on the disturbance. A bank of dark gray clouds billowed far out on the plain, moving toward his position. Every so often, light would twinkle inside the inky mass, ghoulish green like the lightning from a chaos storm. His calm evaporated. The gray fog bordering his hidden world no longer felt soothing. Instead, it had taken on a disturbing aspect. He sensed hostility within the approaching darkness. He felt compelled to investigate, even though the part of him still connected to the conscious world wanted to break free. Something about the phenomenon drew him on. He felt himself moving forward. Distant noises echoed. Faint crackles. They were almost familiar, but not quite. Then an invisible force took hold of him. He struggled against the unseen grasp, even as it pulled him deeper into the murky clouds. His mental vision vanished in the haze. Panicked, he reached for his physical body. The grasp gave another hard yank, and then the world exploded in a rush of gray and white. <laughs> Horace blinked as the vision faded, to be slowly replaced by the contours of a familiar room. White plaster walls surrounded him. The ceiling was sapphire blue. The wooden floor, reassuringly solid beneath his crossed legs. He placed both hands on the floor, palms down, and took comfort in its solidity. Lord Mosebar's Ganser mat lay spread out before him. As always, when looking upon it, his gaze was drawn along the geometric shapes that seemed to move and pulse as if the mat were a living thing. He followed the pattern through each of the four elemental quadrants to the central circle, inside which sat the figure of a tiny man stitched in bright platinum thread. When he first started meditating with the Ganser, the pattern served to calm his mind as well as focus it. But lately, tranquility grew ever more elusive. Rather than moving forward, his study of the Zoana seemed to regress, eroding his fragile confidence, feeding a cycle of uncertainty and apprehension. Lord Ubar tried to help, but it seemed no one could diagnose this particular infuriating problem. Each day he expected a revelation, a sudden epiphany that would make sense of the power within. Yet day after day, week upon week, he fought and struggled for the barest scraps, failing far more often than succeeding. He'd learned power often passed from parent to child, which explained the structure of the Akeshian society. However, nothing in the texts he'd read detailed outlander magic. His parents possessed no special gifts of mysticism or anyone else in his family. His life before the crusade had been mundane, neither great sorrows nor extravagant bliss, until he lost Sari and Joseph. From that day, everything changed. Some part of him drove him to the sea to seek his own obliteration. Suicide hadn't been a conscious decision, but looking back, he could see how he set on a path to self-destruction. He washed up wrecked on the shores of this new, ancient, bloodthirsty land, and his life began anew. Battered and floundering, he clung to the only lifeline within reach, his power, and prayed it would someday carry him to a safe haven. 
Each night, he went to sleep exhausted and disappointed. He stood up, his joints aching as if he'd been sitting for hours. The image of the dark clouds lingered. Gone now. Just a figment of my imagination. Horace was the first to arrive for dinner. Twelve red leather couches surrounded the long dining table. Goblets of beaten gold and crystal stood arrayed on the polished surface, along with a variety of porcelain bowls and cups. At first glance, Horace took the utensils to be gold, too. Then he looked closer at the pale hue and decided they must be an alloy, possibly electrum. A centerpiece of four candles surrounded by fresh lotuses completed the elegant tableau. Horace walked around the chamber. Tapestries imported from the West covered the walls from floor to ceiling. In them, men and women in classical garb reveled at a grand feast, eating and drinking and making merry. A sideboard stood set with several sealed jars, presumably wine or spirits, as well as an array of forks and cutlery. Another door opened and two men walked in. By the cut and design of their robes, they both belonged to the Zoanii class. Lord Timuni was older and exceedingly slim, with a long, narrow chin to match his sharp nose, while Lord Oriathu spread short and stout, his clothes straining to contain his paunch. Both men were shaved bald in the custom of the ruling class. Horace resisted the urge to reach up and touch his hair. The Zoanii looked to Horace in unison, and they both strolled to the opposite side of the table in a not-so-subtle gesture. Horace did his best to ignore them. He was already sweating under his tunic, despite the cool breeze blowing in through the open shutters. More guests arrived, eleven in all, including him. All nobility of various ranks, the cream of the royal court. Horace knew their names, and even a little about the cliques into which they aligned themselves, mostly thanks to Mazim. They all watched him. Not openly, that was not the Akeshian way. Instead, they glanced at him with sideways looks and expansive sweeps that were meant to appear to take in the entire room, but he noticed their eyes lingered on him a little longer than the artwork or the place settings. The lesser players circled their superiors, but not just those with which they were allied. No, they circled their foes as well in an intricate dance that somewhat resembled the movement of fish schools flowing in and among each other, sometimes matching their movements before breaking apart for no outward reason. All were circulating around the two largest fish in the room, Lord Timuni and Sarlaskar Balashi, who was the acting commander of the Queen's military since Prince Zazil's mysterious disappearance, an incident no one, in typical court fashion, spoke of as if all understood that members of the court vanished every so often, and such things were best left undiscussed. The machinations made his head hurt. Fortunately, servants orbited the room with carafes of wine and liquor. Horace gulped down the first cup of red wine and sipped at the second, feeling somewhat better. A door opened at the far end of the room. Lord Shantou entered, wearing his sibilant customary robe of deep black, head freshly shaved. Four handmaidens entered behind him, all wearing identical purple gowns cut to expose their left breasts, each bare nipple painted gold. The handmaidens formed an aisle from the door, through which arrived Queen Byleth. Never one to allow herself to be outshone, the queen wore a sheath gown of indigo silk so sheer as to be virtually transparent. A heavy necklace of gold and sapphires did nothing to distract from her sensuality as she sauntered to the table. The queen held up her arms as if inviting an embrace. My lords and ladies, please be welcome. She looked to Horace and held out her hand. Lord Horace, come take your place beside me. He took the couch beside her. The upholstery was so supple as to render lying on it a sensual experience. Byleth told him she designed these pieces especially for him, presumably to make him feel more at home. She had been so excited to show him that he hadn't the heart to tell her they were an affectation of the elite class of the fallen Nemean Empire, not something modern Arnasi used in their homes. Though their padded tops were comfortable to lie on, the odd position made it difficult to eat or drink without making a mess or choking. 
Byleth smiled as her guests got settled. My cooks have been busy with a special surprise for tonight. That's very kind, Your Excellence. I have the latest reports from Erogash. There aren't any new developments on the Chapter House attack, but I've ordered a complete inquiry. Byleth placed a hand on his arm. I've seen the reports, Horace. Please be at ease tonight. Our duties can wait until tomorrow, yes? A dozen servants in fine dress entered, carrying covered silver platters. These platters were set down on the table and the covers removed all at once to reveal an exotic selection of foods. Horace leaned forward for a better look. One dish was lined with rows of quail, stuffed and roasted in a glaze. Another was piled with slabs of grilled meat that looked like Arnasi beef. He found it hard to believe. There were also two soup bowls, fresh bread slathered in melted butter and honey, and other wonderful foods. The aromas were divine. Before Horace said anything, the servants began loading his plate with choice selections from each platter. I hope you like it. I went to great lengths to obtain the finest delicacies of your homeland. This is... Extraordinary. He smiled and made a show of trying everything, even the tortoise eggs, which he really didn't care for. The other guests ate more selectively. As they picked at the unfamiliar food, it reminded Horace of when he had first arrived in this country and how alien everything had seemed. The queen raised her glass. To our continued friendship, may it ever grow closer. Everyone drank to the toast. Horace hesitated a moment before he sipped from his cup. While his closeness with Alira entered a strange, uncertain place since the Timurus, his relationship with the Queen flourished. Not too hard to guess why. I saved her life, twice, and brought down her enemies. As a slave girl passed, the Queen reached out to stop her. Lord Horus, I believe you met my newest acquisition? She pulled the girl by the wrist to stand before them. Horus had met her. She bathed him down in the hot springs. Her pale skin glowed almost translucent in the candlelight, contrasting sharply with her long chestnut hair. This is Kelsia. She's from Hestria, which borders on us, if I'm not mistaken. Horace dried his lips with a cloth napkin. You are correct, Excellence. He kept his face impassive, as if they were discussing the weather instead of a person made into property. He also avoided looking directly into the slave's eyes, even as the queen stroked the girl like a prized pet. Well, I had to replace Alira. Byleth gazed up at the slave with a smile. This one is quite talented. With a wink, she dismissed the girl. I adore the hot baths at this house, especially when the weather turns cold. I wish I could spend all winter here. Tell me, have your rooms been warm enough at night? Quite warm enough, Excellence. She reached out and touched his wrist. Just a light touch, but it sent a jolt up his arm and set his heart to beating faster. I forget that you are accustomed to the cold. You must find us hot-blooded, eh? Well, I certainly understand why your people wear less clothing than we do. And I've come to appreciate the balmy climate, I must admit. Lady Ishmi informs me the women of Arnos cover their entire bodies when they go out in public. Even their hair is bound under caps. Is that true? As eyes shifted toward him, Horace put down his cup. Well, Arnosi ladies certainly dress with uh, a heavier fabric. As for their hats, there are many fashions. I'm not exactly an authority. Byleth signaled and a servant came over to refill Horace's cup, this time with a wine with a deep amber color. Try this. It's a rare vintage from the Jade Kingdoms. I cannot pronounce the name, but I find it entrancing. The evening progressed, Byleth insisting Horace be served first for each course. He tried to protest to no avail. Several times he found her watching him eat, almost like a doting mother, but with a predatory gaze. I never tire of hearing about your homeland. What else is different? Almost everything, Excellence. Our customs are almost completely unalike. Such as? Well, you prefer to eat sitting on the floor while we sit in chairs, or sometimes on tall stools. <laughs> stools? Are you teasing me? <laughs> Not at all, Excellence. You must call me Byleth. I command it. 
<clears throat> As you wish. The foods we eat are very different. Yours are so hot they burn my tongue. Even your native fruits have a sharper taste. She leaned closer. And do you find that all this heat makes for hotter passions as well? Perhaps in some cases, excellent. Byleth. But overall, I find most of your subjects to be rather even-keeled, as we mariners might say. Perhaps more so than many of my countrymen, whom you might consider ill-mannered in comparison if you were to meet them. Horace, I am constantly amazed at your candor. If all the men of Arnos are like you, I think it must be a very honest realm. He felt the eyes of the nobles upon him and wanted to slide down under the table. Uh, I don't know about that. We have our flaws, certainly. Indeed. One of them seems to be a desire to invade my territory. The sudden turn in the conversation sobered him like a slap across the face. He didn't know how to respond. No, <laughs> forgive me, Horace. That was impolite. I do not blame you for the actions of your government. Indeed, you have acted with as much honor as any member of my court. You understand this concept of honor, yes? Uh, well, I'm trying to, excellent, Byleth. In any case, I thought the crusade had been halted. For now. Yet I know something of the ways of your military, Horace. They will regroup and try again. They are nothing if not persistent. In that we surely agree. I only heard about Omicor today. I was disheartened that the situation is coming to such a grim end. She speared a slice of orange and put it in her mouth. After she swallowed, she took a sip from her glass. We feel no empathy for those who would try to steal our lands. One noblewoman whispered in Lord Oriathu's ear, and they both chuckled as they looked in Horace's direction. He focused his attention on the Queen. Of course not. However, if there was a way to avoid future war, that would be a good thing. Don't you agree? The conversation around the table died down until the only sounds came from the servants as they moved about the room. The Queen popped an olive into her mouth. Mm. Of course. If the circumstances could be decided in a way that favored Erugash, but your leaders are not inclined to negotiate in good faith, Horace. Furthermore, the consensus of the Imperial Court seems to be to crush the savages, uh, pardon me, the Crusaders, and push them back into the ocean. Well, it's actually a sea. Pardon? What do you mean it is a sea? The ocean. Technically, it's a sea. We call it the Midland Sea. The ire vanished from the Queen's face, replaced by a look of intense curiosity. Truly? Horace pushed his platter aside. Dipping his finger in his wine, he drew a rough outline of the Akeshian coastline on the table's surface, from the shores of Arnos, Altaya, and Etonia in the north, down to the headlands of the southern continent. This... He tapped the open space between Akeshia and the western nations. Is the Midland Sea. Farther west, past a few other countries, is where you'd find the Airguard Ocean, which stretches on for, well, to the edge of the world, as far as we know. Everyone strained to see the crude map. Fascinating. We know so little about the West beyond our own colonies. Tell me, are these things universally known among your people? Well, it's common knowledge among sailors. I was friends with the pilot of the Bantu Ray, the ship I sailed on before I crashed here. His name was Baleus Raymiger, and he knew more about the seas and coasts than anyone I ever met. May I ask a favor, Lord Horace? Would you meet with our royal cartographers and help them produce a more accurate map? Horace hesitated before answering. He remembered how paranoid Belais had been about his precious charts and logbook falling into enemy hands. Apparently, navigation material was considered a national secret, However, a gesture of goodwill might convince the Queen of his sincere hope for peace, or at least that she could consider him a trusted, neutral arbiter. He believed the Akeshians wanted peace as much as he did. They just needed to know they could trust him. Of course. However I can be of service. Byleth caressed the back of his hand. I'm glad to hear you say that, Horace. I've been thinking about your role as my first sword. 
Now that the thorn of Omicor has been removed from our side, we intend to devote our attention to crushing the slave rebellion once and for all time. I wish you to undertake this duty. Me? Oh, excellence, I'm not sure I'm the right choice. I am. Uh... She smiled at him in a way that made his heart beat faster. Horace struggled for a suitable reason to turn down the honor of being the one to lead the effort to crush the slave rebellion. Queen Byleth may have assigned this duty to him, but he had no intention of harming the slaves fighting for their freedom. In fact, he'd rather help them achieve their final goal. Excellence, I wouldn't know the first thing about ending a rebellion. I could help more by bringing our two nations together in peace. Perhaps I could act as an ambassador. Horace shifted on his couch as everyone else filed out of the room. Lord Shantu was the last to depart, casting a stern gaze around the room before he closed the door behind him. Once alone, Byleth squeezed Horace's hand. Horace, you are the only one I can trust with this. Too many in court wish to topple me from the throne so they can fight over the scraps. I need you. I need your strength now more than ever before. I finally have a chance to rule my city in truth, and I will not allow it to fail. He put his hand over hers. Her bones were so slender he felt he could crush them with the slightest pressure. What if you appealed to them? These fugitive slaves are your subjects too. They only want to be free the same as any other man or woman. She pulled her hand away. No. They have revolted against their lawful queen, and in doing so they have damned themselves in the eyes of the gods. They must be stamped out, or else my reign will collapse. What if you approached the problem in a different way? The queen held out her glass to him. It was empty. I'm listening. He filled it to the brim. We could take a two-pronged attack, so to speak. Use the military to suppress the violence and protect your citizens, but also change the laws to improve the lives of your subjects, especially the slaves. If they didn't feel backed into a corner, they might be willing to find a peaceful solution. It wouldn't hurt to offer clemency to those who vow to give up their revolt. You never failed to surprise me, Horace of Tynes. Most of my Zoanii would leap at this chance to garner my favor and increase their own authority. And yet you remained focused on your ideals, as unchangeable as a stone. I will consider your ideas. She traced her fingertips down the side of his face. You are a remarkable man, unlike any I've ever met. Stay with me tonight. Horace's stomach dropped. Sweat broke out across his forehead and down the back of his neck. Uh, excellence, I... Uh, I'm not sure what to say. She leaned into him and brushed her lips across his chin. Say you will make me yours this night. I can't. I'm sorry, but I have feelings for another. <laughs> Why should that matter? She studied his face. Zoani I are free to love whomever they desire with no attachments. Is it my former handmaiden? Bring her along if you like. My bed is large enough for all of us. Your relationship with that little freed slave you keep has nothing to do with what I want. He pulled back from her. Excellence, it has everything to do with me and who I am. Her eyes narrowed. And if I should insist? He felt a blunt pressure against the back of his head. Just a light touch, but he realized she was questing at the edges of his mind. He envisioned a steel helmet clamping down on his head. Their eyes locked in a silent contest of wills. In the recesses of his mind, a soft voice rose. You want her, so just take her. Right here. Show her what kind of man you are. The door opened and one of the queen's handmaidens entered. Byleth glared at the slave, but the probing touch vanished. Horace remained on guard as the girl knelt beside the queen and handed her a small roll of papyrus. His concern for his own safety vanished as the blood drained from the queen's face. Even on the terrace of the Sun Temple, as she was about to be wed to the Prince of Nisus and possibly murdered thereafter, he hadn't seen her so shaken. What is it? Byleth banished the handmaiden with a curt gesture and then crumpled up the scroll, throwing it on the table. A caravan was attacked by a band of rebel slaves. 
They seized the gold intended for our royal coffers. Gold which we need to fend off our enemies. I am truly sorry. Was anyone hurt in the attack? Hurt? The soldiers guarding that convoy had better be dead, or they'll wish they were when I flay the skin from their backs and nail them to stakes along that road as a reminder of what happens to those who fail. First sword, you will issue an order in our name at once, pronouncing death for anyone who harbors or aids the rebellion. Horace frowned. Such an order would be a death sentence for Alira and her associates, as well as, he suspected, thousands of Akeshian commoners. It would begin a persecution that could last months or years. It's not unlike what the Great Crusade intends for this empire. She doesn't understand what she's asking me to do. Byleth stood up. If you are going to remain in Erugash, you will obey our commands, or you will face our displeasure. Defeated, he bowed his head. As you wish, Excellence. Rest well, Lord Horace. We depart for home in the morning. The beauty of the villa gardens changed, but was no less impressive when haunted by night, when the darkness blurred the outlines of blossom and leaf, their lush fragrances riding the cool breezes. Alira walked the narrow paths between the bowers with quick steps down to the western edge where many secluded nooks and niches could be found. Her ears strained at every turn, half expecting to stumble upon illicit lovers in fierce embrace, or worse, cloaked conspirators hatching nefarious schemes. But the luck of the Silver Lady went with her, delivering her without incident to the spot of her own secret assignation. She found Sefkahed standing by a pond, Moonlight reflected off the still waters, bathing the woman in silver luminance. <clears throat> Sefka had turned, then she smiled. I'm glad you sent word to me. Elira came over and stood beside her, both of them looking down into the brilliant surface. I'm sorry we haven't spoken in so long. Don't worry, Elira. I'm the one who knows you best. Now, are you going to kiss me, or do I have to beg? Elira allowed Sef to lean in for a kiss. <clears throat> After a few seconds, she pulled back. Sef ran her fingers up and down Alira's arm. I've missed you. I won't ask where you've been, but I'm glad you're back. Please say you can stay for a bit. For a short while, I needed to see you. I like to hear that. Alira moved sideways to avoid another kiss. Not for that, Sef. I need to talk. All right. You got my attention, Alira. What's wrong? I've been investigating the massacre at the Chapter House. In Erugash? Alira, you shouldn't be poking around in that. The Queen was livid when the news reached us. If she ever found out that you've been... I've been careful. Trust me on that. But have you heard any details on the murders of the Order Brethren? Just a few things through the network. Every member of the house was killed in a single night. Sentries outside heard strange noises, but nothing to suggest a battle was being fought within the fortress until the Queen's guards forced an entry and found the bodies. I've seen the bodies. They were ripped apart as if a pack of wild beasts had torn into them, but not with teeth or claws. Weapons, knives and pinchers, perhaps. Alira shook her head and looked back down at the pond. Nothing made by human hands could have caused the wounds I saw. You mean it was sorcery? But Alira, most of the Queen's court was here with us when the attack happened. Indeed. And outside the court, what other group in Erogash has the power to slaughter dozens of men, most of them sorcerers to boot, without the neighbors noticing? Sef shook her head slowly. If you're right, you realize what it means... Outsiders must have infiltrated the city. How is that possible? The wards on the wall and gates... I know. It's crazy to consider it. But it's the only theory I can come up with. That's why I needed to talk to you. To get advice on how to proceed. Seth frowned as her head tilted to the side, allowing her hair to fall down from her face in a lustrous black wave. You mean you want to talk to the network? Before, I would have taken this directly to Cypher... But after what happened... No, it's all right. I understand. But I can't pretend this came from me. My superiors are going to know someone supplied it, and I'll have to tell them the truth. I accept that. 
Does this information come with a price? Shall I tell them it's a peace offering? No, just say I thought you needed to know. Seth stepped closer again and caressed her arms. The touch exhilarated, but Alira fought it. She knew what Seth wanted. Some part of her wanted it too, but things had gotten messy between them, mixing the mission and their personal feelings for each other. Alira tried to break it off, but every time she saw Seth, the feelings returned in full force. Stay with me tonight. I can't. You know the other handmaidens would talk. It would mean trouble for both of us if the Queen found out. Then I'll come to you. After the Queen retires for the night, I can slip out and we can... No. Alira took a long step backward, breaking free of Seph's touch. Seph Kahet looked as if she wanted to keep pursuing, but held back. Why not? You said you missed me. I do. But this can't go on, Seph. You're still with the network and I'm outside. But it's not really that, is it? It's him. Knight was right. You've fallen for him. Alira, he doesn't know you like I do. He can't love you the way I do. Alira turned away to hide the tears forming in her eyes. It doesn't matter. I know what I have to do, and I'm doing it. I can't have you here, in my heart. It's too painful trying to juggle everything. Please, this isn't easy for me. But it's what has to happen. She waited for a response. None came. Nothing but the stirring of leaves in the wind. Alira turned back to find Sefka had gone. The darkness closed in around her as if a blanket fell over the moon. Standing by the pond, she let her tears fall. Near midnight, and Horace did not find Alira in her room. He left and started down the hallway in the direction of the stairs. He went downstairs and reached the villa's atrium without seeing anyone except a pair of guards walking patrol. <gasps> he almost ran into a young woman in a short dress hurrying in through the front entrance. Then he saw her gold collar and recognized her as one of the queen's handmaidens. Pardon me. She kept her eyes on the floor as she moved out of his way. Please forgive me, great lord. It was my fault. I'm trying to find someone. You know Alira, right? She's not in her room. She is in the gardens, near the meditation pool. Kanadu, have a good evening. As he continued out the door, Horace looked back over his shoulder. The handmaiden was climbing the stairs. Her head was bent down, her shoulders shaking, as if she were crying. I hope it's not something I said. <laughs> Poor girl. Horace found Alira standing beside a scenic pond. He held back for a moment to watch her, standing in the pale moonlight. She bent down to smell the petals of a broad white bloom. In that instant, he wished time would freeze. She dwelt in that moment as the purest thing in his life. She's a spy. Dealing in duplicity, and yet she's never false to herself. Why can't I be that way? He lived torn between two worlds and two desires. He shifted his feet, the leather of his sandals scraping across the stone underfoot. Alira turned. She kept her hands at her sides. Her eyes hid in deep shadows. How long have you been there? All my life. I needed to find you. She stepped forward, flower petals brushing against her legs. Here I am. I have something for you. Horace reached into his sash and pulled out a small object. She took it in her hand, a carving done in a light wood polished to an amber sheen. A sea turtle? It's from time. You told me you and your family lived there when you were young. She held the carving in both hands, examining the detail. That was thoughtful of you. Things changed since you left. The job is... well, it's much more work than I anticipated. It's an important position. You've come a long way since I first met you. I'm still the same man. At least, I hope I am. It's not so easy to tell. You've been gone. I had to hold things together here without you, without Mulsibar. I tell you, Alira, I feel like a fraud most of the time. People make demands of me, and I don't know what to do anymore. The Queen wants you to do something? He didn't want to get into this with her, but it was pointless to hide it. She'd find out soon enough. She wants me to oversee the halt of the slave uprising. She wants you to crush them. Kill them all and make an example of them. Yes. Something like that. And you didn't refuse? I, I tried to refuse. It's not as easy as it sounds when royalty is staring you in the face. She expects to be obeyed. Her head was bowed so he couldn't see her face in the gloom. 
I'm sure you tried your best. I did. What about you? What have you been doing all this time? The same thing I was doing when you met me. Of course. Your mission. It must be nice to only have one worry. I worry, but the threat is not ended. If anything, it's worse now. How could it be worse? The Sun Temple is destroyed, the Queen is safe now, and I'm a member of her court. I wouldn't let anything threaten you. She looked up. Her shining eyes pierced him. Because you're so vital, she couldn't deny you anything, right? She could never make you betray your ideals. It's not like that. I don't intend to let anyone be hurt. I'm in a position to help the rebels, to bring about a peaceful solution. <laughs> then you don't know anything, Horace. The rebels aren't interested in a peaceful resolution. They will fight until they get what they want. He hadn't considered that. All these things he wanted to do, everything he wanted to be, perhaps they weren't as compatible as he'd believed. Then I guess I'll have to convince them. The same way you convinced the Queen to be merciful? She's considering my plan. Alira shook her head. No, she's goading you into doing something you don't want. She's in your mind, Horace. She owns you. <laughs> Sounds like you're the one trying to control me. And you're angry that someone else has my attention. She turned away so her profile faced him. The moonlight cascaded down her long hair, turning it to white gold. Then I feel sorry for you. You don't know how lost you are. If I don't handle this problem, Byleth will find someone else. And you can bet that person won't have any problem killing as many rebels as it takes to put the matter to rest. Is that what you want? It's not about what I want, Horace. I'm not the one making the decision. Damn it, I'm trying to make this work. I'm trying to bridge the gap, but you aren't making it any easier. I know. I am sorry, but I cannot help you with this. No? Then maybe you're the one who's lost, Alera. Or maybe you never cared in the first place. He flinched, even as the words came out of his mouth, but he was too angry to take them back. She had cut him deeply, then twisted the knife. Instead, he stalked away. The Zawana stirred inside him like a caged beast, wanting freedom. He kept it on a tight leash, though it would have felt good to lash out, to destroy something and watch it fall to pieces, to feel the power surging through him. <coughs> Upon arrival at his quarters within the palace, he threw open the door to his suite. His nerves were frayed. His cheeks hurt from clenching his jaws so hard. Relax. Exploding isn't going to help. As he paced, he glanced down at the floor and considered meditating, but he wasn't in the mood. Instead, he went to the spirit's cabinet and fished out a bottle of plum wine. He looked at the pale violet liquid inside and opened the bottle. He went out onto his private balcony. Sitting in a chair, drinking from the bottle, he looked out through the arched branches of the trees and caught a glimpse of the river's faint shimmer. The wind picked up, shaking the leaves. Get your mind off her before she eats you up. But his thoughts crept back to her like a beaten dog slinking home. This wasn't how he imagined her homecoming. Now everything was ruined, shattered. The alcohol spread through his body in a warm wave that washed away the hurt. He rode the wave as the stars wheeled above the villa. He soared high above the shadow-dappled ground, Stars sparkled in the deep black sky above him. Scattered moonbeams stabbed through him, leaving no mark in his ethereal flesh. Horace shot into a bank of gathering thunderheads. His vision dimmed for a few seconds, then he was flying over a rippling desert plain. A powerful energy burgeoned inside him, growing as the clouds stirred around him. They moved in a circle with him at the epicenter, slowly at first, but with increasing velocity. The air cooled. The power inside him flared, building in waves until it exploded in a satisfying crackle of thunder. He was the storm, the driving wind, the pouring rain. His voice was a hurricane. Far below, among the dunes and barren rocks, a town huddled behind scarred stone walls. Lights shone within, waving feebly in the rising wind. More lights twinkled outside the walls, but his wrath focused on the stone towers and slanted rooftops inside. He did not know from whence this ire for the town grew, nor did he care. All that mattered was the power inside him, surging to be unleashed. With a thrust of his hand, a jagged bolt of lightning flashed down at the town. Its green glow illuminated a maze of streets and hovels huddled around the larger structures. Flames erupted from inside the building he'd struck. 
thunder boomed in his ears, drowning out every sound except the howling winds. Again and again, his incandescent fury rained down, and with each attack, he felt his strength flowing through him like a burning river, scorching away the tribulations of a mundane life that haunted him for too long. Tired of being weak and at the mercy of others, he reveled in this newfound supremacy. But a voice in the back of his mind whispered it wasn't new. No, he'd always had this potential, buried so deep it might never have come to light if not for... Lightning flashed, blinding him, and in that moment he was back aboard the Bantu Ray as the converted merchant Carrick struggled in the grip of a nightmare storm. Verdant light flashed in the sky, and something opened inside him like a hidden inner doorway opening for the first time. Dark energy seethed within. Then a wave of cold water crashed over him, carrying him away, and the moment was lost. He watched the fires roar below and the tiny figures scurrying to escape the destruction he wrought. He wanted to be free from the restraints that bound him, free to roam the earth, doing as he pleased, destroying all that stood in his way. Yet some force held him in this place. He strained against it, ceasing his rampage on the town to direct his strength in this new direction to breaking free. Yet the power holding him resisted. He struggled harder until something started to change inside him. Bits of energy drifted away from him, charging the air with their power, while at the same time a weird sensation akin to vertigo twisted his core. His view of the vista below grew dim and distant, as if the world were fading from his sight. Or perhaps he was fading. The last sound he heard was a peal of thunder growing louder. Horace bolted upright with a sharp pain in his chest. For a heartbeat, he didn't know where he was. Am I the storm over the desert? Or the man? He sat in a padded chair on the balcony of his room at the villa where he'd fallen asleep. The trees below swayed, their leaves thrashing in the wind. Something thrummed in the air like a host of vibrations, invisible and inaudible, faintly palpitating across his skin. Rubbing his chest through his tunic, he started to stand up when the floor rumbled beneath his feet. Is this a dream? The floor bucked, sending him stumbling into the stone balustrade surrounding the balcony. The balcony shuddered. As it tore away from the villa, Horace jumped through the doorway back into his room. A piece of bronze sculpture tumbled over from the bedside table onto the floor. Horace scrambled for the door. He heard the first detonation as he reached for the latch handle. The windows in his room exploded, spraying glass everywhere. Shards nicked his arms and hands as he covered his face. Through his fingers, he saw a growing light outside the windows, pulsating orange and yellow. Raw heat washed across his back as he threw himself to the floor. He grabbed for his power and tried the first thing that came to mind, conjuring a cloud of cool mist around himself. The Zoana stuttered inside him, present but not obeying his will. He pulled harder, and suddenly he couldn't breathe. He was inside a solid bubble of water. It filled his mouth and nose, suffocating him as the inferno washed over him. He thrashed on the floor and tried to spit it out, but the liquid just kept coming. He was on the verge of passing out when he finally managed to sever his connection to the power. He vomited up the last of the water. He got on his hands and knees. The flames had retreated leaving the room clogged with smoke. <coughs> he crawled to the nearer window and peeked over the scorched sill. A stand of trees stood far back from the east side of the villa. A party of men stood on the grassy sward between the villa and the woods. Eight men in dark robes. Their gleaming masks stared in his direction. The bronze featured fashioned into the likenesses of strange beasts. Three of the masked men raised their hands, fingers together like a salute. A prickle ran down Horace's spine, a heartbeat before the barrage of bright lights rushed toward him. <laughs> Horace ducked under the window. The walls rocked as hostile magic struck the side of the villa. Fire seared the outer brick facing, and ice froze the mortar solid. A windstorm battered the manor while the ground shook. Crawling back from the window under a storm of frozen hail, Horace could feel the structure of the villa shaking around him. A jet of flame flashed in his peripheral vision. Fighting back his fear, Horus reacted as he'd learned from Ubar, using his feel of the Zoana to follow the tether of power back to its source on the lawn. 
Before he could talk himself out of it, he seized a thread of Shinar and severed that ethereal connection with a quick slash. The fire evaporated in an instant, leaving behind a haze of smoke and soot. Horus was starting to stand up when a gale of bitter wind surged through the window and threw him backward. His arms spun as he tried to catch his balance, but the wind held him captive until it smashed him against the opposite wall. Eyes squeezed shut, he struggled to free himself, but the winds buffeted him without relent. After three tries, he found the connection to the Imovar Dominion fueling the winds and sliced it apart. He fell to his knees. A blinding light shone through the window. Something was building outside the villa, over the figures on the lawn. Horus felt its power coalescing, a combination of at least two dominions. It was time to abandon ship. Staying on his hands and knees, he scurried toward the door. He opened it just in time. The concussion lifted Horus across the threshold and into the hallway. He landed on his side, jamming his elbow hard against the floor. He fumbled his way to his feet. The hallway was dark. The floor, he noticed, was slightly askew. This whole damn house is coming down. He glanced in the direction of the Queen Suite, but then ran in the other direction, toward the south wing, to Alira's room. The floor shook again, and he almost ran over Mazim, before a flash of light illuminated the secretary running in the opposite direction. Mazim! My lord! This way! They ran to Alira's room. The door was closed. Horus shoved it open with his shoulder. <clears throat> Though the oil lamps were unlit, the window shutters were open, allowing stilettos of moonlight to stab inside. He approached the bed where a long lump lay under the sheets. A silvery streak flashed toward him from the shadows behind the door. Horace flinched away, almost tripping on the loose rug, as the point of a narrow blade hovered in front of his face. Horace? Alira lowered the knife. Then he saw a slender woman standing behind Alira. It was the handmaiden he had seen earlier. Alira gestured to the slave woman. This is Sifkahit. What's happening? Horace held out a hand. It's an attack. We need to get out of here. Just a moment. He waited anxiously as Alira knelt down and reached under the small bed. She retrieved a leather satchel and slung it over her shoulder. Then she nodded to him as she stood up. Where are we going? To find the queen. Horace led the women out to the hallway where Mazim waited, glancing anxiously all around. Distant lights through the windows cast flickering shadows across the walls. Horace started down the hallway in the direction of the royal apartment, but Alira jerked him to a halt by grabbing his arm. Wait, stop! All at once, Horace felt the overwhelming urge to shake her. Here he was, risking his life to save her, and she couldn't help herself from questioning him. What? What's the plan? We find the queen and get her away from here. Hopefully to someplace safe. And where is that? I don't have a damn clue. All right, let's just try to get out of this alive. She released his arm. All right. He spun around and hurried down the hall, trusting the others to keep up. Some of the floorboards had sprung loose, making for treacherous footing. As they got to the main body of the villa, the sound of quick footsteps made Horace stop short. He peered around a corner as Ubar appeared, hustling toward them. Horace stepped out into the open. Lord Ubar, it's me! Lord Horace! The Zawani eye slowed his gait. I was coming to find you. Please hurry, we must get to Her Majesty! That's where we were heading. Are you alright? Quite fine. Ubar paused to take in Mezim and the Handmaiden. But we must hurry. The energies surrounding the house are growing in magnitude. Horace could feel it too. A gathering sense of dread from outside the villa's walls, like a great wave about to break over the gunnels. They found the first body at the mouth of the corridor leading to the Queen's private suite, a member of the Queen's guard. Three more lay behind him. The stench of blood and human waste filled the hallway. Ubar held a sleeve to his mouth as he stepped past the soldiers. Horace forced himself to look down at them. They were my responsibility, and I failed them. Horace thought to look for signs of sorcery on the bodies, burns or bizarre fractures. But instead, he saw blood from long slashes, the lethal strikes delivered to their throats and across their torsos. He saw a shadow move in his peripheral vision, a heartbeat before he thought to call out a warning. A figure cloaked in black from head to foot emerged from the darkness of the hallway. His garb looked like leather, but it fit his body like a second skin. A knife, its blade blackened as well, leapt out at Lord Ubar. Horace tried to focus his Zoana to strike the assassin, but the power refused to answer his call. No! The point of the knife stopped six inches from Ubar's turned back, as if it had run into a stone wall. The attacker struggled as a faint shimmer of frost grinded his blade. Then the ice flowed up his hand and arm. He pulled back as if for another thrust, but Ubar raised a hand. 
The assassin stumbled backward, his blade dropped, clutching at his chest. He sank to his knees, then fell over, unmoving. A stream of clear water dribbled from his open mouth. A blood knife. Legendary assassins from Scavia. I'm sorry. I tried to... <gasps> A second shadow behind Ubar, in the same black skin suit, detached from the opposite side of the corridor. Ubar started to turn. <laughs> Horace lunged forward, hoping to grab the knife before it struck. The assassin stopped and turned, reaching back, but crumpled before he could complete the action. Alira knelt behind him. She withdrew a slim knife from his back and wiped the blade on the dead assassin's clothes before she stood up. Horace noticed her hands shaking ever so slightly. He wanted to say something supportive, but nodded instead. Lord Ubar's face had turned a pale shade of bronze, his eyes slightly glassy. Horace took him by the elbow. You all right? Ubar nodded twice, his lips pressed tight together. We should continue. The door to the Queen's apartments stood closed. Ubar reached for the latch, but Horace stopped him. Motioning the young lord aside, Horace opened an inner pathway to the Mordab Dominion. At least he tried to. His car remained closed. He actually felt embarrassed as the seconds passed and he fumbled to access his power. Why is this happening now? Hurry! Horace gave up and motioned to Ubar. Freeze the doorframe. Ubar nodded and stared at the doorway. Frost formed along the wooden frame. Horace could sense the presence of the Zawana, could feel the tiny pockets of moisture hidden inside the wood begin to freeze and swell. When Ubar was done, Horace backed up a step and kicked the door. The latch handle mechanism flew apart and the door swung inward to reveal a battlefield. A massive hole loomed on the northern wall, opening out into the night, the edges of the hole singed black like the inside of a kiln. Two more dead guardsmen lay on the floor, one frozen stiff, the other bent backward until his spine snapped. One armored man remained standing, the big lieutenant of the Queen's Guard. Horace couldn't recall his name, but there was no sign of Captain Dybeen. The Queen stood in front of the bedchamber in a gauzy nightdress. Fiery eruptions outside the villa highlighted her features. Her eyes wide, her lips pulled back in a snarl, nostrils flared. Streams of semi-solid air projected from her hands, one after another, too fast for Horace to follow. Lord Chantou stood beside her, hurling jets of raging fire at their foes. While they battled, attacks from the outside continued to rain upon the villa. Now that he was here, Horace didn't know what to do. Ubar ran over to join the Queen's defense. Horace saw a translucent barrier of what looked like water vapor form around Byleth. Before he could decide how to handle the situation, Jean Tu glanced over. Man the east windows! He'll try there again any moment! Horace turned to obey, but Alira pulled him to a stop. He looked at her and saw the anxiety in her eyes. We need to leave, Horace. The fires outside reflected in Byleth's eyes as she turned her head. Blood dripped in a steady stream from a cut along her left cheek. No! We stand against these traitors who would dare attack their queen! With a long look to Alira to show the tight spot he was in, and a quick glance at the handmaidens, Horace entrusted them to Mazim and crossed to the other side of the room. He stepped over a mess of cushions, pillows, and clothing strewn over the floor. The windows had been shattered. Their shutters had broken loose. Glass fragments lay scattered everywhere. Horace peered out, but couldn't see anything more than the darkness. He considered conjuring a ball of light, but decided against it. For one thing, there was no sense drawing attention to himself. Also, his recent failures to connect with the Zoana weighed on his mind. He felt out of control. Lord Mosabar warned that Horace might someday become a danger to himself and those around him. It seemed that day had come. Horace looked to the doorway. Alira stood just inside it with the slave woman by her side. The way they stood together, so close, made him wonder. Almost as if they were sisters. Of course she still has friends in the Queen's service. She spent so long in the palace. I should have made the effort to free them as well. Byleth stood before the hole in the wall. Lord Chantu had fallen to his knees, bloodied hands pressed to his face. Ubar stepped to take the Lord's place beside the Queen, but a hail of tiny stones ripped through his watery barrier. A small flat stone tore through Horace's thin tunic, slicing his side. He pulled the ripped fabric away. A quick look assured him it wasn't bleeding much, though he couldn't see if the stone exited the wound or remained lodged inside. Ubar lay in a heap beside Shantu. Byleth held her ground alone, her sheer dress ripped to bloody shreds. Horace turned to go to her when he felt something outside the villa, building up like the explosion at his suite, but this was far more powerful. 
There was nowhere to go, nowhere to escape what was coming. He rushed across the room, pausing only to grab Alira by the wrist and haul her over toward the hole, trusting the Handmaiden and Mazim to come along. Horus let go when they reached Ubar. As Alira knelt down beside the youth, Horus grabbed the queen around her waist. <laughs> he dropped to his knees, dragging them both down to the floor. The villa shuddered. Horus pointed at Shantu, unconscious on the floor. Get him over here! The tall guard lieutenant seized Lord Shantu by an ankle and pulled him over to the group. Meanwhile, Horus was bracing himself. This was his best idea, and he had no way of knowing if it would work. The force gathering outside the villa continued to grow. The queen's face was ashen, her lips pressed into a tight frown. He reached for his car. He felt the energy pulsing behind it, but the fear that it would elude his grasp almost overwhelmed him. Then he felt a firm grip on his arm. Alira looked at him intently. She nodded. I can do this. He delved into the pathway to his power. All physical sensations flew to the back of his mind as the Zoana came to life within him. It filled him, allowing him to feel every muscle and sinew, every bone and organ. He channeled the Shinar Dominion into the strongest, widest barrier he could. His nerves burned as the power expanded into an invisible sphere around them and solidified. A titanic force slammed against the shield, crushing Horus down on top of Byleth. They were both pressed against the bare floorboards. Wood splintered as the weight increased on top of them. Horus felt the power fueling the shield starting to slip from his mental grasp. The ache in his chest grew too painful to ignore. He started to think of contingency plans, but nothing came to mind. And then the floor gave way beneath them. His stomach dropped in a sickening rush as he fell. He glimpsed a stark light as they plunged to the floor below. Horus lay still, concentrating on just breathing. His heart raced. His blood thrummed in his ears. He was alive. He peered over at Alira and saw her blinking in the gloom. Blood welled from a cut on her chin, but otherwise she appeared all right. He started to turn toward the queen when he heard a noise from above. He looked up, and his heart almost stopped as a shower of plaster and wooden beams rained down on them. Horus struggled to reinforce his Shinar barrier before the villa's roof crashed down on them. All light died. Pressure built up inside Horus as he fought to hold up the massive load. He imagined his internal organs mashing flat, imagined his blood trying to escape through his eyes and eardrums. He held on to his Zoana with every ounce of control he could summon, but it was unraveling fast. Not now, focus! He redoubled his effort to hold on to the power, keeping them alive. Just as he thought he had it under control, the floor underneath opened up and he was falling again, falling into darkness. There was some shifting as the others adjusted their positions inside this, their rocky prison. Horus settled back in the dark. His head pounded, but the pain was as nothing compared to the agony cutting through his chest, as if a sharp knife were trying to split open his breastbone from the inside. Somehow he remained conscious when they landed in one of the villa's many subcellars. Now, an hour on, maybe two, and the strain of maintaining his protective shield was taking its toll. But it was the only thing standing between them and the mountain of debris threatening to crush them. This is how I die? After surviving the desert, surviving slavery, a duel to the death in the Grand Arena, and the enmity of the entire priesthood, I must die trapped under a house like a roach? He could almost hear his mother's voice. But he had so much potential. Potential. Aye, that and a copper bit will buy you a bowl of gruel in any dockside slop house in Avis. Sif, go ahead, get your elbow out of my back! Someone moved hastily at the Queen's outburst. Horace couldn't help smiling. Oh, enough of this sitting in the dark! A globe of pale blue light appeared above them near the top of his shield. The seven of them, himself, Byleth, Jean Tu, the tall lieutenant, Mezim, Alira's friend, and Alira, lay around a concave bowl of impacted debris. At least I'll die in good company. A queen, a lord, a soldier, my secretary, a slave, and... He didn't know how to describe Alira. That was part of their problem. He didn't know where the spy ended, and the woman began. Every time they spoke, he grew defensive, so afraid she, the person who knew him best, couldn't stand what she saw when she looked at him. Is it guilt speaking? Or am I protecting myself from getting hurt again? I almost didn't recover when Sari died. I don't know if I could survive another abandonment. I thought I saw you in my chambers before our precipitous fall. It's curious, my dear, how often you keep turning up 
after having left my service upon gaining your liberty. Alira lowered her eyes. If my presence offends, Majesty, I will remove myself. Hardly possible. It seems we are all stuck here together for the time being. So I suppose we shall have to put aside propriety for the time being, eh? Stones clattered as Lord Ubar sat up. Uh, Majesty, did you know the identity of the attackers? I believe I saw six of them in all. <coughs> eight. I counted eight people outside my chamber window. They wore masks. No one spoke. Horace harbored his own thoughts about those robed figures. He'd been expecting some form of retribution from the Sun Cult. It wouldn't have surprised him to discover those dark robes were blood red, the distinguishing hue of the Order of the Crimson Flame. Killing him and the Queen certainly stood high on their list of priorities. And they might still succeed if we don't find a way out of here. He didn't have many ideas about that, unfortunately. All his power was dedicated to keeping the shield intact, and it was flagging. Perhaps... What was that? What? I heard something. I did too. Then Horace heard it from somewhere above them, like metal biting into loose earth. Rescue? Or our killers come to finish the job? No one spoke. Even the sounds of breathing abated as the digging got closer. Every second, Horace's head felt ready to burst. The flows of Zoana inside him fluctuated until he clamped down on them again. Sweat dripped down his forehead. His tongue felt swollen. Finally, a shaft of pale sunlight pierced the earthen shell above them. Horace blinked and shaded his eyes. Alira lay beside him, looking mostly unharmed. The cut on her chin had stopped bleeding. Dust covered everyone in the pit. The queen and her bodyguard sported some minor wounds. But Ubar's appearance shocked him. The youth's face was a mask of dried blood. He moved slowly as the others gathered around the opening. Horace crawled over to him. Take it easy. He put a hand on the young lord's shoulder. We're not even sure what's up there. I don't sense any Zoanii above. Horace took a moment to extend his own senses up through the debris. He didn't feel anyone accessing the Zoana above either, but it was difficult to be sure. Just to be on the safe side. Stay put. Ubar settled back against the stony bed as the hole above them widened. Horace made out iron tools, spades, and picks, digging away the mass of earth and stone covering them. A tool struck the invisible barrier. A brown face appeared in the open space, peering down at them. He recognized Ianatum, the villa's chief steward. Horace, lower your protection and let them inside. That was easier said than done. Horace eyed the concave ceiling above them. If he released the barrier, he had every reason to believe the debris would bury them alive. Ubar touched his elbow. First sword. I do not have my father's skill with the Keshargal Dominion. But if you were to fuse the soil over our heads together, I believe it might hold long enough for us to escape. Byleth crawled over to him, her hair caked with dirt, her face smudged and bleeding, yet she remained exquisite. She took his right hand. We will lend you our strength, First Sword. Jean Tu, attend us. Alira had to shift out of the way to make room as Jean Tu crawled past her. The sorcerer took Horace's other hand. The Zoanii's dark eyes gleamed faintly in the gloom, and Horace thought he detected a hint of a smile. <coughs> All right, what do I do? Without warning, raw power surged into him from both directions. <coughs> the power joined the flow of Zoana already operating inside him and reinforced it. The added power shored up his weakening protective barrier immediately. He now felt he had plenty to spare, though the pain in his chest grew more intense. He opened himself to the Kishargal Dominion. He sent the second channel of power straight up into the rock and dirt packed above them and saw the solution. He called upon a third channel, this time from the Dominion of Fire, and he joined it to the flow of Earth. The mingled skeins entered the loose earth and spread out. Each piece of stone fused to the debris around it. The effect spread outward and upward. Horace kept it up until a broad shell had coagulated above them. Then he backed off. The ceiling was now a solid curve of mottled stone. Ready? Everyone nodded. Holding his breath, Horace drew back on the power holding up the shield. Cracks appeared in the rocky shell and bits of dirt rained down, but the shell held. Horace released the last bit of his Zoana. Violet and Jean Tu let go of him. Hands reached out from the open hole. The queen was the first one out. 
Horace started to indicate for Alira to take her turn, but John too pushed ahead, grabbing the edge of the hole and pulling himself out. Lord Ubar, you're injured. You should go next. Horace, with help, got Ubar to stand. The young lord limped, favoring one leg. The posture reminded Horace at once of Lord Mulsibar. Ubar clapped a hand on his shoulder. You saved us, Lord Horace. I will forever be in your debt. <laughs> Nonsense. I was just saving my own skin. Ubar smiled through the blood. The texts of Sipa say humility is the highest virtue. If that is true, you are a most virtuous man, my friend. Ubar was lifted out, and the women went after him, leaving Horace and his secretary as the last ones in the pit. When the rescuers reached down, Mizim insisted that Horace go next. Too tired to care, Horace grasped their stringy wrists and allowed himself to be pulled up. Ubar called me friend. I've got precious few of them these days. <sighs> As the group of men helped him stand beside the pit, Horace noticed their iron collars. He felt a twinge of sadness. Thank you, men. I owe you eternal thanks. The men, all of them covered in grime and sweat, bowed low before him. The gesture made him feel worse. They deserved to be freed for their heroic service. He looked toward the queen, sitting on a low end table nearby, the slave woman kneeling beside her. Excellence, I... The words died in his throat as he gazed upon the devastation. Half the villa had collapsed, including the entire northern face. Huge piles of rubble, with jagged timbers jutting up from the brick and stonework, spilled into the surrounding gardens. Much of the wreckage was scorched, some of it melted into black slag. A haze of dust hung above the grounds, catching the early morning light. A handful of soldiers stood around the periphery, wide-eyed, with bared weapons in their hands. No sign of the enemy remained beyond the destruction. First sword. Horace looked over to Byleth, now standing, as a squad of guardsmen approached, carrying a dust-shrouded body. It was Captain Divim. His open eyes stared at the sky. One of the guards held up what appeared to be a long strip of black cloth. It was a piece from the skin-tight leather armor the two assassins in the corridor wore. In the light, Horace could see the mottled scales like the skin of a black snake. Scavian. Yes, Lord Jantu. No doubt hired with sun-cult gold. She dismissed the soldiers with a flick of her fingers. First sword. My guard requires a new leader. She pointed to the lieutenant. He will do for the time being. Horace bowed his head as the queen stalked away with Lord Jantu and the new captain of her guard in tow. Horace turned to Elira. He was about to ask if he could find her something to drink. This is your fault. You push people too hard and create enemies. Before he could respond, she walked away, picking her way through the rubble. He longed to call her back, to convince her of his good intentions, but the gulf between them had grown too wide to cross with just a few words. It grew wider every day. Then Mezim was beside him. Come along. We'll have that injury looked at and then find something presentable to wear. Horace looked down at the cut in his side. Blood soaked his ragged tunic. He'd hardly noticed it. He could only shake his head as Mizim led him away. Gray dunes rolled across the plains below like waves of sooty ice on a frozen sea. Eight days aboard this flying boat, and most of it offered no better view than this barren ocean seemingly devoid of life. The dunes continued south to become the Great Desert, or as some Akeshian scholars called it, the Southern Bulwark. For centuries, it kept the empire safe from invasion, and like the ocean, it possessed a lure for certain intrepid souls. The empire's history was littered with noble attempts to tame the desert, to build great cities amid its shifting sands, each succumbing to the inevitable. Or so Abdiel heard. He never felt a great desire to see a desert, much less live in one. He wasn't fond of sand, or the oppressive heat either, he imagined himself lying atop a sand mound, dying of thirst, then banished the image from his mind. He saw the ocean once, the real ocean, many years ago on a tour of the Western Empire. Abdiel looked up to the front of the flying ship where his master, Lord Mebishnu, spoke with the vessel's captain. His master's rise through the ranks of the Order of the Crimson Flame ran swift and certain. Lord Mebishnu took what he wanted. 
Now, if only he would set his eyes on a proper wife, things would course much better. So Abdiel visited the Temple of Amor to make a special donation when he learned of this trip. Abdiel viewed the women of the imperial court at Seasa for all their impeccable breeding as a clutch of asps. He hoped his master would find a better selection of good, upstanding ladies out here. Nisus, he'd heard, was a center of piety and forthrightness, exactly the kind of place to find his master a bride. Abdiel approached to see if his master had need of him. The ship's captain turned to him. The desert is beautiful from this height, isn't it? Abdiel hadn't bothered to learn the man's name. Why bother? What was a sailor but just another servant? Mabishnu glanced over the railing before returning his gaze to the far horizon. How long before we reach Nisus? Within the hour, your lordship. Your eminence. How dare the man not use the proper title when addressing an official envoy of the Greater Temple? Pardon me, your eminence. The captain added a short bow. I meant no offense. Mabishnu passed it off with a wave of his hand. I'm sure you have duties to attend to, Captain. I'll take up no more of your valuable time. The captain bowed again as he backed away. Thank you, your eminence. It is a pleasure to have you aboard. Mm, such meaningless flatteries. The captain's face turned dark in a scowl, but Abdiel turned his back on the man. Master, would you like a cool drink? Lemon juice, perhaps? No, Abdiel. I'm not thirsty. Not thirsty for drink, but for something else, eh? Of course, Master. The deck tilted as the flying barge turned in a wide arc, descending slowly over the swollen waters of the Typhon River. High walls appeared on the horizon, growing swiftly as they approached. The city walls were built from yellow stone, but its square towers were black like iron teeth protruding from a jaundiced jaw. The city sat in an oxbow of the river, so water surrounded it on three sides. A magnificent yellow stone bridge spanned to the southern bank, its long arch supported by massive piers. A multitude of tents stood pitched along that far shore. As the barge grew nearer, Abdiel could make out men moving among the makeshift shelters. Soldiers in armor and bright helms, chariots performed maneuvers across hard-packed drilling grounds. This, then, must be the army of three kings. He placed one hand on the deck's broad railing as the ground slowly rose up to meet them. Taking off in this flying contraption was bad enough, but he liked descending even less. A man his age shouldn't be taxing his heart with such things. <sighs> the barge landed on the river. Abdiel let go of the railing just as the rest of their party emerged from their accommodations below. Eleven brothers of the Crimson Flame, each of them a little green around the ears. Their long robes fluttered in the breeze like the wings of great red birds. Abdiel forgave them their lapse of fortitude, for these birds were fierce predators, the most powerful and loyal sorcerers of the order, hand-selected by the Primarch to accompany his master on this vital mission. Abdiel attended his master's audience with his grand luminance the night before they departed the capital. You must not fail in this matter, Mibishnu, my son. The Primarch spoke from the raised chair in the High Council's chamber. The tattoos on his bare scalp gleamed like red gold in the light of a hundred lamps. Abdiel had sighed with reverence to see them with his own eyes. I understand, great father. I pledge my life to this task. Failure means not merely the loss of a city to the growing darkness, but perhaps the entire empire. The Queen of Aragash must be punished for her wickedness. And that punishment must come by our hand, my son. You understand that. And that same hand must eradicate the foreign devil in her bosom. That is the cancer you must cut away. The Primarch had rubbed his forehead with both hands as if trying to scrub away a stubborn stain, and Abdiel felt such sweet sorrow at the gesture. So beauteous, yet so human. If we lose Erogash, then we are open to attack from the foreign invaders. Just as our forebears conquered the tribes who settled these lands before us, the invaders will gobble up the Empire, one town after the other. Amor, his name be praised, would never allow that to happen, Great Father. <laughs> no, think not that we are a special race, my son. 
The Sun Lord is eternal. Should we fall, he would shine his blessed glory on another people. The destiny of our race rests in your hands. I can trust no one else with this matter. I will not fail, Great Father. Abdiel took one last glimpse of the Primarch as they were ushered out of his divine presence. It had been the second greatest day of his life, outshone only by the birth of his master. As they were taken away, he'd been struck by the realization that those two miraculous events, the birth and the audience, might alter the course of history. Upon arrival at Nisus, Mibishnu returned the genuflections of his brethren with a solemn nod. The barge drifted gently against the shore and sailors scurried about at their duties. Abdiel waited as they set up the wooden bridge to the shore and made sure he was the first one off the vessel. He almost wept as his feet touched down on solid ground again. The flying barges were a wonderful innovation, much faster than traveling by water or caravan. Yet one could not rest easily when soaring thousands of feet above the earth. He shaded his eyes and looked up at the sun, just a few finger breadths from high noon. Yet we were closer to you, Holy Lord, when we rode upon the winds beneath your radiant light. He turned as his master came down the bridge, speaking again to the ship's captain. Your orders are to remain here until further notice. Of course, Your Eminence. Would you like an escort? No, Captain. Just make sure the ship is ready to fly at any time, day or night. Mabishnu joined Abdiel on the shore. The rest of the Order brothers had already disembarked, looking a little better now that they were off the boat. They stood along the riverbank, taking in the massive city of tents spread out before them. This is my master's moment to make his mark. People will look upon this day as the beginning of a glorious new era. Praise be to the Sun Lord. What say you, Abdiel? Shall we go forth to find our hosts? Abdiel patted the official diplomatic satchel hanging from his shoulder. Of course, master, of course. It's not polite to keep a king waiting, much less three of them, eh? Quite right. Come along. With a surge of pride, Abdiel walked two steps behind his master toward the camp, with the rest of their delegation following behind. He felt a twinge of indignation, finding no reception waiting for them. An envoy from the temple deserved proper recognition. At the very least, their hosts could have come out to greet them. But all he saw were tents and pavilions and soldiers, lots of soldiers, sitting around on the ground, eating and conversing as if they had no cares in the world. Then a man in a golden robe rushed toward them, weaving his way through the soldiery. He was a short man, a trifle wide around the middle. Abdiel was shocked to see the handful of scarlet tattoos dotting his bald head. This man is a priest of the light? Holy Amor for Fend! Lord Mebishnu! He arrived to meet them, beads of perspiration gathering on his forehead and cheeks. The little fat priest folded his hands across his midsection and made a deep bow. Greetings, your eminence. I am Shabra Amur, advisor to King Malak. His gracious majesty greets you with all honor and requests that you come with me to his outer palace so that he might have the pleasure of your counsel. Mabishnu gave his consent with a brief nod, and the priest scurried away, almost as swiftly as he had arrived. It was evident this army had been stationed here for some time by the nauseating collection of smells and the complacent demeanor of the soldiers. If they remain here much longer, this tent city will sprout taverns and brothels if it hasn't already. It risks becoming a permanent encampment. Off in the distance, two flying ships floated above the desert plain, one to the south and the other eastward. Though it was difficult to tell at this distance, each appeared to be gigantic and lavishly decorated, recalling the classic style of imperial war barges. Finally, the priest led them to a sprawling pavilion at the center of the vast camp. The outer palace was not as grand as its name, although it was quite large. The canvas rooftop sagged in several places, and the walls were spattered with mud. A pole holding up a limp flag was planted near the entrance, sporting the colors of three cities, Nisus, Chiresh, and Hirak. The structure was surrounded by a cordon of Nisusi white sphinxes, 
standing at strict attention as befitted the proudest cadre in the Western Empire. Their armor and weapons gleamed with polish. Abdiel nodded with appreciation for their devotion as the procession was escorted inside. They were brought into a large room decorated as a feast hall. A variety of people sat on cushions around a massive round table. Some looked to be military officers, but most wore civilian clothing, very rich civilian clothing. Three large thrones stood at the far side of the table. The chair on the left was occupied by an old man wrapped in a robe of pale green silk. Abdiel guessed this was King Sumuel of Chiresh. Despite the king's apparent frailty, it was said he ruled his city with a firm hand. In the right-hand throne sat a monarch with a roguish cast to his gaze. Young and handsome, with a full head of lustrous black hair, this could only be King Ramsu of Hirak. Apparently, he had a roving eye, despite recently marrying his sixth wife. Abdiel took an instant dislike to the young king, but his attention veered to the center seat, occupied by a large man with a ponderous belly. His robe was so vast, it seemed a tent itself. It was deep burgundy, with gold trim at the collar and cuffs. He wore his receding hair pulled back into an oiled queue. Abdiel remembered him from that long ago tour. King Malak of Nisus hadn't changed much in the intervening years, beyond growing fatter and balder. Shabra Amur stopped halfway to the table and bowed low. Great rulers, I bring before you Lord Mebishnu of Seasa, ambassador from the greater temple of Amur. Mebishnu stepped past the priest and bowed. Abdiel noted it was not a full obeisance as was customary when a subject met a monarch, much less three kings altogether, but instead the less formal genuflection required when meeting persons of slightly higher rank. Emissary! At King Moloch's greeting, the piper in the corner ceased his play. Every head in the room turned as the obese king of Nisus raised a golden cup. You are a most welcome sight. Enter and join our table. Abdiel followed Mabishnu and stood behind him as he was offered a stool at the king's left hand. Slaves appeared with wine and food. Abdiel took each plate and decanter from their hands to inspect its contents before personally serving it to his master, though he knew Mabishnu would eat none of it. The rest of the delegation remained at the doorway, stiff-backed, arms by their sides, as if standing for review on a parade ground. King Malik put a pheasant leg in his mouth, then pulled the bone out, stripped of all its meat and gristle. Then he chewed on the denuded bone. What about your brother priests? We have enough food and wine for all, unless they find our company distasteful. Not at all, Majesty, but they are sworn to holy oaths. Neither food nor drink shall pass their lips until after evening vespers in the privacy of their quarters. The king split open the bone and proceeded to suck out the marrow. As they will. Never let it be said we treated the customs of the Sun Temple with disrespect. Your hospitality is legendary, Majesty. I thank you. So, what news do you bring from Seasa, Lord Mabishnu? Has the Emperor decided to join our righteous cause and drag that upstart bitch Byleth from her throne? King Sumuel watched the assembly with a wary eye as he sipped from a small cup, carefully tended by his own body slave. King Ramsu was too busy eating dates from the hands of a comely slave girl to pay attention. I'm afraid not, Majesty, though the Emperor sends his regards to all his faithful servants. The corpulent Malik's eyes narrowed. Prelude to an outburst? Abdiel knew his master saw. A ruler who could not control his temper, especially in front of his peers and subjects, was a dangerous creature. Such a trait also made him too volatile to trust. However, I was not sent to carry messages, but to hear answers. Answers? To what? The first question concerns this army's lack of progress. By our reports, you have been camped here outside the walls of your city for the better part of a month. Why the delay? Ah! Oh. King Malik's cup bounced off the table. Does the Primarch think we are dragging our feet? Is that it, eh? 
Does he not believe we want that bitch's head for the murder of our dear son? What proof can we give, emissary? What proof would satisfy the temple of our sincerity? Is it blood he desires? If your slave sins against you, better to slay him and lose a single servant than to stay your hand and lose them all. The passage was one of Abdiel's favorite lines from the Holy Scripts. A man stood up from the table. Though younger than most of the assembled nobles, he exuded an aura of authority. His silk robe parted to reveal a heavy gold amulet on his hairless chest. I do not like the tone you use, Amaseri. I think you ought to apologize to our royal hosts before something unfortunate happens to you and your acolytes. The others sat still, their gazes darting back and forth between the two men. Mabishnu lifted a single finger. The young man's left hand, wrapped in a fiery nimbus, shot forward to attack, but the flames sputtered and died before they could fly forth. <laughs> Mabishnu hardly looked over as the young noble toppled to the carpeted floor, his body pierced by a dozen long spears of solid stone. Mabishnu wiped a trickle of blood from his left nostril. His divine radiance only desires faithful obedience, as any father wishes from his sons. The three kings shifted in their wooden thrones, but said nothing. Uh, of course, as it should be. Bring me more wine. The Primarch still awaits an answer. Why has his army not marched for Erugash? King Malak leaned forward on his throne. I will tell you why we wait. My brother kings prefer to remain under the shadow of my walls, feasting and drinking in safety instead of marching to seek vengeance for my murdered son. King Ramsu nearly choked on a mouthful of date. <coughs> Preposterous. We are here at your insistence. We merge our forces here at Nisos. My soldiers only arrived three days ago after a long and dusty trek. They require rest before we start for Erugash. Why didn't you send them by river, then? In winter? Don't be daft. I would have lost half my ships in the flooding water. King Sumuel wagged a finger at Moloch. Your vengeance is your own affair. Hirok and Chiresh only agreed to join your little war for our share of the spoils. But so far, Nisus has refused to agree to a fair division of the captured territories. And so we wait until our demands are met. It matters little to me whether we leave tomorrow or a month from now. Erugash will fall to us in time, and we shall have our due rewards. Mibishnu considered his cup. Those matters will be finalized this very day under my authority as the temple representative. Does anyone challenge my right? No one spoke. Good. My second question concerns a disturbing tale we heard during our journey. It seems an attempt was made on Queen Byleth's life, very messy and ill-advised. Worst of all, it failed. Of the three kings, only Moloch could meet Mibishnu's gaze, and his royal face was flushed with blood. You may be the legate of the Holy Son, Lord Mibishnu, but take care not to rise too high, lest you burn. Abdiel stepped back as his master stood up. This was a delicate moment. Remain calm, master. Use prudence. You still do not understand. I am not here to advise you, but to take command. Abdiel retrieved the scrolls from the satchel he wore, and Mibishnu presented them to King Malak. These are signed by the hands of the Emperor and the Primarch. They grant me authority over this army, and old persons attached to it. Your royal persons may, of course, retire to your home cities for the duration of the campaign, but you will have to trust us to make the proper distributions of any assets seized. Abdiel watched King Moloch's ruddy face, waiting for the explosion. Yet the Nisusi king remained in control of his emotions for once. We leave tomorrow, my kings. Mabishnu looked at Sumuel. Because when Erugash falls does matter to the Primarch. By all means. King Malak accepted another gold cup from a slave. Let us toast to our assured success. 
When they reached the river, the ship was tied down with two sailors standing at the bottom of the landing ramp. Abdiel hurried ahead. His master would want complete privacy for his meditation, followed by a light supper once the sun set. He had almost reached the ramp when a slave boy, no older than 13 or 14, darted out from the nearest tents toward their party. Fearing some kind of attack, Abdiel moved to intercept but was too slow. The slave knelt directly in front of Mabishnu with his forehead pressed to the ground. What is it, boy? Greetings, great lord of the sun. His sun-brown skin made Abdiel guess he was from one of the southern kingdoms beyond the great desert. Lord Mabishnu, my master invites you to dine with him this evening. Abdiel was moving forward to shoo the slave away when Mabishnu halted him with a gesture. Who is your master? Lord Pumash of House Luradesas, great lord. The name stoked something in the back of Abdiel's mind. The House of Luradesas was a minor one, but he had heard of this Lord Pumash. The man was supposedly well-connected in mercantile interests across the empire, which lent him influence in many circles. Not a man to ignore, for certain. Mabishnu recognized this without his servant's advice. Tell your master I will be happy to dine with him. He said to tell you he will expect you at sunset, if it please you. That will do. The slave bowed, and Mabishnu continued onward to the ship. Abdiel hurried ahead, irritated by the interruption, to prepare his master's private room with the proper candles and incense and the rug situated before the portable fane of the Sun Lord. When all was ready, he left his master alone. An hour later, Abdiel entered with a jug of water and a clean glass. He found his master seated at the cabin's small table in a fresh robe, this one vibrant scarlet with white borders, looking refreshed as he read a scroll by candlelight. He looked up as Abdiel filled the glass and set it on the table. Did you eat something, Abdiel? No, master. You know me. I don't have much of an appetite. Still, you should eat to keep up your strength. Abdiel nodded. It is time for your meeting with Lord Pumash. The brothers of your order are prepared to escort you. Not all of them, Abdiel. He saw a sparkle in his master's eyes that hadn't been there before his meditation. A twinkle that bespoke, perhaps, a renewed conviction. I'll just be bringing Brother Opiru. The rest shall remain on board until I return. Abdiel was tempted to question this decision, but he held his tongue. Yes, master. We shall await you on the deck. Abdiel followed his master inside the Pumash quarters, while Brother Opiru remained without. The large tent consisted of only a single chamber, serving as reception chamber, dining room, kitchen, and bedchamber. A second slave, a pretty girl barely out of her teen years, stood near the far wall next to a tall, broad-shouldered man with his back to the entrance. As Mabishnu entered, the man turned around. Abdiel was impressed by his first sight of Lord Pumash. The nobleman was powerfully built with the light bronze complexion of the upper castes. His short beard was combed and oiled. By his appearance, he could fit into any royal court in the empire. Please enter and be welcome. Lord Pumash held out his hands in greeting. I apologize for the meanness of my home. Mabishnu met him at the center of the room. No need to apologize. I'm sure it is not easy to maintain a lavish lifestyle when traveling with an army. Ah, most true. Please, sit. May I offer you wine? It is an Altaian vintage, quite good for relaxing the palate. Mabishnu took the seat offered to him at a small table. Only two places had been set. Although the tent's furnishings were sparse, the dinnerware was fine porcelain and crystal glass. The female slave poured wine for them both, and this time Abdiel did not interfere. Lord Pumash raised his glass. To new acquaintances and the opportunities they bring. An interesting toast. I'm always keen on meeting new people. After all, mutual advantage is the lifeblood of a vibrant trade practice. I would be interested in hearing more about your practice, Lord Pumash. I admit, I know very little about you, save for your reputation for honest dealings. The nobleman placed a hand on his chest and dropped his chin in a deep nod. Oh, your words honor me. 
In my line of trade, a man's good name is more precious than gold. I deal mainly in exotic goods, such as precious metals, expert crafts, rare spices, and specialty slaves. Specialty slaves? Yes, such as Lina here, for instance. She was brought from Etonia. She's a crusader's woman? Mm, precisely. That alone lends her a special value, but she has also been trained to be a court companion. <laughs> she is an exquisite dancer. She sings and plays several instruments. She even composes poetry in three languages. Remarkable. Yes, quite. She has a keen mind which allows for the highest level of training. Thus, she is worth much, much more. You would not believe some of the offers I've received for her just in this camp alone. Mabishnu nodded as he took a drink. Talk of money and trade bored him, as was only proper. Abdiel did not approve of Zawaniai sullying themselves with such matters. That's what accounting slaves were for. Lena served a first course of honeyed figs with a white wine. Mabishnu took a bite out of courtesy. Lord Pumash gestured to Mabishnu's plate. Is the food not to your liking? I can have something else prepared. Bring the oranges for Lord Mabishnu. His master wiped his mouth with a linen napkin. No, please forgive me. It's just that I am eager to hear why you requested this meeting. As you mentioned, we are not acquainted. Our families, as far as I know, have not done business together. What can I do for you? Oh, it is not what you can do for me, Eminence, but rather what we can do for each other. You came here on a specific mission, did you not? To goad these kings into action against the Queen of Erugash. I've made no secret of my mission, Lord Pumash. Your sources are correct as far as that goes. And you have no doubt already ascertained the sources of the resistance to this plan? Hmm? There is no need to answer. You too are preceded by your reputation. Each of our royal host blames the other for the delay. Ramsu blames Moloch for gathering the armies here so far from his lands. Sumuel blames Moloch for attempting to take the lion's share of the anticipated spoils. And Moloch blames them both for feeding off his largesse. Impressive. He must have well-placed spies in the households of all three monarchs. Let us assume, for the sake of debate, that what you said is true. Mabishnu leaned back, holding his wine cup. What is it to you? You've still not told me what you want. To help you. To be more precise, I wish to help your mission succeed in the removal of Queen Byleth from power. If your sources have told you that I need or want outside interference, then they missed their mark. Lord Pumash leaned back as well, mirroring Mabishnu's posture. Oh, but you do, my lord. Need assistance, that is. Because no matter what these kings have told you, it is all a sham. Mabishnu's eyebrows came together in a line. Explain what you mean. Whatever the kings say, the true reason they do not move from this spot is fear. The two slaves cleared the first course and set down a platter of roasted lamb on a bed of wild rice and lentils. Lena cut generous portions for both of them, serving Mibishnu first and her master second. Only after they had each taken a bite and exchanged appreciative nods did talk resume. Fear of what? Queen Byleth has a new Zawaniai in her court, a foreigner with extraordinary power. Some say he was responsible for the destruction of your temple in Ergash. It is also said this man may have the power to control the chaos storms. Mabishnu sipped from his glass and then wiped his mouth with the cloth again. Rumors are dangerous things to trust. One must always consider the source. Lord Pumash smiled, revealing his straight white teeth. I agree completely. Believe me when I say I would not have mentioned these things if my sources were not impeccable. Yes, this is all very interesting and mysterious, Lord Pumash, but enough with the games. Time to put your tiles on the table. 
In this case, your rumors are accurate. This savage comes from the west beyond the ocean. He is known to possess the Zoana, although reports of his prowess vary. One of our envoys was attempting to neutralize this threat. You speak of Menok Ramesh. Mabishnu's jaws clenched at the interruption. Yes, the same. The Menach was attempting to neutralize... I am afraid he's dead. Abdiel almost gasped aloud. That information was a carefully guarded secret. Few outside the temple hierarchy even suspected it. Mabishnu, to his credit, recovered with grace. I cannot confirm that. No need, your eminence. You have my condolences? Were you close to Menach Remesh? Uh, no. I only met him once years ago. Abdiel remembered that meeting as well. It had been at the High Holy Festival of Shamaz almost a decade ago, when Mabishnu was still enrolled at the Order's Academy. Ramesh et Califane had been a well-known personage within the school. Some believed he might one day ascend to the Primarchy. He was a most devout servant of our Lord and will be sorely missed, but we were talking about something else. Mm, the Queen's foreigner. Whatever power he might possess, no man can withstand the might of Amur. You and our hosts must have faith. Faith is fine and good, but these kings will want assurances that the cult of the Sun God is focused on this problem. Ah, and now we come to the meat of the matter. I am here, am I not? What greater assurance could they ask for? Your Eminence, I'm afraid these three rulers are more moved by matters of flesh and coin than holy writs, if you'll excuse my candor. And that's where your assistance comes into play? Exactly. Both slaves came to clear the table. A pitcher of plum-colored wine was placed in the center, and then the slaves withdrew to a corner of the tent. Lord Pumash offered more drink, but Mabishnu placed a hand over his cup. My lord? King Ramsu owes my cartel a significant sum of money. His Majesty has a penchant for gambling chariot races in particular, but abysmal luck. In exchange for a more lenient return rate, I believe he would be agreeable to making good on his commitment to this campaign. <laughs> Likewise, King Sumuel's youngest son was born with poor lungs and relies on a rare pollen from the Far East to live, a substance which only my company can provide. I think you understand where this is going, eh? I think I do. So, speaking in the hypothetical, how soon do you believe you can convince the leaders of this army to begin moving on Erugash? That depends on you. In addition to goading these kings into action, my cartel will assist with provisioning and transportation for the army. And in exchange, when Ergash is back under the control of your cult, we will be granted complete control of all the trade within the city. In perpetuity. Abdiel held his breath as he waited for his master's reaction. Yet Mabishnu sat still, showing nothing on his face. Agreed. Do you require documentation from the hierarchy endorsing my decision? Not at all. We are both men of our word. What we have forged here tonight will remain ironclad. Mabishnu got up from his seat. When can I expect to see results, Lord Pumash? I have already sent messages to begin the process, Your Eminence. I was reasonably confident we could reach an understanding. By tomorrow morning, this army will begin its march into history. And what if my master had not taken the bait? Would you be pulling strings to ensure that his mission was doomed? With a nod of his head, Mabishnu departed. I don't like the look of it. Jerome nodded, shading his eyes against the late afternoon sun. The village sat in a vast dust bowl in the southern flats of the Iron Desert. Mud brick buildings huddled around a dusty stretch of road, their backs turned to the desert wastes. Cool winds scoured it, filling the spaces between the buildings with grit and sand. The windows were covered with wooden shutters, sandblasted like the brick faces around them. 
He and Demanon lay side by side at the top of a dune overlooking the settlement. They crossed the wastes as if all the demons of hell pursued them, sleeping in brief snatches, eating as they traveled. The men were exhausted, the animals in worse shape. They needed some place to rest. It looks like it was hit by a storm not long ago. But I think it'll be safe if just a few of us enter and not try to attract attention. Emanon crawled back down from the summit and rolled over onto his back. Mm, I'd rather just keep moving. We can't be more than a day or two from the river. More like four. You care to tell me about this gathering we're heading toward? I don't know much about it myself. You were there when I got word of it. But you have an idea what we'll find there. Mm. You don't want to hear my suspicions. Fine. In that case, the men need a break before they fall apart. Two of the horses have thrown shoes. It's only a matter of time before one or both of them pull up lame. Then we either ditch the gold or pull the wagon ourselves. We are not leaving the gold. Then we need to stop. And we could also use some information. We've been marching blind out here for a while now. You think this little shithole is going to have any information worth hearing? We never know. Traders make their way out this far. I passed through here once years ago. We were making our way up to Namedia, or trying to at least. We got this far before our captain decided to turn around. He got cold feet? Our previous commander died from an arrow through the spleen just a month before. We elected one of the sergeants to take his place. It wasn't a good fit. Tablor was a good squad leader, but he didn't have the chops for the head job. He took us back to Bylos, where we settled in as an arm of the local garrison. Guarding grocers and sheep all day doesn't sound like you. I didn't stick around for long. Signed on with another company and marched the hell away from there. You don't talk about your past much. It was a long time ago, Em. Anyway, if I'm right, then we'll find what we need here. I still don't know about this idea of yours. That gold could supply us for... Uh, for forever? Wasting it on mercs just doesn't seem wise. Jerome glanced over his shoulder to the wagon sitting at the bottom of the dune. Their team sprawled out around the vehicle like a pack of beaten dogs. These men have courage, but they aren't ready to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Keshian soldiers. If you want this rebellion to do more than just hit supply depots and undermanned border stations, we need professional fighters. And this is the place. It doesn't look big enough to even have a name. It's called Enshin. If you want to hire unattached cell swords, this is the place. <sighs> All right. This is your world. Let's do it. The town's appearance didn't improve as they entered. Jerome might have taken it for abandoned, if not for a handful of people walking about. Why does the Empire allow such a place to survive? Why not just wipe them out? The Akeshians use mercenaries too. Aragosh used to supplement its legions with cell swords. Then they started pressing slaves into the armies. Jerome broke off from the squad and headed in the direction of the noise. Jerome! Jerome nodded toward the circle of shacks where the noise came from. Look for a hostel on the main street. It's the only three-story building in town. I'll meet you there. Main street? This hogsty only has one street. Jerome left the road and made his way across the uneven ground. This was probably a bad idea, but he couldn't help himself. The collection of small buildings off from the main village formed a shoddy arena. Gladiator games were popular entertainment with mercs. Wooden stands were set up inside the circle of buildings, surrounding a deep pit carved out of the rocky soil. It was tiny, maybe ten paces across. Down in the hole, two men fought with clubs. The brutal smacks as their weapons struck home resounded around the cheap arena. The audience of about 50 people, mostly men, shouted encouragement as the two fighters brawled for their pleasure. It reminded him of some of the worst places he'd fought in. Two coppers? Jerome turned to the man who'd come up to him. He was probably in his late 20s, tall and lean, with a deep tan complexion. He held out a tin cup. It's two coppers to watch the fight. Everyone has to pay. The man glanced at the brands on Jerome's cheek and stepped away. Then he turned and disappeared behind the stands. Not wanting to attract any more notice, Jerome left the arena. As the shouts and groans faded behind him, he considered his plan to find suitable fighters for Emanon's cause. 
They had to be of high quality with a good reputation, but those kinds of mercenaries were rare and demanded the highest fees. Maybe more than he could offer, especially to help a bunch of ragtag slaves go up against the most powerful empire in the world. They'd have to be more than a little crazy to sign up for that. The buildings on either side varied from small shacks made from odds and ends to the three-story hostelry that dominated the center square. Surrounding the hostel were three brothels, five taverns, and a smattering of flop houses. Jiram entered the hostel. The sunlight penetrated a few feet into the interior before it was swallowed by the room's natural gloom. The floor was covered in sawdust. Tables sat along the unadorned walls, leaving the center area vacant. A doorway separated the room from the back of the house, and a set of steps climbed to the second floor. An army of eyes turned toward him. Less than half of the tables were occupied. A few patrons stood rather than sit in the low-backed chairs and benches scattered about. Everyone wore arms, and most wore some kind of armor over grubby clothing. Jerome spotted Eminon and his crew sitting around a pair of tables against the left side wall and went over to join them. Eminon pushed out a chair for Jerome with his foot. Friendly crowd in here. What's the plan? You do have a plan for this, right? Jerome glanced around the dark room. He vaguely recalled having to leave town in a hurry on his last stop here, though thanks to drink he couldn't remember why. Just try to blend in. The interested parties will come to us. He'd always been on the other side of these kinds of transactions, selling his sword instead of buying. But he'd seen it done enough times to know what to look for. The desperate crews would approach first, the companies that needed a fast infusion of gold to pay off debtors, and the sorts who would take any job because their skills didn't allow them to be picky about their employers. The rebels needed to be patient until the bigger fish came out to look them over. It also didn't pay to be too obvious about what they were looking for. The men who gathered in places like this were often short-tempered and suspicious. They had to be in order to survive in a profession where only the strongest, most dangerous prevailed. There are no old mercs, one of his former captains told him, only empty purses and broken promises. Jerome was about to suggest they order something to eat. I saw you. Jerome turned to the man standing at his shoulder. He was of average height, but built like a bullock with a raised chest and bulging shoulders. His skin was dark ebony, and he had ritualistic white scars across his cheeks. Weapons hung from his body, two swords, several knives, an obsidian war axe tucked into his belt. I saw you in Taharet. Taharet? That name rings true, though I can't place it. Ha <laughs> ha! You killed three men that day! Now he remembered. Taharet was a shitty little town like this one, just another on the long chain of places where he'd been forced to fight in the pits. So what was this man's problem? Had one of those dead men been his brother or a friend? Jerome's left hand drifted down to his sword. I've killed a lot of men. What's that to you? The wide man stared for a few seconds and then smiled, his thumb stuffed into the expanse of his broad belt. I never forget a good fighter. I made a lot of money on you that day. Hey, are you still fighting? No, not anymore. Ah, too bad, eh? You what? Truly magnificent! <laughs> the big man clapped Jerome on the shoulder. These men, drink on me! Then he walked away. Jerome waited quietly, avoiding Eminon's pointed glances. <laughs> I think he liked you. Shut up. A lean man walked down the stairs and stopped on the bottom step, looking in their direction. He didn't wear armor, but a pair of long knives rested on his belt. They looked well used. Then Jerome noticed his face. Oh, holy of holies, can it be? What? You know him? I did. I never thought to see him again on this side of the grave. The man gestured. It was subtle, but the message was clear. Follow me. Jerome got up. Stay here. I'll be back soon. The hell I will? <laughs> Eminon stood to join him. I go where you go. Jerome chose not to argue. All right, but let me do the talking. Eminon nodded. The rest of you ugly mutts stay here. 
The door to the second-story room opened at a touch. Jerome kept one hand on the hilt of his sword as he peeked inside. A short hallway opened into a room. There were two windows, but both shutters were closed. The only light came from the seams around the lowered shades. Jerome stepped inside and immediately moved to the side to give Emanon room to enter. There was movement inside the room, beside what appeared to be a low settee. Yes, it's him. Bright light filled the room. The light seemed to be emanating from the ceiling, but there was no lamp or lantern to be seen. Jerome blinked and drew his sword halfway from its scabbard before he recognized the face peering at him. Three moons? <laughs> Two men stepped forward to meet them. Jerome recognized them at once. The man they followed upstairs was Longar, and the other man, short and stooped, with weathered mahogany skin and a gleaming pate, was called Three Moons. Jerome had served with them both before his capture by the Akeshians. Longar shook his head. I never thought we'd see you again. I should have known you would come back someday, and more popular than ever. The men downstairs are saying the best gladiator in the Empire is here. <sighs> so much for avoiding notice. Longar cracked a small smile. He had been one of the best infiltrators and long-range recon men Jerome ever served with back in their company days. He looked healthy enough for a man supposedly dead. Three Moons, on the other hand, looked more than dead. Then again, the shaman for hire was ancient and had a bad habit of ingesting any hallucinogenic substance he could get his hands on. Jerome couldn't easily count the number of times he'd had to fish Three Moons out of some dead-end drug den or underground hooch kitchen. The last I saw of you two was... Pardisha. A cursed place. Would that the company had never set foot inside its devilish gates. We lost much there. The company? Three Moons squinted. Who's this? You start up a new unit, Sergeant? Emanon glanced at Jerome. Sergeant? Another life. I thought you were both dead. Pardisha was a border town in Isurin, far to the south beyond the Great Desert. Jerome's old mercenary unit had been employed to defend it from hostile neighbors. All went well until an Akeshian legion arrived at the town's doorstep demanding a full surrender. The company stayed, fought, and lost. Most of his brothers paid with their lives. Those who survived were given the choice of keeping their lives in exchange for an iron collar. Jeram took the collar, launching his career as a gladiator slave. Neither Longar nor Three Moons had been counted among the handful of surviving mercs. We bugged out. He looked away as if not proud to admit it. Jeram couldn't blame them, much. Three Moons kept a steadier gaze. After the Akeshians broke through the city gates, I used a glamour to hide myself from their eyes. It was a close thing. There were four wizards attached to that legion. Lucky for me, they were having too much fun pulverizing the town to notice a mouse like me scurrying past. I found him a couple of miles outside town. <laughs> I, I nearly pissed myself when he comes sneaking up behind me like a damn wraith. What happened to you? Captured. I've been living in the Empire ever since. Three Moons leaned forward. Hmm, I see the collar scars. But you got away from them eventually, huh? Jerom nodded to Emanon. He got me out. Now I fight with him. <laughs> fight? <laughs> Against the Akeshians? You never were the shiniest coin in the purse, Sergeant. It's good to see some things never change. What about you two? After Pardisha, I would have thought the Empire was the last place you'd run to. Three Moons beckoned as he sat down on the low couch. Jerome joined him as Longar pulled up a footstool for himself. Emanon declined and leaned against the wall, his arms crossed. Uh, we spent some time down south, but word about what happened got around. Weren't too many units in the market for a couple of deserters. You didn't desert. We lost and you escaped capture. Wasn't anything else you could do. Longar shrugged, a gesture so familiar it filled Jeram with nostalgia. We could have come back to find you. There wasn't anything for you to find except a pair of collars for yourselves, or worse. But that's in the past. Did anyone else survive? A corporal from the 3rd platoon, Farelf. But he went off on his own months ago. We haven't seen him since. So have you thought about starting your own company? 
Pardisha or not, you both have enough seniority with the guild to hoist your own banner. Ah, too much work. But you sound like a man with a proposition, Sergeant. Care to fill us in? We're looking to hire some dependable men. <laughs> in this ass pit, you must be desperate. We found you, didn't we? The minor wizard waved his hand as if clearing the air. Eh, it happens, Stance. Does this have anything to do with that slave revolt we've been hearing about? Maybe it does. Jerome shot his companion a hard glance, and Emanon shrugged. Jerome turned his attention back to his old comrades in arms. What have you heard? Nothing good. It seems that some dog soldiers from the Empire broke free and started a little rebellion instead of doing the smart thing and disappearing. We heard about this place called... Uh, what was it, Longar? Omicor. Aye, that's where these rebel slaves made a stand and got royally screwed. At least, that's what we heard. Now you show up here looking to hire some swords. We won at Omicor. Destroyed almost the entire Third Legion and more than one of those Akeshian wizards that made you piss your skirts. That's so, free man. Well, then, we apologize. We didn't realize we were in the presence of genuine war heroes. We have the money to pay. What we need are veteran soldiers, especially squad leaders. There's not much selection here, Sergeant. I know because we've been looking to add some swords to our ranks, too. But since the Asurian campaign, most of the free companies have moved on, either north to sign with the Crusaders or south to greener pastures. So what you have left are the dregs and hangers-on, not near enough to conquer an empire, if that's what you're asking. And after Omicor? No offense, I doubt you'll find any fighters willing to join your war of vengeance. It's a death wish. You may be right about that. <clears throat> I told you this would be a waste of time, Jerome. These two have lost their nerve, and I wouldn't pay a week old shit for all of the rest of the fleas in this place put together. Let's get out of here. Longar had shifted the way he sat, just a little, but Jerome noticed how the scout's posture had gathered like a coiled spring, his hands resting on his lap, but ready to seize any of the several knives on his person. Three Moons didn't move at all, but then again, he was a wizard. Settle down, brother. Jerome looked from Longar to Emanon. Wait for me downstairs. Emanon just stood there for a moment, but then he shrugged and left the room. What are you caught up in, Sarge? I've never seen you like this. What hold does that one have over you? Jerome ran a hand over his scalp. He's more than my captain. Longar stared at him for a long moment. I see. Well, I'm happy for you. But what's that got to do with throwing away your life on a fool's crusade? You and I both know your ragtag troop of slaves don't stand a chance against the Empire. Eminon has a plan, and so far it's worked out. We hit hard and fast. The Akeshians have to hold ground, but we're free to attack at will and disappear afterward. But with every attack, we attract more and more slaves who want to fight back. But you need vets to lead them. Precisely. Tell him, Three Moons. I was getting to it, lad. Tell me what? We signed with an outfit, the Bronze Blades out of Asurin. Jerom had never heard of them, but his hopes were rekindled. How many fighters? Round about 80, but it's an elite unit. All long timers like us, platoon sergeants and specialists. Even got us a couple of sappers. Any chance your elite unit is looking for work? Three Moons stood up. <sighs> well... You'll have to talk to the captain about that. Jerome almost didn't believe his ears. Three Moons had never, in all their years together, deferred to his superiors on anything. Maybe Pardisha changed him. The gods know it changed me. Fair warning, Sergeant. We don't come cheap. The captain also insists on first payment up front, and you pay the guild's percentage too. I hope your war chest is deep. Jerome got up. Don't worry. It is. Longar opened the door and nodded to someone on the other side. He's ready. Three Moons smiled. It's good to see you, Sergeant. But I don't know if going up against a Keshian Legionnaires is the best idea. We were hoping to sign on with a larger company heading away from the Empire. Far away. 
I wouldn't blame your captain if he wants to turn us down. That's just it. This captain isn't the sort to turn down a challenge. I just hope this isn't another Pardisha. I wonder whatever happened to our old boss, the Emir, after the Akeshians took over his city. He sold us out and tried to make a separate peace with the Akeshians. So, I put a knife through his heart. I'll get Eminon and we'll meet your captain. The hostel's back room was like another world. Instead of stained furniture and sawdust on the floor, it was immaculate. Red walls and bronze accents gave it a garish atmosphere. There was only one table, but it was large enough to seat 20 people. One man sat alone. He stood up as they entered. He was a few years older than Jerom and had a nut-brown complexion. His receding hair was shorn almost down to the scalp and glistened with some kind of oil. He wore faded leathers without insignia or devices. Sir, this is Jerome and his Captain Eminon. Gentlemen, this is Captain Ovar of the Bronze Blades. The captain indicated the cushioned seats before them. Please be seated, sirs. Why do I feel like a lamb walking into the slaughterhouse? Relax, we can trust them. Hoping that was true, Jerome nevertheless made sure he had clear access to his sword as they sat down. Longar and Three Moons took chairs on either side of their commander, while beer and plates of olives were set out. Captain Ovar nodded to Jerome as he took a tankard. I've heard a lot of stories about you from these two. They say you were a top-notch sergeant back in your old outfit. I served as best I could. Well, that's in the past, and we're here to talk about the future. I've heard the basics, but I want to know the details. What do you need, and how much are you willing to pay? At Eminon's nod, Jerome addressed the mercenary leader. The guild's premium wage is ten silver ounces per month, right? It is. That's five Akeshian moons if you're using local coin. Squad leaders draw double pay, and officers get triple. We'll pay twice the premium rate. Captain Ovar's gaze didn't waver a hair. Intriguing. Well, I'll be honest with you. Fighting against the Empire isn't exactly a sound wager. We're not a big outfit, after all. We were looking for garrison duty in one of the smaller towns around these parts. Jerome shifted in his seat, not liking what he was hearing. Three Moons said this captain liked a challenge. Garrison duty is a job for crews that don't like to get their hands dirty, not new companies looking to make a name for themselves. Go on. The rebels of the Western Territories are gathering. Jeram ignored a sharp look from Eminon. Something big is brewing. That's where we're heading. The uprising isn't going away, Captain. It's just getting started. These slaves don't have the training yet, but they're fighting for something more important than money or property. And they won't stop until they get it. <laughs> I can see why your old comrades think so highly of you. You are persuasive. And don't forget about the money. The money is certainly tempting. But before I sign a contract with a new employer, I must know something. What's that, Captain? What happens when the war is won? Jerome pushed back his seat and stood up. Longar and Three Moons watched him but didn't move. Eminon stood as well. When we win this war, every slave in this empire will be freed. Every king and queen of Akeshia will come in person to bow at our feet. And you, Captain, will collect the biggest bonus in history. Captain Ovar climbed to his feet. <laughs> well then, gentlemen, I believe we have a deal. When do we march out? Eminon took a long drink from his cup and slammed it down. <clears throat> Why wait? Ismail glanced over as Yads dropped his shovel and kicked it across the ground. This is bullshit! Why the hell are we even doing this? Because those are our orders? Kasha stood in the hip-deep trench he'd been digging for the past hour. The ditch bent at a right angle near the middle for no reason. Ismail went back to work. His ears, however, remained open as he listened to the others complain. Yad snatched up his canteen. Oh, I'm so sick of all this marching and digging shit. Why can't we go into town too? I'd like to see the sights. 
Maybe find a girl to tickle? Or have something better to drink than dirty water? Kasha straightened up. Yeah, Corporal, why can't we? I could go for a tall drink in a nice cool saloon. Corporal Idris eyed his squad. Quiet down! You're not going because the captain doesn't want you mucking things up. So shut up and keep digging! Those words compelled Ismail to dig with renewed conviction. The corporal was big and mean and covered in scars. Ismail bore whip scars of his own, but the corporal had knife wounds and punctures and one long gray slash down the side of his face that crumpled his cheek into a permanent crater. The corporal didn't talk about that one, but the other men said he'd gotten it at Omicor. Ismail heard a lot about that battle, enough to make him damn glad he hadn't been there. The survivors walked differently than everybody else. They looked different, too. There was something in their eyes, like they'd seen the other side of the grave and death had sent them back. Still, Ismail couldn't help but agree with Yad's. He'd only been with these rebels a few days, and already he was tired of marching and digging trenches, too. Ismail was born a slave on a large plantation east of Nisus, where he worked in the fields until he was full grown. He fell in love with another slave, Peira, and in defiance of the rules, they lived together as husband and wife in secret. When Peira got pregnant, their master sold Ismail to the army. As he was put in chains and loaded onto a wagon, Ismail looked back at his wife, heavy with their child, sobbing on her mother's shoulder. He'd been on his way to the training camps when the rebels struck their caravan. At first he thought they were bandits, hardly more than 50 of them wearing scraps of mismatched armor and no uniforms. He'd heard of the slave rebellion, stories of their exploits passed among the plantations from slave to slave. In his imagination he saw a vast horde of angry faces eager to spill blood. The reality was sobering. Still, they fought like evil spirits. When they gave him the choice of either walking away or joining them, he agreed without hesitation at last, to be free. Freedom, however, turned out to be a strange thing. Before his rescue, he'd only known it as an idea, as distant from his reality as the moon above the earth. Now, possessed of it, he felt almost drunk with the possibilities, and more than a little terrified. The world suddenly seemed so much bigger than before, able to swallow up an unwary man. He thought the rebels would ride off to another country with the stolen gold. He wasn't exactly pleased when he found out that they were heading deeper into the desert. The doubts started creeping into his head. This was a mistake, but I'm stuck again, just as much a slave as when I was wearing a collar. He looked over at the town, half a mile from their campsite. It wasn't much, just a clump of buildings along a dusty desert road. He didn't know how they survived out here. He didn't see any fields, just barren ground, hard as clay and too dry to support anything but scrub grass and pricker bushes. What did the people eat? Rocks? An hour later, his trench was dug to the corporal's satisfaction, and Ismail lay down inside, hands resting across his stomach, waiting for the mess call. The sun's rays couldn't reach him at the bottom of the hole, and tonight promised to be as cold as last night. Yards. I will break you in half and use your broken bones to dig that pit if you don't put your back into it! Beyond the confines of his little nook, Ismail could hear Corporal Idris threatening Yads with physical violence. But it seemed distant, as if the yelling came from miles away. Ismail was tempted to close his eyes and complete the feeling of seclusion, but a thought lodged in the back of his mind, refusing to leave him in peace. Sitting up, he peeked over the top of his trench in the direction of the town again. So close, and yet it seemed like another world. He'd never get there without being seen, at least not until nightfall. If he was caught leaving, he'd have to face the corporal's wrath, maybe the sergeant's too. And don't even think about the lieutenant. He's the biggest, meanest of them all, with that big red sword and mountains of muscles. He looks like he could twist off a man's head if he got the notion. If half the stories they tell about him are true, then he's done a lot worse than that. No, sir. I'll just stay nice and comfy in my little- Greetings, brother. Ismail jumped back as a rebel from another squad knelt beside his trench. He was a small man with a delicate face, almost feminine. His skin looked gold in the waning sunlight. He wore the same sand-colored garb as the other veterans, 
though his clothes were cleaner than most and well mended. The rebel touched his chest. I am Song, one of Sergeant Mahir's scouts. You are thinking about the village there, yes? Uh, no, not at all. I was just watching for danger, you know. Never know when danger will appear right in front of your nose. <laughs> there is no need to obfuscate, brother. I too would like to see what lies within. Alas, our commanders have not sanctioned it. What are we to do? Not much, I suppose. It ain't worth getting our heads thumped by the corporal. Yes, dereliction of duty is a heinous thing. Sung leaned down a little closer. But uh, surely a little look around would not harm anyone, eh? Sure. Just stretch the legs and have a little peek. But how do we go about- Leave that to me, brother. Sung got up and walked over to Mahir, the sergeant in charge of the scouts. They talked for a few minutes, but Ismail began to get nervous. Then Sung headed back toward him. The matter is taken care of. What do you mean, taken care of? I asked my commander to consider you as a recruit for the scouts. He has graciously authorized me to take you on a short training operation this evening. What training operation? Oh, you mean- Yes, brother. We are free to reconnoiter the town. Ismail suspected he was being pranked, but the small man seemed genuine. Really? It is a certainty, brother. Shall we go? He didn't wait to be asked twice. <clears throat> <clears throat> Leaving his shovel and field kit behind, he scrambled out of the hole. Then, on second thought, he reached down to fish out his sword and buckled the belt around his waist. I do not believe we will need that. Better to have it and not need it, right? As you wish. <laughs> Sung led the way past the maze of trenches to the outer pickets, where bored sentries amused themselves by tossing stones out into the scrub. The small scout nodded to the nearest group of watchmen, and they nodded back. And just like that, he and Ismail left the camp. Ismail kept looking over his shoulder, fully expecting to hear shouts of alarm, but everything remained quiet. He spent so much time looking back, he almost lost Sung in the gathering twilight. The small man's clothing blended seamlessly with the landscape. Ismail spotted a hint of movement and quickly followed it until he saw the back of Sung's head in front of him. He kept close thereafter. Sung both melted into the terrain and moved as quietly as a field mouse. Ismail tried to emulate him, but his efforts weren't so graceful. He lost count of how many times he tripped over a rock or brush root. <laughs> Through it all, Sung remained patient, as if this really was some kind of training exercise. As the minutes passed, Ismail found himself taking it more and more seriously, going as far as trying to walk in the scout's footsteps. Suddenly, Sung stopped, and Ismail almost ran into him. The sun had sunk behind the western plains, leaving the sky streaked in shades of blue and purple. Sung pulled him down into a crouch. What's wrong? The scout pointed to a cluster of flat roofs. They had reached the town already. Lights shone in several windows, looking awfully inviting to Ismail. He thought back to his old master's plantation and his wife. As they watched, a small party of men left the town. Squinting, Ismail realized that it was the captain's gang heading back to camp. He felt a sudden urge to race back to his trench. Be calm. Sung pressed something into Ismail's hand. It was a small pouch. Inside, he felt the unmistakable disks of money. It felt like a tidy sum, certainly more than he'd ever held before. What's this? You are not happy joining the insurrection, yes? Was this part of the test? Of course I am. I don't want to be a slave anymore. No need to be slave or soldier. Take the money and find a new life. Ismail looked down at the pouch. All at once a tremendous weight settled in his chest. No one had ever given him such a personal gift. No one except Peira. I... I can't, all right? The captain freed me. I, I don't know how, but I gotta pay him back. And I want to fight. I do. It's just... No one's ever looked out for me before. You know? We walk a difficult path, brother. No one would blame you if you wish to depart. Thanks. I, I just wish I knew what the captain was planning. Then maybe it would set things right in my head. 
A few seconds later, a second group of men left the town. Six dozen, or maybe more. They carried lanterns as they trod in loose rows, and by their light, Ismail could see the gleam of weapons and armor, shields and helms. No uniforms, though. Mercenaries, by the look of them. But why were they heading toward the camp? I believe the captain has found a use for the gold shipment. Ismail imagined how that would change things. Holy Mother Kishad, we just doubled our numbers. Even if they ain't worth a damn in a fight, we might scare the masters to death showing up with such an army. He handed the pouch back. Here, keep the money. I'm staying for now. With these new recruits, things are going to get easier, I'm sure of it. Sung tucked the money into his sand-colored tunic. Brother, shall we investigate this hamlet? Nah, I'm for heading back. I want a better look at those mercs. As you say, brother. Leaning on the rail of the Royal Pleasure Barge, Horace stared across the river. The river brushed against the bottom of the boat, sluggish yet powerful. The last two days passed slowly as they traveled along the river in this grand vessel. Almost 200 feet long, with graceful lines, it was propelled through the river by 40 oarsmen in the ship's waist. All slaves, but Horace tried not to dwell on that. Some other time, he might have enjoyed this trip and the smells and the sounds of water all around him. Yet the attack left him edgy, tense, as if an invisible noose were slowly tightening around his neck. Lord Mulsibar, before his disappearance, told him that Akeshian politics were a cutthroat business. Lord knows I could use some of his advice these days. The Queen's command that he crush the slave rebellion stood paramount in his thoughts. He didn't know if he could do it, not her way. He needed to find a way to help her understand they were people. Better yet, he wished he could convince her to free them all. That was the crux of her problem. <sighs> She'll never accept it. Nor the nobles, the merchants, or the owners of those vast farms outside Erogash. Their entire way of life relies upon the existence of slaves. How can I change an entire society? It's impossible. Yet if I can't, I will lose Alira. Just a short while ago, he thought they were meant to be together. A second chance at love. Maybe we're too different to make it work. We want different things. I think we do. Most of the time I can't understand what she truly wants. For me to leave the court and abandon this new life I've made? Then what? She can't believe the Queen or any of the Empire's rulers would just let me walk away. Without the Queen's protection, we'd be swamped under endless waves of assassins. And now, with my powers proving unpredictable, how long before one of those attempts succeeds? He pressed his temples with the heels of both hands, wishing he could squeeze away his stress. By the gods, I'm ready to be off this boat. Horace glanced over at Lord Ubar, who had come to join him at the larboard railing, a bandage wrapped around his forehead. The voyage had taxed the young nobleman. He spent most of his time in his bunk below decks, or leaning over the sides, throwing back up what little food he could get down. His copper skin had taken on a greenish tinge. Though Horace thought the weather was pleasant, Lord Ubar looked like he was freezing, wrapped up in a long cloak with a fur collar. It shouldn't be long now. Does the Typhon call to you? Horace gazed back down into the murky waters. He considered telling Ubar about his failure to control his Zawana during the attack on the villa, and how he'd been too afraid to attempt summoning the power ever since. No, I don't think you want to hear that. Much better to continue to see me as your secret weapon, defender of your queen and city. Better, that is, until I fail at the wrong time and someone pays for it with their life. You're a good man, Ubar, but you don't have the answers I need. I'm starting to doubt that anyone does. I don't see anything except water and silt. Ubar nodded toward the rear of the vessel. I suppose you must be eager to be away from these Siku Masaku too, eh? Siku Masu... It means a tight place. Ah, close quarters, yes, I am. He looked past the noble to the pavilion set up on the aft deck. Brass poles held aloft a sheet of purple silk to shade Her Majesty and a few others, sitting in chairs and couches as they sipped chilled wine from golden cups. To Horace, it looked like a scene out of a painting about the decadence of the old world. The queen sat amid her courtiers, laughing and gesturing as if she were having the time of her life instead of running from the latest attempt to end her existence. 
They had spoken briefly since leaving the villa. The queen insulated herself within a cocoon of bodyguards and sycophants, scions from the noble houses of Erugash. Horace got the feeling she blamed him for the attack and wondered if she was waiting for him to fall on his sword. Not me, Your Excellency. If you want me dead, you'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. Looking around, Horace noticed Alira absent from the deck. Since the attack, she had gone out of her way to avoid him too. Without the Queen's ability to keep him at bay with a wall of soldiers and Zoanii, Alira simply disappeared whenever he tried to speak with her. An impressive feat on a ship. After a few tries to find out what was wrong, he stopped altogether and spent the majority of the voyage alone, eating or reading by himself, watching the scenery pass. Like Ubar, he was ready to make landfall, if only to escape the pervasive tension hanging over the barge. I'm just wondering if it's ever going to end. When Ubar patted his stomach and made a face in sympathy, Horace pushed back from the rail. Not the trip, I mean the assassination attempts. The feeling I get whenever I walk into a dark room that there's someone waiting to kill me. Things were bad before, but it seems worse now. I'm hardly sleeping. I worry that the food has been poisoned. Life is one continuous race we will never win. We can only persevere to the finish. Another nugget of wisdom from your dead philosopher? <laughs> I had excellent tutors. We're all going to die anyway, so why worry about it? Something like that. <laughs> That's the worst advice I've ever heard. Ubar glanced at him. <laughs> Horace looked over the youth's shoulder and saw the queen watching them. Then she held out her cup to a slave to refill and looked away. Now, my biggest problem is that I've been placed in charge of quelling the slave rebellion. But I don't know the first thing about it. Even if I did, the queen's council won't listen to anything I say. Well, that's not quite true. They listen. But they always find ways to circumvent your intentions? Exactly. None of my commands are followed, but I can never prove who was responsible afterward. I tried telling the Queen, but she didn't seem to hear me. Oh, you still have much to learn about politics in Ganas. <clears throat> the wound Horace took in his side was starting to bother him again, and the afternoon heat parched his throat. Yet all the servants remained aft with the Queen. He didn't want to go back there. That isn't news to me. The Queen will not directly intervene in a conflict between the members of her court. To do so would lessen her esteem in the eyes of the Zoanii. So those desiring her royal munificence must seek a way that is not obvious. It is a shadow game where one pretends not to care about those things which are the most important, and thus conceal one's true intentions. All I want is to please the Queen while not making any new enemies. I've got more than enough already. That is the trick of it. Wait a moment. Ubar, you could be the answer to my prayers. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I need someone who can speak the language, as it were. Someone who has the pedigree to get people to stand up and listen. But you are the first sword. And most of the court wants me gone. I need help. And you're the only person who seems to be talking to me right now. That should be a warning for both of us. However, I am of a mind to help you. Oh, Kanadu. It means a great deal to me. There's a lot of rebel activity in the western part of the realm, but I can't be everywhere at once. So I need you to go to Sekatun as my official envoy. Sekatun? Lord Horus, I'm not sure I would be the most effective choice to represent you there. Why not? That's your home, isn't it? You probably know every important person in the town. That is precisely the problem. I do know everyone in Sekatun, and they know me quite well also. Since my father's disgrace and loss of title, my family is in poor repute. My mother and sister had to move to escape the stain of dishonor. Two of my cousins died by their own hand, unable to face it. The new leaders of Sekatun would have no reason to treat with me. Yes, they will. Because you'll be carrying a written order from the Queen giving you the power to act on her behalf. If the Governor gives you any problems, you can have him executed. That is... I'm unsure how to react. What exactly do you want me to do there? I don't have any military experience. That's all right. You possess the most important trait for this mission. My trust. I need someone who's willing to take a... Lighter touch in regard to this problem. Lighter? In what way? I want you to try to make contact with the rebels. To what end? To de-escalate the situation, for one thing. Also, I'm hoping we can come to some kind of agreement with the slaves. An armistice? I was not aware Her Majesty was seeking a peaceful resolution to this matter. Horus gave his most sincere smile, feeling horrible to mislead this young man who had been a good friend to him. 
The Queen wishes this insurrection to end as soon as possible. She and I have every faith you are the right person for this job. Ubar looked down, his expression suddenly pensive. I am happy to serve in whatever manner Her Majesty desires. Perhaps, if it is my destiny, this may allow me to restore the honor of my family's name. Horace gritted his teeth, hating himself as he clapped the young man on the shoulder. I hope so. You're doing me a great service, which I won't forget. Of course. If you will excuse me... Looking pale all of a sudden, Ubar rushed to the other side of the deck and leaned over the side. Horace resumed his study of the river. He didn't enjoy manipulating people, especially someone like Ubar. But he didn't see much choice if he wanted to survive. The barge turned out of the main channel. Aragash rose from the shore, shining in the midday sun. Vines clung to the massive limestone rocks of the river wall. Built at the water's edge upon the bones of older versions of the city, stretching back hundreds and perhaps thousands of years, the wall stood as a bulwark against both waterborne invasion and the ever-advancing tide of the Typhon. Great domes and arching bridges peaked above the battlements alongside the step-terraced summits of vast palaces. As the barge neared the docks, servants arrived from below decks, carrying what little remained of the royal baggage after the attack. Alira arrived with them. Watching her, Horace felt a knot in his throat. Part of him wanted to forget everything that passed between them and go his separate way, but each time he saw her, his heart ached. The barge bumped gently against the side of the dock. The curtains of the Queen's Pavilion pulled back, and she emerged, looking magnificent as usual in a gown of white silk. Her hair stood up in a tower wrapped with gold chains and pearls as large as pigeon eggs. Lord Jean Tu followed a pace behind her. Horace noticed for the first time a crowd had gathered around the dock. A cordon of royal guardsmen held the people back as they surged toward the barge. Lord Ubar came to stand by Horace again. He looked better, as if their imminent landfall cleared up his seasickness. I feared this would happen. News of the chapter house has spread. The people in the crowd were mainly men, common folk judging by their plain garments. None appeared armed, although the sheer number of them, at least a couple of hundred, was intimidating. Since arriving in Aragash, Horace had never seen such a demonstration. The people still revere the cult of Amor, Ubar glanced over at the Queen as she made her way to the gunnels, where sailors were preparing the gangplank. Despite Her Majesty's long-standing conflict with the priesthood... Horace would have liked to say he felt bad for what happened to the priests of the Chapter House. He still recalled the terror that closed around him on the night of the villa attack, the certainty that he would die horribly. The Order would have killed him for his role in their temple's destruction. Preceded by her bodyguards, the Queen departed the barge and entered a palanquin waiting for her. Lord Jantu strode ahead of the car with a wedge of soldiers, clearing the way as the royal entourage got underway. The rest of the court followed behind the rented litters. Making his way down the gangplank, Horace hoped to slip away. Back at the palace, there would be a welcoming ceremony, followed by a formal audience with speeches and presentations and most of the court would be expected to join in the frivolity lasting late into the night. He just wanted to go home, away from the pomp. Gorita, the commander of his house guard, waited at the bottom of the ramp with two more guards and a string of horses. Horace beckoned to Mezim. There's a change of plan. I'm going back to the manor. With your permission, I will go to the palace to check on the latest news. Yes, do that. Horace approached the guards. I'm glad to see you, men. How has everything been since I left? Captain Gorita saluted. He was a big, burly man whose nose looked as if it had been broken at least twice. Ah, good to see you, Your Lordship. Things have been interesting. As you can see, some of the citizens are not too happy. There have been some riots in the poorer areas, but nothing serious. I wonder if those riots had anything to do with the rebellion? They provided Horace with a tall gelding, already saddled and ready. As he climbed into the saddle, he looked around for Alira, but she was lost in the crowd. <sighs> he joined the procession. At his first opportunity, he broke off from the procession, making his way to the wide, round plaza known as the Wheel. On most days, merchants and traders filled the space, but today Horace found it nearly empty. He saw the reason soon enough. A wooden structure similar to a gallows had been erected at the center of the plaza. 
In place of nooses, however, hanging from the crossbeam were 11 iron cages, gibbets. Inside each cage was a person, 10 men and one woman. Some bore signs of beating and whipping. All of them wore an iron collar, their only garment. Clouds of flies buzzed around the cages, crawling on the inmates, in their hair, on their faces. Most of them didn't move. Horace thought they might be dead, until he saw an eye blink or a hand twitch. They were all alive, although barely. A wooden sign hung atop the structure. Treacherous slaves who dared to raise their hands against their lawful masters. Horace gritted his teeth as he rode past the sickening display. He'd heard Akeshian owners were cracking down on their slaves due to the growing insurrection. This was the first he'd seen. Horta, help Ubar in his mission. He might be our only chance to end this with minimal bloodshed. Taking the avenue on the north end of the wheel, he entered the cattle quarter, home to the city's wealthiest families. His home, too, for the last three months. When he moved into the estate, the district's name confused him. Alira explained that wealth in Akeshia had once been measured by how many cows a man owned. The sight of the peach-colored walls relieved him after the long journey. The manor house rose like a miniature palace, its grounds surrounded by a high stone wall. A variety of objects cluttered the street outside his gate. Bowls, boxes, and bundles of flowers. He even saw a goat staked by the wall, gnawing on what appeared to be a sculpture of a man's head carved out of wood. Half a dozen people stood in the street, facing his home. Oh no. I thought these lunatics would have given up by now. In the days following the fall of the Sun Temple, gifts appeared outside his home. Inconsequential at first, cheap trinkets, a loaf of bread, the occasional jar of wine, and such. But with each day, the gifts grew more numerous and extravagant. Then the first admirer showed up, singing songs and chanting Belzama with the zeal of true believers, although he didn't have a clue what they thought they believed in. For the next week, Horace ordered his servants to provide the gathering with water and food and asked them kindly to leave. But the people refused the sustenance and ignored the request. After that, Horace left orders for these people to be left alone in the hope they would disperse on their own. That did not appear to be the case. Horace turned to Captain Garita. What do they want? Well, that's hard to say, but if I had to venture a guess, I'd say they believe you were sent by... Garita glanced up toward the heavens. They think I come from the sky? So to say, your lordship. Uh, to be more precise, they think you were sent by the gods. That's insane. Pardon me, but you may want to go easy on these uh, admirers. Times are hard, and people need something to believe in. I'm not going to pose as some kind of demigod just to appease their superstitions. Well, not saying you would, your lordship. Uh, just... Don't discount their need for hope. Horace swallowed the retort on his tongue. Half the city viewed him as a gift from the gods, the other half a curse. Well, I'm not discounting it, but I'm not the one they should put their faith in. The house gates opened as they got close. Parxes, his new house steward, rushed out holding a staff across his body as if he expected to fend off a host of attackers. The people in the street did not move, but they stopped chanting as they spotted Horace and his guards. Then they lowered their faces to the ground in genuflection. <sighs> this is a nightmare. Parxes came over, waving his staff around, though he didn't actually hit anyone. Forgive me, Bello. He bowed before Horus. <sighs> I've tried to clear them away each day, but they come right back. Shall I call for the watch? No, don't bother. They aren't hurting anyone. But send all that food to the nearest poorhouse before it spoils. As you command. May I escort you inside? They filed through the gate. The house's southern wing enclosed an outer courtyard that was paved in red brick and featured a central fountain of three sphinxes spitting water. Horace dismounted, surprised at how sore such a short ride made him. More evidence he was getting soft. He rubbed his hands together, remembering the feel of calluses on his fingers. Now all he could feel were the waxy burn scars seared into his palms. He resolved to get more physical activity. Meccano held open the door. One of his newer servants, hired after Menarch Ramesh and his cultists killed most of his staff when they kidnapped him. Horus forced himself to smile as he walked past, 
but every time he saw one of the new hires, it reminded him of that hellish experience. Captured, put in chains, and thrown into a pit. If not for Elira, he might still be there. Remember Lord Astapta. Without him, you and the Queen might both be dead. The cook waited in the foyer with a large clay cup. Horace accepted it and took a sip. He performed the ritual spilling of the drink on the floor to thank the gods for his safe arrival, a ridiculous custom he observed in order to please his servants. Another thing Alira taught him. Akeshian servants expected their employer, though a foreigner, to follow the traditions of their culture. It seemed to work. The servants all smiled at his attempts to emulate their ways, from speaking their language to observing their religious idiosyncrasies. Akeshians took their gods and myths seriously. Thinking of Alira, Horus wanted to ask if she had come home yet, but he held his tongue. As he handed the cup back, Horus allowed himself to relax. <sighs> he was home again, safe, or as safe as he could be. He could count no place in Akeshia as truly safe, not even a royal villa in the country. Parxes withdrew a scroll from his robe and held it out. This arrived for you two days ago, from Lord Mosibar's estate. Horus took the scroll and inspected the imprint rolled across the wax seal. With a nod, he went upstairs to change out of his traveling clothes. His room remained as he'd left it. A bed of Akeshian construction stood low to the ground with a firm reed mattress, but Horus had introduced western-style sheets of fine linen, cooler than woolen blankets. They didn't make him sweat like silk did. He also insisted on real pillows stuffed with feathers rather than the stiff bolsters used by the locals. A vase of fresh lilies sat by the open window. A robe, silver silk with black trim at the cuffs and collar, and clean sandals had been set out, as well as the copper bathtub, filled and ready for him. A few minutes after settling into the tub, his curiosity got the better of him. He picked the scroll up off the floor, broke the seal, and unrolled the papyrus sheet. The letter, written in a fine, precise hand, looked close enough to Lord Mulsibar's script that Horace had to peer closely to see the differences. First sword of Ergosh. Protector of the city, Horus of Arnos, I greet you. Since learning of my great uncle's passing, I have recently returned to Erugosh to take possession of my inheritance. It has come to my attention that certain items of property have been bequeathed to your lordship. I invite you to visit at your convenience so that I may make your acquaintance and enjoy the pleasure of knowing one who was counted as a friend of my late uncle, who now dwells among the stars above forever and ever. Lady Anshara of the House Alulu. The stilted style of writing led Horace to read it through twice to make sure he had the full meaning. Lord Mulsabar never mentioned any family, certainly not a niece. Uh, well, I should talk to her. Tell her what became of her uncle. It wasn't a conversation he looked forward to, but it was the right thing to do. He also wondered what items of property Mulsabar left to him. That old man was full of surprises. Setting the letter aside, Horace closed his eyes and allowed the outside world to drift away. His problems could wait until he finished his bath. Long shadows stretched across the city, cast from a hundred roofs and spires. Byleth shivered in the cool embrace of the night breezes. She had gone without a cloak. She yearned for the chill, the cool touch on her skin that drove away the lethargy wanting to claim her. She returned to find her city in the grip of chaos. Demonstrations occurred daily, the display at the docks the latest example. Though the city prisons were full, the protests continued. The commander of the city militia reported the people were angered over the attack on the chapter house. As if that was my fault. Though truth be told, the anger began before that, when Horus brought down the Sun Temple. Her people wanted him removed from his post and banished, if not worse. They didn't understand that she needed him. At least a little longer. She wondered what the rulers of the other nine imperial cities were doing at this moment. Of course, she didn't have to wonder about some of them. 
Her spies reported King Malak of Nisus had joined with the monarchs of Chiresh and Hirak, combining their legions into a single army. They shared a simple objective, drag her down from her throne. Thereafter, they would likely install some puppet chosen by the Sun Cult. I suppose I should be frightened. In truth, some part of her was. But overriding the fear burned a feeling of intense rage. Rage that they, her fellow kings, should dare band together against her. For what? She'd only defended her reign the same as any of them. Yet the other monarchs of the empire never accepted her as their equal. They continually plotted against her. All with the blessing of the emperor, no doubt. Simply because I am a woman, the first queen in over a hundred years. The last one before her had been Queen Pur Adimun of Tu'um. The histories called her the Tigress Queen for her ferocity. A woman had to be a tigress in this world if she didn't want to be used and discarded. Was it any wonder she longed for independence? In many ways, that idea served as the primary motivation of her life. Her father never coddled her, and she took her strength from his memory. Father, I wish I could talk to you now. I need your wisdom if I'm going to survive this path I've chosen to walk. Some wisdom, and a great deal of luck. I am here. Byleth turned to see Lord Astapta standing at the room's entrance. He wore his customary garb, a long robe of black cloth. No symbol of his status. It was an odd thing, Byleth realized as she faced him. When she hadn't seen Astapta in a while, she thought of him as a quiet, decent man. Yet each time she found herself in his presence, her skin crawled as if she had turned over a rock and found a serpent slithering underneath. The way he looked at her, the probing glances holding no shred of humility or decorum, she could almost believe he thought of her as a tool for his use, to be used and discarded. I sent for you over an hour ago. And I have come. What do you want? I'm still cross with you. Byleth reclined on a divan, deciding to be playful with her vizier, if only to watch him fume. You did not dismantle the storm engine as I commanded the knight I was supposed to marry. <laughs> a good thing, too. Else we would have suffered months of delay when you commanded me to rebuild it after you survived. Survived with your help, you mean? Oh, Astapta, you are not as inscrutable as you would like to believe. You are, after all, a man. Clever and valuable, but just a man. For a moment, she found herself longing for Zazil. For all his faults, her brother took action. She might have forgiven him for his betrayals, if not for his utter incompetence. Never mind that. The next time you disobey my command, you will suffer for it. Do I make myself clear? Lord Estopta bowed, perhaps a trifle deeper than his usual obeisance. I am ever your faithful partner. Yes, but I wish you were more of a loyal servant. All right, then. Tell me what you know about the incident at the chapter house. Only what is common knowledge. The royal guard continued to invest the order's position after you departed from the city. There was little activity to be seen from the outside until eight nights ago when one of your officers heard a disturbance. The soldiers eventually entered to find the priest dead. What could have happened? I have not had reason to conjecture. Have you been to the site? No. I ordered an investigation, although I doubt we shall discover anything about the identity of the killers. The culprits apparently had the ability to get in and out of the compound without being detected by my soldiers or my Zoanii. Still, I intend to know the truth about this attack. I don't give a damn about the lives of those Order Zealots, but I don't enjoy the idea of a nest of murderers, possibly with political motives, lurking inside my city. <clears throat> she stood up and paced across the white carpet. Her eyes alighted on the mural of the gods and focused briefly on the figure of Erimu. The goddess's pitch-black eyes glittered as if real, peering into this room from the fathomless abyss. Of course, the people are unhappy about it, though only the Silver Lady knows why. The cult of Amor has been no friend to the commons while they were in power, but to see the protests in my streets, you would think the Sun Horse had been loved more than myself. She stood, waiting for Lord Astapta to deny that observation, as the other members of her court had been so quick to do. He merely stood in silence, watching her. 
Did you know there was a public burning today? She resumed pacing. An outlaw priest of the Sun Cult set himself on fire at the palace gates. A crowd of people watched. Hmm. I have heard that three cities, including Nisus, have declared war on you. Yes, I received the formal declaration while I was away. A punishment for the death of the Prince of Nisus, naturally. But I don't know what is motivating the other kings to join in, beyond the natural desire for more lands. My agents tell me the armies are gathering at Nisus. Strangely, though, they already have enough troops to lay siege to this city, but they have not yet marched. Astapta remained quiet for a few seconds, staring at the window on the other side of the room. What if these two incidents, the Chapter House and the impending war, are related in some way? Byleth stopped pacing and looked at him. How so? I cannot say without authority, but the King of Nisus is firmly under the thumb of the Sun Cult. Who would profit from inciting the followers of Amor here in Aragash, if not the armies preparing to seize your throne? And that would also explain why those armies haven't marched yet. Damn them! This couldn't have happened at a worse time. I will not allow the Sun Cult to re-establish its power in my city. That's why I need you to stop this army before it reaches Erugash. Lord Estopta's eyebrows lifted a hair. <laughs> Thus, we return to the subject of the Storm Engine. Yes, yes, spare me your righteous indignation. Your decision to disobey me does have some benefit. Can you do it? Isn't that why you have an army? The legions are needed elsewhere. At Omiko, for one, since you failed to destroy it once again. The engine operated within acceptable margins during the charging phase. A storm was generated and was underway when a malfunction occurred. I don't care about malfunctions. The town still stands. I commanded you to destroy it down to the last stone. Hmm. Complications are bound to happen. They can be corrected, but it takes time and... Her ire grew as his words drifted away, knowing where this was going. What kind of complications? The desert take you, Astapta. Just say what you want and be done with it. The machine requires additional calibration since the last demonstration. And for that I require additional... More victims for your experiments. Test subjects. I've given you scores of victims, including my most trusted advisor and my own brother. Her Zoana surged through her veins, almost begging her to smash him to the floor. But it's never enough. You won't be satisfied until you've bled this city dry. Byleth expected a response to her outburst, if only a denial of her fears. Yet Lord Estopta remained perfectly still, as if he were watching a performance in the park. Oh, fine! I will get you more test subjects, but you must do what you can in the meantime. I don't need to remind you of what will happen to you should I be overthrown. The cult of Amur would like nothing better than to send your soul to the underworld in a blaze of fire. Hmm, no doubt. I will do what can be done, though it may be all in vain, for I fear the Imperial Court will surely censor you and demand that you present yourself in Seasa to answer for your actions. Byleth harbored the same fear, though she was wise enough to keep it from reflecting in her expression. I will do no such thing, as you well know. I have done nothing to deserve this antagonism from my peers. What happened to Prince Tatanu was none of my doing. And I explained as much in my letter to his father. And the Sun Cult struck at me first, without provocation. Which makes no difference to the Primarch. And it is he who has the ear of the Emperor. You think I don't know that? Byleth didn't realize she had resumed pacing until she almost ran into the wall. I have escaped one trap only to find myself in another. Then it might be time to reevaluate. She turned back to him, her arms crossed over her breasts. Go on. Are you prepared to contest for the Empire, as your father attempted before you? Attempted and failed. The disgrace that stains my blood to this day and me forevermore unless I do something to cleanse it. One lesson she'd learned from her father's failure. She needed powerful allies if she wanted to capture the Chalcedony throne. 
The ten cities tended to balance themselves between various factions that played off each other. Urim, Samira, and Yuldir usually aligned themselves with Sayasa, creating an imperialistic bloc in the east. As Ipur and Tu'um vied frequently with Yuldir for dominance of the central Typhon Valley, they opposed the imperialists on most matters. Chiresh and Hirak usually switched between the two factions, depending on which side offered them the most to gain. Even before the prince's death, Nisus traditionally aligned itself against Aragash because of their long-standing rivalry over the trade routes to the west. Because of this, their support was rarely sought by either faction, which contented Byleth. Like her father, she tried to remain out of imperial politics unless vital to her personal well-being. But no matter what scenario she imagined, she could not see a way to sway enough cities to support her bid for Empress to make it even a remote possibility. Sayasa, with the backing of the Sun Cult, was too powerful to challenge. Not without the Storm Engine. That was the key. But I need to know I can count on it. If I can cow the other cities into getting out of my way, I might have a chance. Astapta intruded upon her thoughts. What do you intend to do about the slave uprising? The first sword has been charged with putting it down. Astapta's thin lips took a slight downward twist. Why? He may not be the best man for the job. His loyalties are no doubt conflicted. The first sword was, after all, once a slave himself. Byleth knew that, but Horace had come to mean so much to her and to her plans for the future that she quite forgot about his past travails. I made my decision. You need to concern yourself with the task at hand. Find a way to stop that army before it crosses the Typhon. He bowed from the waist. As you command. She went back to the window, not bothering to watch him leave. It was a small gesture, but it spoke of the trust she granted him, against all reason. He proved himself the night of the Tamuras, when her life hung in the balance. Down below, her city prepared for nightfall. Light poured from the windows of homes as families gathered for the evening meal. From fest halls and pleasure houses where men and women slaked their lusts, to the temples where priests and priestesses chanted the evening vespers, they were all her people. They dwelt oblivious to the doom poised above their heads. Silver Lady of the Moon, watch over us all. The Muharet Hills rose from the central salt marshes of the River Delta. Covered in thick forest and surrounded by leagues of treacherous wetlands, they were difficult to approach from any direction. As such, they remained uninhabited. Branches of the mighty Typhon meandered through the moss-covered trees, carving out islands of dry ground. In the morning, white mist cloaked their hoary slopes, obscuring all but the tip of the central hilltop. Jiram blinked away a trickle of sweat as he kept an eye out for predators. He marched at the middle of the column as they headed toward the large hill. There, according to the messages they received at various rebel hideouts, was where the gathering would take place. Emanon said little more about it, which didn't seem to bother anyone else. Jiram supposed the longtime rebels were accustomed to Emanon's detachment, but he couldn't shake the feeling Emanon harbored anger at him for some reason. The farther they traveled, away from the merchant roads and towns of the Empire, the more uneasy Jaram grew. It was the same feeling he felt at the Old Stone before they attacked the caravan. He trusted Emanon with his life, but wondered privately if this wasn't a bad idea. They left the wagon behind two days ago when they reached the edge of the Delta, its wheels unsuited to this wet terrain. The rebels took turns pulling the sled they built from wagon parts, on which rested the treasure boxes from the raid under a heap of leather hides. The bronze blades traveled alongside the rebels. 77 men at arms, they ranged from pikemen to heavy infantry to crossbowmen and specialists. Their leader, Captain Ovar, rode the ugliest horse Jaram had ever seen, a creature covered in patches of yellow and red with a shit brown mane. The mercenary captain rode over closer. Ah. I see you are admiring my lesser. Actually, I can't decide whether to steal it so I can get off my feet, or cook and eat it. A fine animal. So, 
this meeting we are headed toward. Your captain hasn't been very forthcoming about it. But I don't expect you to betray his confidence, but I'd like to know if my men are going to be in danger. Jerom looked at him out of the sides of his eyes. Captain Ovar, you know as much as I do. From past experience, I can tell you to keep your men on a tight leash. This trouble usually follows us. That's good advice, Lieutenant. By the way, how do you like being an officer? You never made it past sergeant before, right? It's just like any other rank. The ship runs downhill and the complaints run in the opposite direction. Being an officer just means more responsibility and less people to listen to your bitching. He glanced back at the man. So, who do you complain to, Captain? Ovar smiled up at the sky. <laughs> They're the only ones who will listen without talking back. <laughs> Jerome couldn't help chuckling. However, he remained vigilant around the mercenary leader. Longar and Three Moons spoke highly of him, but there was no telling how far his loyalty really ran. When the fighting started, and Jerome had no doubt there would be more battles in their future, would these cell swords stand or flee? Jerome looked up at the sound. Emanon was huddled with a group of scouts. Longar was among them. He had taken command of the Pathfinders, as smoothly as if they were back in the old company. Jerome quickened his pace to catch up. Captain Ovar came along, invited or not. They find something? An outer marker. We're almost there. Jerome looked ahead. The slopes of the hills, about a mile away, were visible through the gaps in the forest canopy. So are you going to tell us what you've got planned at this big meeting? Nothing. Honestly, Jerome. I wish I could take credit, but the other captains must have put it together. Hell, I would have picked someplace more hospitable. Like a cave in the desert? Maybe. Jerome took Emanon by the arm and pulled him aside. He didn't care who saw. What the hell is your problem? I don't know what you're talking about. You keep saying you don't know anything, but this meeting, or whatever it is, sounds like what you've been wanting all along. Getting these small groups to band together to fight the Akeshians. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? So tell me what's wrong. I guess I'm not good at sharing. He waved his hand at the fighters marching past. For a long time, I was all these men had. And they were all I had. Now things are changing. The way you took charge in the Merkhaven. It showed me I'm expendable. That's insane. Every one of these men would lay down their life for you. Me included. You built this movement. And you're still in command. But you need to learn to delegate. The bigger this rebellion gets, the less control you're going to have unless you learn to trust your officers. See, you know more about command structure than I do. Jerom lowered his head until their gazes were level and stared into Emanon's eyes. I might have more experience, but I'm not the leader you are. I could never do what you do. <laughs> so you're saying I should just quit complaining and get back to running this crew? You got it, Captain. Jerom winked. And if you have something to say, then just spit it out. Or next time you try keeping things from me, I'll knock your head against a tree. Uh, yeah, that sounds like something you do. With that, Emanon marched ahead. He has an interesting command style. Jerom watched the back of his departing partner, wondering what the man had planned this time. Only the gods knew. No, he's just an asshole sometimes. They crossed through another swampy valley before they reached the tall hill at the center of the delta. Stony ridges curved around its base to form a huge natural basin. A narrow creek meandered through the center, out into the marsh beyond, but otherwise the ground was dry and firm. Hundreds of tents and crude shelters crowded the basin. Numerous campfires twinkled under the trees, filling the air with a haze of wood smoke. People congregated around the fires. Not just men, but plenty of women and children, too. In all, Jerome estimated there were between two and three thousand people camped here. Emanon set up his band on the southern edge of the gathering site and told them to dig in for an extended stay. Then he left before Jerome could talk to him. Left in charge, Jerome supervised the construction of crude shelters for the band. Then he helped move the treasure boxes inside one of the lodgings and put Jercoul in charge of guarding them. Guard them? 
But don't look like you're guarding them. We don't want anyone sniffing around. Got it? Jerom left them to figure it out. He noticed the mercenaries making their camp a stone's throw away. It was a true military camp, squared up with lines as straight as an arrow's flight. He grabbed one of the rebel corporals, Lapu, and told him he wanted their camp fortified the same way. And lined the ditch with a double row of sharpened stakes, one cubit high. Jerom went back to surveying the basin. Whoever set up this encampment had at least possessed enough sense to post pickets all around the ridge. A regular procession of observers moved up and down the wooded slopes. Much like Eminon's band, the rebel fighters gathered were a motley collection. They wore a wide variety of armor, most of it looking like bits and pieces of gear collected from battlefields. Their weapons were equally eclectic, although most carried some form of spear, long or short. To Jaram's eye, they looked undisciplined, little more than a mob. Ain't much to look at, huh? <laughs> Three Moon spat into a pool of brackish water and scratched his nose. He looked even more ancient in the fading light. His face gleamed with sweat, making every line and crack stand out. No, but they've noticed your crew's arrival. It's not too late to back out, old timer. And miss all the fun? No, sir. I want to be there when this band of fools butts heads with a full Akeshian legion. Be careful what you wish for. Yep. The gods just might hear and give you a belly full of attention. That's why we signed on. What's that supposed to mean? We're old men, all of us. And that's a curse for soldiers like us. To outlive all your friends and find yourself without anything left to fight for. The boys and I are here because we want to go out on our feet, so to speak. You think we're all going to die? Victory or death? One is about the same as the other. Is that what I sound like to these young fighters? Gods, strike me mute if I do. Come with me, old man. Where are we going? I'm tired of waiting around for something interesting to happen. Ah, about time, Sergeant. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Funny. Call your captain to tag along, too. He'll probably want to see this. As Joram suspected, Ovar was quite interested in a look around. The three of them made their way through the large encampment. Rebels sat around smoky fires, cooking and eating, pissing and shitting in holes dug under the trees, screwing under blankets. There were a lot of dogs nosing around. Not the wild kind. These animals had the look of domesticated pets, though they roamed the camp in small packs. Jaram wanted to find Eminon, but more importantly, he wanted to discover who called this convocation. The bulk of the camp formed a vast semicircle around the base of the hill. If there was a command center, he guessed he'd find it at the middle. So that's the direction he headed. He had to wade through throngs of people several times. Some of them called out, asking questions about where they had come from and what they knew about the war against imperial aggression. That was a common phrase he heard from several mouths, as if calling a rebellion something else is going to make it any easier to win. He looked closer and saw their fear, the preternatural brightness in their eyes as if they were on the verge of tears, even as they smiled and laughed. He heard the strain in their voices. He'd seen it before in the gladiator arena, mainly from the newer slave fighters as they prepared for their first, and usually last, bout right before the gate opened and they were thrust into the fray. Seeing it, he felt ashamed for judging them. They were holding together as best they could in the face of an enemy so vast and powerful that just the act of defiance was a measure of courage. If they all die tomorrow, they would still die in the service of freedom. They dared to seize it with both hands, no matter the cost. It was easier for him, he'd fought all his life. This was just another campaign, though it might be the first time he'd fought for something he believed in instead of fighting for pay or mere survival. Damn you, Eminon, where in the hells did you go? Three Moons pointed to a group of bright red-painted wooden posts driven upright into the ground near the foot of the hill. Objects hung from them on long spikes. Feathers, strings of beads, even small bones. Totems. He hadn't seen their like since he left his homeland. His people venerated the gods of the earth and sky, appeased them with offerings, and warded off unwanted spirits with fetishes like these posts. But what were they to the rebels? Then he heard the drums creating a low rumble like distant thunder, sending vibrations through the earth. 
He felt them through his feet, reminding him of his childhood when he would join his family and neighbors in the traditional dances. The sounds quickened his pulse. He hurried ahead, trusting three moons to keep up. A cordon of sentries stopped them outside the posts. Beyond them, a bonfire burned in a hollow recess gouged out of the hill. Its sheer face formed a natural concave wall three man lengths high. A dozen men sat around the fire. Hemenon was among them. Only the Chosen can pass here. The guard's bristly black beard dusted his round stomach when he spoke. Jiram pointed to Emanon. I've come to see my war leader. The bearded sentry ground the butt of his spear in the soil. Go back to your tent and wait like the rest. Jiram considered a violent response when Three Moon stepped forward. Pardon us. The totem posts on either side began to shake, causing the fetishes nailed to them to rattle. Heads turned as the rattling grew louder, until even the Council of Captains stopped debating and stood up to look in their direction. The sentries stepped back, hands lifted in surrender. Jiram grimaced at Three Moons, and the sorcerer winked. Behind them, Captain Ovar just watched. They walked up to the bonfire. The rebel commanders were a mixed bunch, both old and young. Most had the sun-bronzed complexion and nondescript garb of desert warriors. However, one stood out from the rest. Jiram noted him immediately. The biggest man sitting at the fire, both tall and powerfully built, he wore little more than a few scraps of rawhide, as if still a slave. His skin was lighter than most of his comrades, and he wore his night black hair in long braids down to his shoulders. His eyes shone deep and dark, hiding his thoughts. A huge war mace lay by his side. What was that display about? Emanon stalked over to intercept Jiram and Three Moons. What display? The spirits of this land are strong. Sometimes they speak through the whisper of the wind and the quaking of stone. Jiram indicated the big man with the dark eyes. Who's that? Ramagesh. He was once a body slave to the Prince of Chiresh, or so I've heard. The rumor is that he killed his royal master on a hunting trip, snapped his neck. Then he ran away to join the rebellion. He's been tearing up the countryside between Hirak and Epur ever since, and making quite a name for himself. Did he call this assembly? No. Emanon pointed to a skinny, bare-chested man who stood on the far side of the bonfire. He wore his hair pulled back in a knot at the top of his head. That would be Neskarik. They call him the General. Watch out for him. He's a black-hearted bastard. You know him? Aye. He was the man who freed me. Jiram waited for more to the story. Emanon turned back to the fire. Jiram followed. A few of the other commanders looked over as Jiram, Captain Ovar, and Three Moon sat down with Emanon, but no one tried to stop them. You didn't miss much. These old warthogs were just swapping stories about how many enemies they've killed. If you believe half of what they say, the Akeshians have already been wiped out several times over. One of the commanders, a stout veteran with a jagged scar around his neck, pointed at Jiram. This is the one we've heard about Emanon. Jiram, the Red Blade Wielder? It is. I found him in one of Byleth's army camps. He was a gladiator before that. He took that sword from Hazael et Hananuk's corpse. He nodded to Jiram. Show them the blade. Jiram didn't like the idea of people talking about him when he wasn't around. But he grabbed the hilt of the Asurana sword and drew it halfway. The blade gleamed scarlet in the firelight. Murmurs passed around the bonfire. They died down as Neskarig lifted a hand. The drums fell silent. Jerome Redblade, we welcome your voice to this council. Everyone listened. Brothers, I have called you together to discuss our great enemy. As most of you already know, a battle was fought at the city of Omakur. With the aid of the soldiers of Atonia, we crushed the legions assembled against us. However, the Queen of Eragosh returned with fell sorcery. The town remains under siege, and many brave warriors lost their lives. Emanon was there. He knows of what I speak. Aye, we were at Omikur. We ambushed the Queen's soldiers and won that day. But we left before the bitch struck back. Of what followed after, we're as ignorant as the rest of you. 
The commanders next talked in low voices about the great army gathering at Nisus. Evidently, some of the kings of Akeshia were about to march on Aragash. No one bothered to include in their discussions Jeram or Emanon, who sat and stared into the fire, though many cautious glances were thrown in Captain Ovar's direction. Jeram watched the thus far silent Ramagesh. He merely sat and watched the others. He's waiting for something. What is it? Perhaps he's the general's pet. We should return to Omikur and crush the queen's legions again. We dealt them a hard blow before. Now, we should finish the job. Exactly. The foreigners trapped inside would be valuable allies. A short squat commander with shaggy eyebrows shook his bald head. Screw those foreign bastards. They invade our lands, seeking to steal our gold, rape our women. No. Let them rot inside that tomb they call Omicor. Many fists pounded the ground. Then let us attack Nisus. The first commander held up both hands. Listen! Once that army leaves, the city will be guarded by only old men and boys, while the Nisusi and Erugashi grind themselves to dust. We shall live like kings! Shut up, Lord Gis. You're always going on about Nisus. It's too big a target for us, even guarded by old geezers. So what do we do? Glances moved around the campfire as the rebels mumbled and shrugged. Jeram was waiting for the general to speak up when a voice rose up beside him. Now is the time. Everyone looked over as Emanon stood up. Jeram saw Neskarig begin to rise as well, but Ramagesh shook his head. The general sat back down, a sour frown on his face. So, the big one is not the pet. He holds the leash. Emanon hitched his thumbs in his leather belt as he looked around at the other captains. Now is the time to push harder, to be more aggressive and take the fight to our enemy. The queen is beset by enemies on all sides. My men and I have struck inside her city. We have attacked her outposts and holdings. All this with just a handful of fighters. Yet, if we band it together... We heard about your mission in Erugash. All you did was kick the wasp's nest and draw attention to the rest of us. Some of us like working in the shadows. We've been gaining support with the locals. They feed us and hide us when the Akeshians come looking. But we'll never be free hiding in the shadows. Not without a fight. The Empire won't relent until it has crushed us. This is a fight to the death. Jeram couldn't tell if Emanon had swayed enough of them to matter as they argued among themselves. He didn't see how it could be resolved with words. These men were, at heart, little different from the tribal elders of his homeland. Each sought to retain power over his personal fiefdom. Emanon was the only one here who saw how this tribalism would lead to eventual defeat. He is right. A strange feeling lodged behind Jeram's breastbone as Ramagesh stood. He rose above the others like a giant, a bone-hilted kukri sheathed at his hip. Emanon speaks the truth of it. We must band together if we want to be victorious. The time for quiet action is over. The Empire knows of our cause. And even now, the kings of Akeshia are moving to crush us. But if we stand together, my brothers, nothing can defeat us. We shall be as the whirlwind that flattens homes and scatters armies. We shall not stop until all men are freed from bondage, even if it means shedding the last drop of our blood. Before he knew it, Jeram was standing with the rest of the captains. Many of them cheered Ramagesh's words. Rebels from beyond the totem posts watched. Some joined the cheering, even though they did not know why. Emanon stood silent. Jiram put a hand on his shoulder, but Emanon stepped away. He approached Ramagesh, who now conferred quietly with Neskarig. Where then? Where will we focus our combined might? The cheering died down as the captains, then the people gathered beyond the posts, stopped to listen. Jiram knew what Emanon wanted, but it didn't seem feasible, not yet. These fighters were drunk on eloquent oratory, but he could lose them with the wrong word. What do you suggest? Erugash. 
Jerome held his breath as fear became reality. He looked around the council fire and saw the call to action die in the eyes of the assembled captains. Shit on a stick. Jerome agreed. Eminon bit off too much and lost them. Neskarig looked as if he wanted to say something, but he held his tongue. Ramagesh swept his gaze across the assembly, landing on Jaram. Redblade, what do you say about this? Jaram shifted his feet at the sudden attention. This was the last thing he wanted. He felt the pressure of the gazes upon him, especially from Ramagesh. He knew what he should say, but he also knew it wouldn't make a difference. At best, he could cause a rift among the rebels. This was a time when they needed to stand unified if they were to have any hope of survival. However, his true loyalty lay not with the rebellion, but with one man. I stand with my war leader. We can't stand against the Zoanii! Erugash has never been taken, not even by the combined armies of the other nine cities. We'll all be crucified! Jaram weathered their condemnation. He looked down into Emanon's steady gaze. It was all the consolation he needed, for now. Finally, Ramagesh lifted his mace to the night sky. No, my brothers. We are not ready to face the Queen. One day we shall be, but today is not that day. Yet we will strike and let the Empire know of the strength of our conviction. And we shall keep hitting them until the crowded heads of Akesha fall at our feet. Feet stamped on the hard ground, a sound that spread through the basin. The drums joined in until it seemed as if the hills bounced to the rhythm. This is a leader that men would follow to the very gates of the lowest hell. Jerome turned to Eminon, trying to gauge his companion's reaction, but Eminon's face was set like granite. Now what? Now I have to go twist some arms, or else this is all for nothing. Is that going to help matters? Ramagesh and the General hold the others in the palms of their hands. They aren't going to budge without a good reason. I'm still going to try. You risk driving them further away. The campaign against the Empire will be long and bloody. Bide your time. Wait until the other commanders are looking for a new direction, when they'll be more open to your suggestions. <sighs> what do you want us to do? Get back to camp and sit tight on those coin boxes. Eminon turned to go, and Jaram put a hand on his shoulder. Eminon turned. Be careful. With a wink, his captain strode away toward the haphazard array of tents north of the council area. Jaram watched him, wondering why he felt a lump in his stomach. It was the same feeling he used to get before a battle. He's quite a jackass. Three moons had scavenged a skin from somewhere. By the purple color of his lips, it was wine. He passed the skin to Jaram. I can see why you like him. He makes me insane sometimes. Jaram took a sip. He'd guessed wrong. It was brandy, and surprisingly strong at that. Uh, uh, I make no apology for that. I wouldn't think so. Though I must admit it's difficult to understand this new you. The Sergeant Jaram I remember once almost beat a man to death with his fist for disobeying an order. You think I've changed? Disobey me and find out. Then he smiled. Come on, old man. Let's go see what trouble our boys are getting into. Captain, care to join us? Captain Ovar shook his head. He stayed back during the entire conversation, just watching and listening. No, gentlemen, I am going to find my blanket. I have a feeling tomorrow is going to be a busy day. As the mercenary captain strode off, Jaram and Three Moons walked back through the camp on their own, passing the skin back and forth. I've seen you do a lot of tricks, Three Moons like rattling those totems back there. But you don't bleed when working your magic. Why not? Three Moons picked something out of his teeth, held it up, and then put whatever it was back into his mouth. You've been spending time around those Keshi-eye sorcerers, huh? Aye. The blood runs down their arms and faces when they work their spells. They're just different. The Keshi-eye feed their power from within, so it rips them up when it comes out. But me, well... I'm just a backwoods warlock. I talk to the spirits, and sometimes they show up to play. Jerome shook his head at Three Moons' idea of play. After supper with his men and placing sentries for the night, Jerom headed to his kit, where he found a branch and bark lean-to over his bedding and gear. 
Hmm. He took off his sword belt and propped the weapon against the lean-to. He was unlacing his boiled leather jerkin when Eminon appeared and silently offered to help. The deft fingers made short work of the lacing. Did you have any luck convincing them? Not much. You were right. None of them wanted to speak out against Ramagesh. It might be for the best. I've seen what the Empire can do when provoked, and an attack on Aragosh would incite the rest of the cities to exact revenge. Eminon released the lacing and stepped back. So what are you saying? That we're beaten already? Jerome turned around and felt his hands clench into tight fists, almost as if it were happening to someone else. His blood pumped hot and fierce through his chest. He had to make an effort to keep control of his temper. That's not what I'm saying. You know this army can't match up to a pitched battle against even a single legion. With the Crusaders driven back to the coast, we're on our own. We need a smart campaign. Continue hitting them and running before they can strike back. I'm sick of hitting and running. We aren't going to defeat an empire with pinpricks. Jerome stepped closer and met his captain's gaze. Not all at once, but we can bleed them. At the same time, we can use some of that gold to buy help on the inside. What was the name of that agent in the Queen's boudoir? I'm not backing down, Jerome. He could see the ferocity turning Eminon's green eyes nearly black. All right, then we won't back down. Eminon returned to helping Jerome off with his leather jerkin. I just need you to have faith. They each sat down on the soft bedroll. <sighs> you never told me. What is Ramagesh's plan? Where does he want to attack? Some town up north, on the Typhon main artery. What's it called? Uh, Sekatun. Just a little trading town. Sekatun? That's where I met Horus. Just coincidence? He started to comb through his fading memories of the place. But Eminon drew his attention back to the moment at hand, and Jerome stopped thinking about the rebellion for a time. The streets of the dredge twisted and crooked like the tunnels of a serpent's warren, turning back on themselves and leading to dead ends as often as not. This district had once been the home of craftsmen, sandal makers, dyers, hemp weavers, and papyrus presses. But over time, the better off citizens moved to nicer neighborhoods, leaving behind those who could not afford to escape. The neighborhood fell into a cycle of squalor, each successive generation poorer and more desperate than their forebears. Alira stepped around a puddle that may or may not have been mud on her way down what passed for the main street of the dredge. She kept one hand on the handle of her knife under her cloak. The city had grown less hospitable over the past few months, especially at night. The angry people would have given her hope in another time, as it must surely encourage the network of agents for whom she worked over several years in its plan to destabilize the Empire. Now, though, things had become complicated. Alira recalled her service as a handmaiden, the constant sense of excitement and fear haunting each moment. Now free, she welcomed control over her life, but missed the access to the affairs of the palace she once possessed. Horus, you came into my life and turned everything upside down. Most days I don't know whether to bless you or curse you. After the Tamuras debacle, the network safe houses in the dredge closed. Alira left several messages in drop locations, but received no replies. As near as she could tell, the spy ring exiled her. No mystery why. She refused an order to leave Horus to his fate as he wallowed in the dungeons under the Sun Temple. Did she refuse out of love? She didn't know. But since then, she continued the mission on her own, using assets she cultivated to assist the local rebels. She'd been shocked this morning to find an encrypted message on her bedside table. Come to the Lily House at the fourth hour. All is forgiven. When she first came to Aragash as part of a slaver caravan, she'd been kept at a secret location until her handlers could arrange for her to be bought by the palace. It was a quaint house at the southern tail of the dredge, unremarkable in any way among the other poor homes, except for a picture of a gorgeous white lily painted on the front door. She followed the directions in her head, trying to find the right street. Everything looked different in the dark. After getting turned around a couple of times, she finally sighted a pale candle at the end of a crooked street, packed between two homes that appeared abandoned. Alira stopped a few doors away and dipped into the shadow of a small alley. 
The door beside the candle was painted with a white lily. Watching the house, she considered what she was going to say to whoever had invited her here. She assumed that the line, all is forgiven, meant she was being welcomed back to the network, but she couldn't be sure. After serving the Namedia government for years, she'd come to understand the way they operated. They saw her choice to save Horace as a betrayal of the worst kind. This might be a trap, a lure to a remote place so the network could punish her for the transgression. If so, why now? What do they want? Making sure her knife rested loose in its sheath, Alira stepped out of the alley. Just as she stepped up to the door, it opened before her, the painted panels giving way to the darkness within. Then a familiar figure appeared, the old woman Alira saw so many times before at the old safe house. The front room was just the way she remembered it, though older and dustier. Two small oil lamps showed plaster walls covered in cracks and a scuffed wood floor. Stairs led up to the second floor. A wooden bench sat against the far wall under the alcoves for the hearth gods, all empty. A hallway led back to the kitchen and eating area, but at a gesture from the old woman, Alira took the stairs. Nostalgia nibbled at her heart as she saw the frescoes on the walls of the upstairs hallway. A pastoral scene of three young shepherds watching over their flock in a valley between two towering mountains. She and Sefkahed drew it over several days while they waited for their positions at the palace to clear. Alira ran her fingers over the smooth plaster up to the rough spots at the top that they didn't have time to finish. She remembered they planned to paint a starry sky overhead, but the call came to start their new lives as slaves to the queen. It seemed like another lifetime, as if this picture had been painted by another girl. I wasn't sure you'd remember this place. Cypher stood in the doorway to the bedroom where she'd once stayed, his face leaner than she remembered. Silver hairs gleamed at his temples. Of course. This is where I first met you. I recall you always had a worried look on your face. That much at least hasn't changed. Uh, pardon all the secrecy, but the old safe house wasn't, well, safe anymore. Since the night of the fall, we've been driven deeper underground. The fall. That's an interesting way to put it. Yes, a lot of things fell on that night. One of them was my esteem for the network. You know, that wasn't my decision, Alira. I had my orders. Your orders were unconscionable. To let a good man die because the network saw some slight advantage in his death? And how did that work out? Ah, we want you back. This comes from Knight himself. Why should I consider it? You turned against me. I have my own assets now and more influence than ever before. I know why you need me, but what do I need with you? He actually looked pained. Oh, things are happening, and we don't have enough eyes in the right places. More than that, we have a mission that needs to be accomplished. The rebels are gaining ground, and the network sees an opportunity to capitalize on their success. But our relationship with their leadership soured since you left. I didn't leave. You left me. And I apologize for that mistake. Trust me when I tell you it won't happen again. Assuming I'm willing to return, what do you want me to do? He held out a slip of papyrus. Go to this address and retrieve a series of letters. They are from various Zoanii houses, pledging their support to the men listed if the queen should be deposed. A coup? What does that have to do with the rebellion? That's what we want to find out. We need to know who's involved and what they are planning. That's it? Just get these letters? That's it. You still haven't said what's in it for me. Alira, you were never mercenary in the past. Things change. My life is different now. I'm going to need a few things from the network. Such as? I need someone inside the civil planning office. City planning? Whatever for? That's my business. Second, I need to see everything the network knows about the killings at the chapter house. Alira, I can't possibly... Don't argue. Just get it. Ah, uh, I have to check a few sources, but you'll have the information by the end of the week. Perfect. Oh, and one more thing. Find another place to meet. Somewhere outside the dredge. She still didn't understand why she accepted the mission. Just as she was freeing herself from the network's machinations, they had found a way to pull her back in.
Thank you, Majesty, for inviting me. As Lady Anshara spoke, Queen Byleth nodded politely while appraising what she saw. She's quite fetching. Not gorgeous, but striking to look at. And so tall. I wonder why she dresses so conservatively. They sat in one of the palace's smaller audience chambers, the queen on an ancient wooden throne and the lady on a settee a few feet away. Lady Anshara was 25 years of age, with her silky black hair wrapped into a long braid. She wore a dress of green silk with short sleeves and a divided skirt. Interesting tattoos covered both her exposed arms of lotus blossoms and various animals along swirls of pale blue water. Her eyes were a bit small, her mouth a trifle too narrow, yet there was something about her that reminded Byleth of an old painting. It is good to get out of my late uncle's home for a little while. That place is a maze. I spend many summers roaming its halls and alcoves. Lord Mulcibar, may his memory shine forever, was a great man and a great friend to the throne. That is most kind of you to say, Majesty. You were most recently living in Sayasa, were you not? Yes, Majesty. I've been studying under Mistress Udina for the past year. Byleth glanced to the side where Shan Tu stood. Lady Udina of House Purimu tutored only the most promising Zoanii. She had a reputation as one of the most demanding and sought-after teachers of the art in all the Empire. Byleth herself had wanted to apply once upon a time, but fate intervened when her father was killed and she became queen. Majesty, I was hoping to be allowed to join your court. Of course, I would be delighted, my dear. Although I must say I am surprised. I assumed you would be returning to the capital after you put your uncle's affairs in order. I'm sure nothing here could compare to the legendary entertainments of the Imperial Court. Lady Anshara made a tiny, rigid shake of her head. If it pleases, Your Majesty, I am committed to remaining here in Erugosh. For many generations, my family has served this city and its monarchs. The lady slipped off her chair and went down on both knees. Jean Tu started to make a defensive warding, but Byleth stopped him from interfering with an upraised finger. Majesty, my queen, forgive my presumption, but I seek to take up my late uncle's mantle, to advise you and serve you if you will have me. Byleth gazed deep into Anshara's eyes. They gave open invitation for a mind sift, and Byleth was tempted, but she liked this young woman's poise and confidence. She placed a hand on her head. I accept your service, Lady Anshara. You are hereby made a member of our personal guard, charged with protecting our person from all threats, with all the rights and privileges of that rank. The lady's eyes held a faint glisten of moisture as she nodded. Thank you, Majesty. It will be my sincerest honor and pleasure. All right, then. Rise. Lord Jean too will explain your duties. Lady Anshara bowed low and backed away. Yes, Majesty. Then, without being told, she went to stand against the wall opposite Jean Tu. Byleth exchanged glances with Jean Tu, both of them indicating surprise at this turn of events. She nodded to the nuncio near the chamber doors. The man left to fetch the next audience. Byleth's day was packed with meetings as she tried to manage several crises from the palace at once. She needed to assure her loyal Zoanii that all fared well in the realm, confer with those nobles who showed reticence toward her since the fall of the Sun Temple, hoping to sway them to her cause, and lastly, as much as she detested it, she had to meet with members of the lesser castes, the merchants, bankers, and guildsmen, those who dealt with the other cities on a regular basis, to convince them to invest their funds in Aragash's future. While she waited, Byleth daydreamed about escaping the palace for a walk in the gardens. It seemed impossible that she had only just returned from hiatus. She came back to reality as Hetta entered from the door hidden behind a tapestry and hurried over. Byleth allowed herself to ravage the girl with her eyes. Hetta was quickly maturing into a delicious morsel, so meek and demure, and possessing an incredible threshold for pain 
or pleasure. The handmaiden held out a tiny scroll. The seal had been broken, and the message inspected by her guard before delivering it to her. The message came from the eldest daughter, the second-ranking priestess at the Temple of the Moon. The contents stabbed at her heart, but Byleth kept the emotion from showing on her face. She gave the scroll back to Hetta and dismissed her. The main door opened to admit a portly man in a fine suit of silk and ermine. Master Brukana, please enter and be welcome. We have much to discuss. Nostalgia engulfed Horus as he strolled around the vast parlor of Lord Mulsibar's estate. Three footmen in uniform ushered him inside with such deference it made him a little nervous. More servants waited inside the massive atrium. Within seconds, Horus had been offered wine, fresh fruit, a hot bath, and a change of footwear. Refusing it all, with as much good grace as he could summon, he asked to see the mistress of the house. He was shown into this parlor, nearly large enough to hold the entire royal stables, and left alone. He strolled around the room, looking at the beautiful decor. Several of the paintings on the walls were taller than he was. He examined a glass case containing tiny, incredibly lifelike porcelain figurines. Another case displayed weapons. Mounted between two bronze statues, he saw a large document in a handsome frame. He turned to see a tall woman enter. She wore a dress, but there was something militant about her. Perhaps it was the way she stood, or how she examined him, sizing him up from across the room. Oddly, he didn't notice any family resemblance to Mulsibar. Lady Anshara, I'm Horus. I received your letter and wanted to pay my respects. She crossed over to him and gestured to a pair of stiff couches. Please sit. I will call for refreshment. Horus took a seat closer to the window. He tried to hide a grimace as he sat down. The couch was every bit as uncomfortable as it looked. When the lady raised her eyebrows, he touched his side. Uh, my injury. It's still healing. Hai. The attack at the Queen's Winter Palace. I've read your report. How fortunate Her Majesty survived. Indeed. It seems there is always some danger in the Queen's vicinity. Until now, perhaps. I intend to change that. You see, I've just joined Her Majesty's personal guard. A chill ran down Horace's back. He hadn't even considered that she would be a sorceress. Ah, then I feel better knowing the Queen is in such good hands. He smiled again, but it faltered on his face. Her expression never changed. She was as stoic as an abbot, which made him think of Gilgar. I, uh, knew the former occupant of that post, Lord Jantu's brother. <sighs> May his name never be spoken again. Of all the crimes of humanity, First Sword, betrayal of one's liege is the most heinous. I, uh, agree, my lady. The sudden sound almost made Horace jump. Two burly men entered, carrying a large trunk between them. My late uncle left this for your lordship. For his final instructions, I am delivering it to you. Thank you. The container looked twice as big as a typical seaman's footlocker and made from a deep black wood with bronze fittings. Seals of red wax covered the three latches on the front face. What would Mulsivar leave him? Then he remembered he had something for her. Oh, here. Horus reached into a pocket and drew out Mulsibar's amulet. He didn't really want to give it away, but it belonged here with the old man's heir. Lady Anshara took the amulet and held it up. I remember this. I saw my uncle wearing it on occasion. Its purpose is to harness the power of the moon to ward off hostile influences. Sadly, it's been exposed to sunlight. What? Why is that bad? The sun and moon represent opposite forces in the mystical arts. Once the device was touched by sunlight, it became impotent. A feeling of deep sorrow overtook Horace at the news. He felt as if he had soiled Mulsibar's memory by ruining the talisman. I'm very sorry. I don't know much about the Zawana yet. Your uncle was tutoring me for a time. Unfortunately, he passed too early to give me a proper education. She held the amulet out to him. Here, keep it as a memento. I insist. He took it back gingerly, as if it were a holy relic. I'll treasure it. Lady Anshara stood. 
I have many new duties to attend to. A little startled, he got to his feet. Of course, as do I. Thank you again. If you need anything, please let me know. That is very kind. Good day, Lord Horus. A hundred paces. No more than a bowshot was all that separated the two shores of the Typhon, at this point on the northern edge of the delta, fifty leagues from where it flowed into the sea. The lights of Sechatun twinkled on the other side of the dark waters. Jiram looked over his shoulder yet again amidst the overgrown tall swamp grass and stunted mangrove trees on this southern bank. Fireflies swarmed over the water like tiny will-o'-the-wisps. Emanon stood beside him underneath the low canopy. Ramagesh, with his two-handed mace slung over his shoulder, stood a few yards away with Naskarig and two other rebel captains. Smerdis, a tall man with unusually thick arms and shoulders, and Rotimo Lam, who stood a full head shorter but stockier in build. He wore a leather patch over his right eye. Both had been chosen because of their close ties to Ramagesh, surprising no one. Jaram wondered why the council chose Emanon and him to join this party. From here, Sakhatun looked peaceful. No sign of the cruelty performed inside its walls. The town served as a hub for the slave trade in this province. The news that its former lord, Isiratu, died in the collapse of the Temple of Amor in Aragash cheered Jaram. He touched the brand on his cheek, a gift from the late nobleman. But memories troubled him about this operation. Sekhatun was the seat of the queen's power in this part of the empire. The trade passing through its gates and docks made Aragash wealthy. He feared the rebels weren't ready for an attack of this magnitude. So far, he and Emanon selected targets where they had the advantage in numbers. This time, they would be rolling the bones and praying for fortune's favor. He disliked gambling, especially with men's lives. The morning after the council meeting, Ramagesh had announced that he and a select few captains would meet with a local sympathizer who had information about the target. On the two-day journey through the marshy delta, Ramagesh had showed them every hospitality. He marched beside them during the day, regaling them with stories about his life. Born a slave in the house of a minor lord in Samira, on the eastern side of the empire, he grew to serve as a bodyguard in his master's house, until he killed his master and his master's eldest son while on a trading trip in Sayasa. He escaped into the capital's vast populace, eventually meeting the nascent rebellion there and joining their ranks. He'd been fighting the empire from the shadows ever since. Both nights, Ramagesh shared his fire with them as well, although Emanon wasn't overly polite about it. Jiram understood his companion's frustration with being relegated to a subordinate status after being his own man for so long, but he hoped Emanon would come to realize they needed a stable command structure if the rebellion could ever pose a serious threat to the Akeshian military. For his part, Jiram knew how to take orders. Although he enjoyed the months when Emanon's band roamed free, he felt a comfort belonging to a larger organization. Emanon patted his shoulder. I think they're here. Ramagesh and Naskarig moved out of the shadows of the trees, and Emanon followed with the other captains. Jiram remained a couple of paces behind, watching Emanon's back. Before leaving, Three Moons told Jiram to be careful. Even if Jiram wasn't superstitious by nature, Ramagesh and the general behaved as if this entire operation were just for show. But who is the audience? The captains went down to the water's edge. Jiram was unsure what they were waiting for until he saw the tiny light bobbing over the river. Then the prow of a boat appeared. Jiram dropped a hand to the hilt of his sword as the vessel landed. It was a river barge, one of the smaller types used by merchants to ferry their goods. Several men stood on the wide single deck. The light came from a shuttered lantern hanging by a hook from the vessel's aft where a lone helmsman plied the sweep. The passengers got off, three men wrapped in dark cloaks. As they stepped onto the shore, they lowered their hoods. All three were young, barely in their twenties. One stood ahead of the others, a handsome youth with short cropped black hair and a fair copper complexion. Which of you is Ramagesh? Durlong. The two gripped forearms, then Ramagesh introduced the captains. Durlong greeted everyone cordially while his two companions remained where they stood, silent and observant. Finished with introductions, the youth held out a leather satchel to Ramagesh. 
I have the information you want. Garrison numbers, duty schedules, patrol sweeps, even fortification assessments by the Royal Engineers. Everything you'll need to plan your attack. Very good. Ramagesh took a bulging sack in return and passed it to the youth. And here is your payment, as we agreed. Jorlang made the bag disappear under his cloak. I also bring some news, which I'm happy to pass along for free. A new envoy from Erugash arrived yesterday. Smerdis turned to Rotimo Lom. <laughs> a royal envoy could bring a fine ransom if we get him alive. And if not, we can plop his head on a spike to show the queen what happens if she crosses us. What are these idiots thinking? A head on a spike isn't going to cow a queen like Byleth. Ramagesh better talk some sense into his new lieutenants. Who is this envoy? Lord Ubar of House Nipturas. Jerom remembered Lord Ubar from the trek to Aragash. His father died not long ago when the temple fell. Indeed. Lord Ubar hasn't been back to town since that event. We assumed he was being held prisoner by the Queen. And what word does the son of Isiratu bring? He says he wishes to meet with the rebel slaves on behalf of the First Sword. So Horus is not the enemy. He's reaching out to us. This is a good sign. Meet? To what end? To discuss a peaceful resolution. Or so he says. Smerdis shook his head. Ha! It's a trap. The Queen thinks we're stupid enough to fall prey to her ruse. Perhaps not. No, Smerdis is right. It smells like a trick. The Empire believes the movement will crumble if it can kill our leadership. Jerom stared at his companion's back, not believing his ears. He'd told Emanon several times he didn't think Horus would betray them to the Akeshians. I agree. We shouldn't trust anything coming from Ergash. Ramagesh turned to look at Jerom. What do you say, Redblade? Is this offer a trick? Jerom glanced at Emanon, who had turned along with the rest of the party to observe him. He chose his words carefully. I know this first sword. Horus Del Rosa. We were slaves together for a time. He is a good man. If this envoy truly speaks for him, then I would trust him. Ramagesh nodded. Jerome and I think alike. I will meet with his men. Smerdis and Rortimo Lom looked ready to argue, but Neskarig silenced them with a downward slash of his hand. Ramagesh pulled Durlong aside to speak privately. After a few minutes, Ramagesh and the agent shook hands, and the three men from Sekatun climbed back aboard the barge as it pushed off from shore. Durlong will set up the meeting for tomorrow night. Jaram, if you don't mind, I'd like your help going over this information on the town's defenses. The captains filed through the trees back toward the temporary camp they'd set up a mile to the south. Jaram fell in beside Emanon. Emanon stared straight ahead, giving no indication how he felt. Jaram opened his mouth to say something, but closed it when he couldn't decide what to say. I'm fine. You sure? Yep. I just hope you're right about your old friend. They returned to the campsite to find a pot of lamb and curry bubbling over the fire. The ground had been cleared to make room for a dozen men to sleep. They brought no tents or materials to build shelter, only blankets. The half dozen rebel fighters they'd left behind stirred as they arrived. Three Moons sat with his back against the trunk of an ancient tree. As Jerome sat down, Three Moons took a sip from the wineskin in his hand and offered it to him. Jerome shook his head. He looked for Emanon, but the captain had disappeared. Everyone else assembled around the campfire to eat. What happened at the secret meeting? Jerome related the events on the riverbank. It seems our new leader is quite resourceful. Ramagesh sat by the fire, talking with the others while they ate. He looked the part of a freedom fighter, carrying only his tools of war, able to survive off the land, commending the respect of his men. Aye, I wish Emanon could see it. We have enough problems without fighting among ourselves. He'll come around. You remember Corporal Vargi? How could I forget? He crowed like a rooster in front of the barracks every morning. Everyone wanted to kill him. Except no one did. Sergeant Fazu made sure of that. He was a mean son of a goat. I always wondered why he took such a shine to Vargi. Because they were bunkmates, if you take my meaning. 
Jerome wanted to smack himself in the head for not seeing it. That explains a lot. I should have guessed. So you're saying I'm Vargi and Eminon is my Fasu? Doesn't matter who is who. What matters is they accepted each other, right or wrong. Everything else worked itself out. I'll keep that in mind. I just wish I knew how this attack was going to play out. It could either be a master stroke or an epic disaster. Jerome accepted a bowl of stew and a hunk of bread from one of the cooks. The stew was hot, but it was so good after a long day of marching, he couldn't resist shoveling it into his mouth right away. After a few bites, he grabbed the wineskin from Three Moons and took a drink to quench the heat. <sighs> what the hells is that? Three Moons took back the skin. It's my own recipe. Equal parts of plum brandy, northern fire water, and millet wine. It tastes like fermented horse piss. I hesitate to ask how you know that. Smerdis plopped down beside him. Jerome looked sideways at Three Moons, who shrugged and held out the skin. The rebel captain took a swig and winced, his eyes almost closing in pain as he swallowed. <sighs> oh, that's a... that's... I don't know what to call that. Horse piss? Well, I've tasted worse. Smerdis shoveled stew into his mouth. Damn. I swear Laris can make anything into a fine meal. Which one is Laris? Smerdis pointed out a young rebel by the fire. He was skinny, with bronze-colored hair that came down to his shoulders. He was a stable hand before he ran away to join the good fight. Can you believe that? We all have a past. True. Especially you two, eh? One a wizard, and the other? I heard about how you got that red sword. Killed one of Her Highness's commanders. That's nice work. Jerome nodded. Three Moons had closed his eyes and rested his head back against the tree. Longar had entered the camp, his boots covered in mud. Leaves and twigs stuck in his hair. The lead scout took a bowl and turned toward them. He looked like he was going to come over until he spotted Smerdis. With a neutral expression, he found an empty rock on the edge of the camp. Anyway, I don't mean to pry. But some of the boys have been wondering why you follow Eminon in the first place. From what we hear, you're the muscle and the brains of the operation. Eminon is the reason we're free today. He is our leader, the only leader some of us will ever follow. Don't get me wrong, but your captain has always been something of a wild hare. That's why he was forced to operate out of that training camp. What do you mean? Who forced him? The movement did. We mostly recruit from the outer towns and villages, places where the Empire doesn't keep a large presence. Eminon started plucking slaves from the big plantations along the Typhon, right from the belly of the beach. Stirred up a mess of trouble that had all of us looking over our shoulders. Patrols were increased. Akeshians started crucifying anyone who stepped out of line. The captains called a big meeting, and Eminon got put straight. Apparently, the rebellion didn't know Eminon had returned to sacking rural homesteads after Omicor. That was something to think about. So he started recruiting from the Legion's camps? Isn't that even riskier for him and you? Yep. Most of the captains thought he'd be caught and impaled on a pole. Some were even praying for it. But that bastard has more luck than a three-headed calf. And do you believe I would help you? The rebel captain grinned and winked. <laughs> nah, not really. I just wanted to get a sense of you. It's no secret that most of us don't trust your boss, but it's a small comfort knowing his second in command has a sensible head on his shoulders. Glad I could ease your mind. Jerome stood up. Three Moons opened an eye to watch him, but then closed it, not moving. Jerome started in the direction of his bedroll, but he passed by it and kept walking out of the camp altogether. He was too irritated to think about sleep. These rebels were like a pack of cats trapped in a bag together, all clawing at each other instead of focused on finding a way out. All but Ramagesh. Fifty paces away from the camp, Jerome recalled the rebel leader asked to meet with him to talk strategy. He'll find me tomorrow. Unless I keep walking, just keep going and disappear. Gods above, how many times has that thought crossed my mind? Always before, it was Eminon who kept me here. Now, 
he's angry at me. To hell with him. To hell with them all. Despite his ire, he stopped at a fallen tree beside a narrow creek. Sitting on the mossy trunk, he listened to the sounds of the marshy wilds. It was peaceful here. Certainly more peaceful than the conversations around camp. Even worse, he didn't know who he could trust among these new allies. Alira passed from the city center with its fine estates and temples into the garden quarter. She enjoyed her autonomy. Free women could come and go as they pleased without permission from a prying owner. However, people noticed free women in Akeshia, especially when alone. A slave could blend into her surroundings. Alira crossed the stone bridge over an artificial canal where the clay streets gave way to smooth cobbles made from river stones. Shade trees lined the boulevards here, blocking out the wan moonlight to create shadowy tunnels. This part of the city contained older noble houses. Tall walls surrounded the palaces with their soaring minarets and marble domes. Lights occasionally moved behind the walls as armed guards walked the grounds. Her destination lay in the oldest section of the neighborhood at the end of a winding avenue. Ancient cypresses loomed beyond the estate's stone walls, covered in patches of gray and white lichen. The heavy bronze gates, wide enough to admit two carriages side by side, hung black with age. The estate belonged to a former general, Lord Kafanum at Poranu. Alira had done a little digging on him. Although he had retired from his official post not long after Byleth assumed the throne, the Lord General still maintained many political ties, including a personal connection to the Order of the Crimson Flame. Two of his nephews served in the Order, both stationed in other cities. The more she learned about him, the more Alira suspected Cypher was right. This was precisely the sort of man who would support a coup. She didn't know what game the network played here. She doubted the Nemedians wanted to aid Byleth. The fall of a major city-state could kick off a civil war that might conceivably expand to embroil the entire empire. That seemed like the best possible outcome for the spy ring. It troubled her that she couldn't see their plan. Alira approached the side gate where she was supposed to meet her contact. <sighs> a small light gleamed through the bars. She darted toward it. Katara? Yes. The woman inside opened the gate. She held a lamp in one hand and a key in the other and stood easily a head taller than Alira. A long shawl wrapped her willowy frame down to her knees. Under the shawl, Alira could see a fine gown of undyed linen and an iron collar. Narrower than most collars and tightly fitted around the woman's slender neck, it reminded Alira of the golden one she wore for years. She ducked inside the gate. Sorry I'm late. It couldn't be helped. Come. The slave's entrance is this way. The wings of the estate's main house sprawled across an acre of ground. The central portion reached up four stories, including a pointed roof surrounded by eight minarets built in an antique style. The stonework was exquisite, even in the dark. Tall rows of hedges divided an intricate series of gardens. Like many homes of the wealthy, the manor had several entrances. The one for slaves was a small door hidden between two flowering bushes that rose almost to the height of the roof. <whistles> Following Katara, Alira arrived at the general's study. This is the master's study. It is not locked, but take care not to disturb anything. He notices when his private things are out of place. I must be back to bed before the master wakes. Thank you. I know you're taking a risk. The woman looked down her nose. I am the mistress of a wealthy lord who treats me kindly, which is a far cry from the life in the midden where I grew up. I owed a debt, and now that debt is paid. Tell them I will not betray my master again. So you're happy? I'm content. That is enough. The luck of the Silver Lady be with you. As Alira lifted the brass latch, the door beside the study rattled. Alira glanced back the way she had come, but there was nowhere to hide in the hallway. Holding her breath, she shoved open the study door, darted inside, then closed it quickly and quietly. She pressed her ear to the wooden panels and listened. Too late, she realized the lamplight could probably be seen through the crack beneath the door. She felt for her knife, but didn't draw it. She didn't want to have to use it on the owner of the house or his family. 
Unfortunately, the person outside didn't seem to have spotted her as footsteps sounded down the hallway away from the study. <sighs> Relieved, Alira took a moment to look around. The room was large and square, about ten paces on a side. Heavy draperies covered the windows on the south wall, and a musty smell hung in the air. She expected a desk or table, but instead saw only two chairs facing a hearth on the far side of the room. Three of the four walls were covered with wooden shelves from floor to ceiling. She started searching. Setting the lamp on the back of a chair, Alira tried to determine if the shelves were filed with some kind of system. But after finding things as varied as plans for the estate's landscaping, kept alongside warehouse inventories, she wasn't sure the order was based on any logic at all. Alira carried the lamp to the next row of niches. She went through the writings as quickly as possible, her exasperation growing. After nearly half an hour of looking, she found some interesting things, among them the last instructions to the local order chapter house. According to the document, the Captain Curate received orders to stay and defend the house at all costs. The interesting part was a confirmation that order reinforcements were imminent. If the occupants of the chapter house had survived until help arrived, Alira wondered how that would have changed the balance of power in Aragash. How far would the queen have gone in her defiance of the sun cult? Tucked behind a roll of blank papyrus, she found a stack of letters between the Lord General and one of his nephews in Hirak. A quick perusal discovered nothing unusual. The text of the letters was uninteresting, mainly a dry accounting of the life of a temple priest, but she saw something about them that raised her suspicions. They were too boring, as if the writers wanted these letters to be passed off as meaningless by unwanted eyes. Thinking they might contain coded messages, she stuffed them into her bag. Oh. Lyra glanced across the rows of shelves. She hadn't found any mention of a plan to attack the Queen. In fact, the Order's last directive clearly stated the Captain Curate must not provoke the Queen in any way to only defend themselves in extreme circumstances. She was about to leave when she noticed an odd detail. A piece of the paneling behind one of the shelves on the east wall hung slightly askew. It didn't join properly with its mate. Alira went over and tapped the panel. It swung inward to reveal a secret nook. She saw a roll of papers hidden inside. She took them over to the lamp and went through them quickly. Her heart beat faster with every sheet she unrolled. It was all here, just as Cypher expected. Letters from noble families in other cities, including one from a prominent house with imperial blood ties, all promising their support for Lord Kafanum in the event of a coup. They were dissatisfied with Byleth's leadership and her friction with the Sun Cult. Alira didn't see a response from Lord Kafanum to any of these letters, but these were enough. She added them to her satchel. Then she blew out the lamp and went to the door. Trying to make herself small in the darkness, she left the house and headed back to the cattle quarter. The battle lines were drawn. Horace stared across the gleaming battlefield at his adversaries. Their cool glances returned nothing but mocking challenge. When he placed a hand upon the hilt of his sword, his enemies looked back and forth among themselves. None of them faltered in their resolve. The silence stretched out for minutes that seemed like hours. Finally, he lowered his gaze. <sighs> Horace slumped back in his chair as the other ministers filed out of the council chamber, leaving him alone at the long, polished table. A hot breeze played across the back of his neck from the open window behind him. Flames flickered and the half-dozen lamps hanging from the chamber ceiling, throwing shadows across the walls. For the last three hours, he tried with every ounce of persuasion he possessed to convince the council to ratify new orders concerning his prosecution of the rebellion, a common-sense de-escalation of a conflict quickly growing out of control across the Queen's province. They defied him on every single measure, not budging an inch no matter what he tried. In fact, their proposals would only exacerbate the tension. Angered at the council's rebuff, Horace refused to agree to their remedies as well, leaving both sides stymied. The final hour of the meeting devolved into a contest of wills, the entire council arrayed against him. Tempers flared and harsh words were exchanged. One minister called him a filthy pukarag, whatever that was. Horace pushed himself to his feet and left. A pair of his personal guards joined him at the door. 
Thankfully, none of the council members remained to confront him in the hallway, as had happened before. Since the Tamuras, he hadn't received any personal challenges either, but his detractors hadn't ceased in their efforts to bring him down. They just took different tacks to undermine his authority, like these council sessions. Formerly, the First Sword could act unilaterally in the Queen's name, but the council called a secret session just a few days after the Holy Day, while he convalesced from his injuries, and passed a special law requiring all his orders undergo council approval. Horace took the matter to the Queen, but Byleth told him she wouldn't interfere. All the while, he knew various members of the court were trying to convince the Queen to take a harsher course in regard to the rebellion, erasing all his efforts. Mazim met him with a sheaf of scrolls. Master, I put together a list of witnesses to the self-immolation yesterday morning, and the Tanner's Guild sent a request they be allowed to increase the price of their wares. Horace took the list of witnesses. Why are they petitioning me? Isn't that something for the city minister to handle? For most guilds, yes. But the tanners and leather workers fall under the purview of the First Sword because their industry has been deemed of the utmost value in times of war. There's also a report from each legion detailing their current inventories and budgets for the rest of the year. Oh, and quotes from various grain suppliers for next season. Once you select one, I'll arrange for delivery of the first payment with the Royal Treasury. I, I don't have time to deal with that. Send the petitions to the High General's office. Is there any news from Lord Ubar's expedition? Not as yet, but I will check with the palace messenger service right away. What about the search for Jerome? I put a dispatch on your desk from an officer of the Third Legion who was at the Battle of Omikur. He reports that almost all the dog soldiers were killed in action, either by the enemy or by the legionnaires themselves when the slaves tried to rebel. He has no confirmation, however, of your friend's demise. Apparently, the dog soldiers were buried in mass graves in the desert, and finding evidence of a single man is exceedingly difficult. <sighs> of course. Nothing can ever be easy, can it? Pardon? Eh, nothing. Go find out about Lord Ubar. At once. There's just one last thing. The protests continue in various places around the city. Yes, I noticed a couple on my way in. The Royal Chancellor has voiced some concern about safety. Of course. We can't have Master Unagon wetting himself. Order additional guards at the palace gates and on the Queen's personal detail. Anything else? Uh, ne, Belum. As his secretary scurried away, Horace walked to his office at the back of the suite. His inner sanctum was bare, with the only furnishings being a desk and chair. The former was a gift from the Queen. A handsome block of cedar, its front was carved with a relief image of the palace and the entire desk painted with rich red varnish. <laughs> a yawn escaped him as he sat down and opened the first field report. After a quick scan, he opened another, and then a third. They weren't good. Over the past two months, more than six separate attacks occurred, including the one that so incensed the queen. The royal caravan sacked and its contents, listed only as tribute from the northern estates, stolen. Clearly, the rebellion was gaining momentum. Making my job nearly impossible with the same stroke. As he read more, a pattern emerged. The rebels seemed to attack at random, never hitting the same target twice, then slipping away before reinforcements could arrive. Horace sent the forces at his disposal to bolster important garrisons, but it was never enough. Also included among the dispatches were reports of Zuanii cracking down in their own fiefs with harsh penalties for just about any infraction. One lord in a town east of Aragash allegedly boiled 18 of his field slaves alive because he suspected them of collaborating with the rebels. No proof of their guilt was found. Horace pounded his fist on the desk. These draconian methods only made the problem worse. But just as with the council, the noble caste refused to hear reason. Horus put down the scrolls and rubbed his eyes. He wasn't getting anywhere. What he wanted more than anything was something to eat and a strong drink, and perhaps to look at the stars from his terrace until he fell asleep. Horus pushed his chair away from the desk and got up. His guards stood outside the door. Beckoning them to follow, he left the suite. They passed a few people Horus knew from court on the way out, but he didn't stop to talk. Not that they seemed eager to see him, either. 
He assumed a powerful title would attract all sorts of people, those seeking favors and wanting to form alliances. But in his case, the elevation to First Sword made him less popular with the other Zoanii, if that was possible. This entire country is insane. I must be mad to stay here with them. Or too damn stubborn to give up on a losing proposition. Only a few days back at the palace and I'm ready to slit my stomach. Let someone else deal with these headaches. He left the palace by the west gate. Horace declined a palanquin when offered, deciding he wanted to walk instead. It was a nice evening. A pleasant breeze from off the canal kept the insects at bay. The moon was just rising above the skyline, limning the city's roofs and towers with a soft silver glow. Most of the government buildings were closing. Street cleaners worked the avenues, cleaning up the day's accumulation of refuse and animal dung. Slave-born litters navigated the boulevards like proud ships, led by link boys with burning brands to ward off the night. Horace passed by the site of the demolished Sun Temple. The gates stood chained. Through the iron bars, Horace could see the vast pile of stone and debris. It still boggled his mind. He was responsible for such devastation. He heard sinkholes opened in the temple courtyard as a result of the collapse. Work crews had been assigned to fill them, but according to the reports, the larger ones kept opening up. Horace considered stopping at an eatery for supper when three men appeared at the end of the block, barring the way. Their crimson robes wavered in the evening breeze. Standing still, their faces hidden under deep hoods and hands pulled up into their sleeves, they nonetheless radiated an aura of malice. The Order of the Crimson Flame. How did they get into the city? Then he saw something strange in the way the sorcerer priests stood, hunched over at the shoulders as if in pain. His bodyguards drew their weapons and stepped ahead of him. Horace thought to stop them, but before he could, a stinging wind reeking of ozone and burning metal rushed down the street. With one arm thrown over his face, Horace closed his eyes against a cloud of flying dust swirling around him and reached for his Zoana. To his surprise, the power answered his call. He quickly formed a bubble of air around himself and his guards that blocked out the foul wind. Then he fashioned the first offensive attack that came to mind. He wove together strands of fire into a seething sphere. Its angry vermilion glow blinded his eyes. He hurled it through the swirling dust cloud in the direction of the priests. A sudden spike of pain pierced his chest. He squeezed his eyes shut just before the sphere exploded. A torrent of scalding heat engulfed the street. <laughs> Rubbing the grit from his eyes, Horace peered down the street. The three robed men were gone. A circle of untouched clay pavement lay where they once stood. The rest of the street was awash in flames. Pangs of guilt stabbed Horace as he saw the damage he wrought. The outer facings of the buildings on both sides, homes, shops, a wine hall, were completely torn away, exposing the singed beams of their interiors. Tell me I didn't kill anyone. The guilt fed the fire of rage burning inside him. He reached for his Zoana again to combat the fires before they burned out of control, and he had to battle with his Ka to keep it open. Finally, he wrested away enough power from the Mordab Dominion to summon a gentle mist. The flames sizzled as the water vapor dampened their ire, but it did nothing to cool Horus. Then he noticed something inside the circle of pristine pavement where the priests stood. A person lay on the street, covered by a shimmering sheet of yellow silk. His guards rushed ahead of him as Horus approached the figure. He caught the edge of the silk sheet with his toe and kicked it away. His stomach clenched in a painful spasm when he saw the face staring up at him. Mulsibar. A thousand questions crowded Horace's mind as he looked down at his friend's corpse. They were battered down by a tide of rage. Ever since the night of the Temuris, he struggled with Mulsabar's loss, fearing he may have buried his one-time mentor under the rubble of the fallen Sun Temple. Now to be faced with the proof that Mulsabar had not been inside the temple when it fell, that he must have been alive all this time, threatened to break down the walls of his self-control. The Zoana surged inside him, wanting a release, but he held it in tight check as he beckoned to his guards. They rolled the corpse inside the yellow sheet and picked it up. They marched toward his home through the empty streets, a silent funeral procession. Lock the doors! All of them! Horace barked orders as he strode into his home. He turned to his guards. Take Lord Musabar to the dining room. 
He swept the dinner service off the table. Place him here. Lamps were lit around the room. Harksees rushed in, staff in hand. Master, what's happening? Lock down the house and keep everyone inside. Where is Alira? I believe the mistress is in her chambers, Master. Go make sure, and have two of the house guards stay with her at all times until you hear otherwise from me. Understood? Aye, Master. As the steward ran off, Horace looked down at Mulsibar, still wrapped in the yellow sheet. Alira entered the room. There you are. Horace, what did you say to... Is that what I think it is? Horace pulled back the sheet. <gasps> Horace still balanced on the edge of rage, but he had calmed enough to feel the thread of sadness winding inside him, taut as a harp's strings. His temper could snap with the wrong word. He imagined the Order priests coming here to punish him for his transgressions. He welcomed the idea. Anything to assuage the guilt he felt for not continuing the search for his friend. Had he not involved himself with the Queen's machinations, might he have saved Mulsibar? What happened? Three red robes stopped me on the way home. I thought they wanted to fight, but they just disappeared and left this body behind. I thought all the Sun Priests were gone from the city, but these were as brazen as dockside whores. Alira bent over the body, examining it with a meticulousness that both impressed Horace and made him uneasy that she could be so clinical with a person they had both known. Mulsabar's face was bruised with a nasty round cut in the center of his forehead. Dried blood stained his temples and cheeks. His body was naked beneath the silk, revealing battered arms and long welts across the ribcage. Black bruises covered his emaciated wrists, now so small they looked as if they belonged to a child. It's obvious they tortured him, but I don't know how. None of this looks like other victims I've seen. Damn it! Horace threw the sheet back over Mulsabar's face. Harxis! The steward appeared in the doorway. Here, master. No one gets in or out until I return. Where are you going? Horace stalked out of the room without answering, through the foyer to the front door. Flinging it open, he looked back to the guards behind him. Stay here and protect her, no matter what happens. They saluted and took up positions inside as he closed the door behind him. He heard the sound of the wooden bar settling into brackets on the other side, barring the entrance. Though it wouldn't stop a sorcerer, it made him feel a little better. What was he doing? He hadn't answered Alira because he didn't know. There was no plan, just an empty, helpless feeling melded with his rage demanding retribution. He needed a target. Standing alone, separated from the buildings around it by a wide square, the fortress was deathly quiet. The moon's rays glinted off specks of mica in the dark gray stones of its walls. A murder of crows perched atop the ramparts. They took off with tremulous flutters as Horace arrived. The headache pounded behind his eyes as he stared at the chapter house. His rage brought him here. The fortress stood largely vacant, with only a single guard post outside the main gate where four soldiers in royal livery stood around a brazier. Before he gave the idea conscious thought, the Zoana was there, filling him with its heady power. The Kishargal dominion opened, yawning in the pit of his stomach. He drew forth as much as he could hold, until the energy filled every ounce of his being, yearning for release. The Zoana flowed out of him of its own accord, following seams in the ground under the street, fissures he never knew existed. They reached deep into the earth like roots seeking nourishment, but Horus focused on the surface. In his mind, he could see the magic penetrating the foundation of the chapter house walls, the tendrils working into every pore and infinitesimal crack, widening them as they pierced deeper into the stonework. As he worked, a foreign sensation tickled the back of his mind, as if someone or thing watched him. He tried to put it out of his mind. Then he noticed another thread of Zawana had insinuated itself into his weaving. A thread of the void entered through his ka without a call. The discovery chilled Horus, but also felt right. The Shinar combined easily with the Kishargal to create something new, a powerful dark energy setting his nerves buzzing. The ground trembled beneath his feet. Horus followed his instincts. The order must be made to pay. A deep rumble rose from the street, and with it returned the pain, drilling into his chest like a blunt awl. The guards at the fortress's front gate staggered and fell to the ground. The first stone fell, knocked loose from a crenellation atop the southern wall. The clay of the street shattered as it landed. Within a dozen heartbeats, stones were falling all along the fortress ramparts. A crackling sound ripped through the night, and then the entire western wall collapsed. 
Sweat poured down Horace's face as he exerted himself harder, pushing the Zoana out. He reached through the ground for the central keep. He imagined cracks running up the sides of the stout tower of stone and brick, breaking off pieces of masonry. A distant growl clawed at the air, and then the keep's top floor crumbled, collapsing into the floor beneath it. The walls split open under the strain, and moments later the entire structure disintegrated in upon itself. <coughs> Horace reveled in the act of pure destruction, a balm easing the ache of losing Mulsabar. As the last walls collapsed, he observed that the damage wasn't confined to just the chapter house. The streets surrounding the Order Fortress writhed in the aftershock. Bricks and slate shingles crashed, trees toppled over, the portico of a stately townhouse collapsed in a pile of broken stone. Horace pulled back on the power, seeking to cut it off, yet the Zawana fought back like a ten-stone swordfish on the line. Finally, he succeeded in slamming his car shut, and the power evaporated. The pains in his head and chest flared to the point where he couldn't see straight. Motes of silver and gray light danced in front of his eyes. He couldn't believe what he'd just done. He felt empty. The rage was gone, leaving only a vague sensation of loss in its place. He nearly swallowed his tongue as his vision cleared, and he gazed upon the results. The entire neighborhood looked as if it had been struck by an earthquake. Ah. Oh. Why can't I control this? What's wrong with me? He couldn't do this anymore. Sooner or later, he would kill someone, leaving him unable to live with himself. Three robed figures appeared from the shadows before him. <gasps> Horace fumbled to reopen his car again until the three men pulled back their hoods. First sword. Lord Jean Tu stood before him. A frown creased his brow. I did not think to find you here this night. Horace breathed a little easier. The other two were Zoania he had seen in Jean Tu's company, though he didn't know their names. I... Uh, I'm sorry. I had an encounter with the Order earlier, and it let me... I heard of the appearance of three Crimson Brothers on the Street of Stars. They attacked you? <sighs> sort of. They vanished before anything happened, but left behind the body of Lord Mulsabar. Has word of this been sent to Her Majesty? No, not yet. I wasn't thinking straight. Horace looked past them to the mound of rubble filling the square where the fortress stood minutes ago. I didn't think it possible to do so much damage. What are you doing out here? Jean Tu flicked two fingers. His protégés departed, walking back toward the ruins. We have been ordered to keep watch over the chapter house. In case anyone returned to the scene, huh? Jean Tu didn't reply, but he tilted his head slightly to the side as if considering the question. Horace ran his hands through his sweaty hair. The evening, which seemed so balmy a couple of hours ago, had turned cool. I don't know how I'm going to explain this. I must send word of this to the Queen, First Sword. Yet, if I may speak on Her Majesty's behalf, I do not believe she will be vexed by your actions. She is, after all, a most gracious mistress. <sighs> Indeed. With a nod to Lord John II, Horace left the square with his head aching worse than before and a lump in his stomach. The feeling of being watched had faded. They arrived at the rendezvous point before sunrise. Growing light filtered through the canopy of leafy branches to illuminate the ruins of an ancient city. Mossy stones lay half buried in the soft earth, forming a network of lumps amid the trees. Here and there, pieces of clean white stone broke through the carpet of marsh grass. They were the bases of colossal pillars, broken statues, their features worn away, and the shattered remains of walkways. Spiderwebs cloaked the fallen monuments, spun by black and brown spiders as wide across as a man's hand. The smells of damp earth and dead leaves clung to the place. Shuram saw what he took at first to be a round hillock rising a score of feet above the riverbank, but the shape was too perfect to be natural. While the other captains waited by the water's edge, he went to investigate the hill, careful not to run into any webs. He pushed aside a curtain of snaking vines to find, to his surprise, a curving wall of pale dolomite rising before him. It was a dome, submerged in the muck and overgrown with vegetation. Despite its age, the surface of the stone remained smooth to the touch. Had this city fallen to a calamity like famine or war, or had the marshland simply swallowed it piece by piece until nothing was left? 
Captain Smerdis slapped his neck and pulled back his hand to reveal a bloody glob. Damn these gnats and bloodsuckers! Why are we meeting him here? It's far from prying eyes. Emanon made pointed glances to the east, west, and south. With plenty of avenues for escape if things go wrong. Rotimo Lom picked up a piece of stone and turned it over in his hands. What happened here? Ramagesh strode out from the tree line. The same that happens to all things in time. They fall. Just like the Akeshians shall fall under our blades. <laughs> <laughs> Emanon stood apart from the others, and apart from Jiram, too. He had not returned to camp until just before they were about to leave. When Jiram asked him where he'd been all night, he didn't answer. It was clear by the dark circles under his eyes he hadn't slept. Jiram worried his companion would do something careless, if not at this meeting, then later, perhaps back at the main encampment. Jiram studied the area. This section of the river bowed, protecting their entire northern flank. They would hear an approaching boat long before it landed. And while the trees obscured their vision, they also provided safe paths to exit if this meeting went badly. Ramagesh brought him, Emanon, Smerdis, and Rotimo Lom, but no one else. Why didn't the general come with us? He's taking care of other business. No one else questioned that. Jiram let it go. Neskarig and Ramagesh maintained an alliance, but he didn't know either man well enough to gauge how deep the bond went. He was learning, however. He and Ramagesh discussed the intelligence on Sekhatun on their way to the ruins. Jiram discovered the rebel leader possessed a keen mind for tactics. The sound drew Jiram's attention. The assembled captains turned at the noise of people cutting their way through the foliage, coming from the east. Jiram loosened his sword in its scabbard, but then dropped his hand from the hilt. Emanon merely glanced toward the noise as if hardly interested, then looked away to resume his study of the trees surrounding the ruins. Jiram longed to thaw the ice between them, but there was nothing to do or say. Five men emerged from the swamp. Four soldiers in steel helms and armor, the two in front held broad-bladed short swords in their hands, which they used to clear a path through the underbrush. The pair in back held bows. They surrounded a young man. Lord Ubar had changed a little since the last time Jiram had seen him. His hair, which had been long and usually pulled back in a queue, was cut short and flat on top in the style favored by Akeshian legionnaires. He wore a tunic and long skirt, both plain white. During the trek to Aragash, Jiram remembered the son of Asiratu being a quiet youth who did not draw attention to himself. But as he entered the ruins of the fallen town, the young lord walked with the confidence of an older man. Ramagesh strode forward to meet them. The soldiers started to draw in close around the young lord, but they backed away when Ubar gestured. Lord Ubar greeted Ramagesh with an extended hand and they shook. Ramagesh introduced the captains, but Ubar's gaze settled on Jiram. I have seen you before. Ubar's bright eyes shone in the early morning light. Everyone turned to look at Jiram, which increased his apprehension. Yes, my lord. I'm Jiram, son of Kirin. I was the slave of your father for a brief time. Lord Ubar had the good grace not to feign embarrassment, which impressed Jiram. The young nobleman merely nodded as if they were discussing happier times. Lord Ubar, we've gathered here at your request, though some of us are doubtful of your intentions. You've got that right. Let me put your minds at ease. I have come to negotiate on the authority vested in me by the First Sword of Erugash and Her Royal Highness, Queen Byleth of House Urdramor. Negotiate what? Your surrender, of course. <laughs> Rotimo Lom spat at the young lord's feet. Captain Smerdis dropped a hand to the war axe on his belt. Jaram tensed, waiting to see which side would break the peace first. However, Ramagesh shoved Rotimo Lom back to the rear of the party and shot a hard glance at Smerdis hard enough to convince the captain to move his hand away from his weapon. Forgive my brothers, no one is considering surrender. Surrender means a return to slavery, and we would rather die than put on the collar again. Jaram wondered about that for a moment. What would he do if he were back in Pardisha again, faced with the choice of execution or slavery? He honestly couldn't say. You must understand that your cause is doomed to fail. However, the First Sword is prepared to be lenient with those of our subjects who have offered violent rebellion against their Divine Sovereign. Although each of you deserves death, 
These sins may be forgiven if this situation comes to a peaceful conclusion. I'm not sure what all he said, but I don't think I like it. How can we trust your queen to honor this amnesty? Exactly. Emanon came over to stand with the other captains. What's to say you won't execute every one of us the moment we put down our arms? Damned right. The minute we give over, you'll round us up and take our heads. You think we're stupid? Unless... Unless what? Emanon looked to the envoy. We'll consider your queen's offer if our demand is met. What demand is that? Freedom. I've already granted that you and your men will be pardoned. No. Freedom for every slave in Erugash and its territories. What? Jaram almost echoed the envoy's astonishment. The queen would never accept such a condition. It was insane to even ask for it. But isn't that what we're fighting for? The liberty of every slave across the empire? Ramagesh looked about to cut in, but Emanon kept talking. We also demand a vow, sworn by the queen before her entire court, that she will not seek vengeance against any slave who rose up against her. Ubar's face contorted in an array of emotions from shock to outrage, yet the young envoy kept his composure. Why would Her Majesty accept such demands from the likes of you? Emanon opened his mouth, but it was Ramagesh who answered first. Because we're winning the war, Your Lordship. We harry your trade routes and threaten your holdings, and each day our numbers grow as more and more slaves leak from your grasp to join our movement. Both sides stared at each other for several long seconds. I am not empowered to discuss such matters. If you wish, I will deliver your demands to the First Sword. Ramagesh agreed, and the two men reached out to clasp hands. Jiram watched the exchange when he detected a slight movement behind Emanon. A face appeared from the foliage, followed by an arm, holding up a short throwing spear. Jiram reacted without thinking. Down! Jiram leapt toward Emanon. They collided chest to chest and fell to the ground. Shouts echoed through the ruins. He looked up to see Lord Ubar staring down at him, the spear jutting from his side, blood spreading across his white tunic. He collapsed. More spears flew through the air. Three of the envoy's guards fell before they could strike a single blow to avenge their lord. The fourth fell to Ramagesh's mace, the weapon caving in the side of the soldier's helmet. The other captains stood still as the last soldier fell to the marshy ground, his eyes as still as glass. Jaram started to get up until the point of a spear jabbed him in the shoulder. One of Ramagesh's fighters, a bearded rebel in his thirties, stood over him with the weapon, ready to stab. Jaram fell back to the earth beside Emanon, who likewise stayed where he was. You are right. Not a scratch. Yet. The other armed men had appeared from the surrounding forest. Jaram saw Neskarig among them. Let them up. The spearmen backed away. The rebel leader came over to them. Jaram, Emanon. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you about this beforehand, but I didn't know if I could trust you. Ramagesh bent down beside the young envoy and pulled free the spear that killed him. Even smeared in blood and dirt, the silvery point gleamed. This metal is a gift from the gods. For all his power, this wizard never had a chance. You understand why it had to be this way? Jaram understood all too well. Now the rebels were fully committed. There could be no peace now, no surrender. They either won or they all died. You had no intention of treating fairly with them. The rebel commander stood back up. Of course not. Eminon convinced me. Me? I never said anything about betraying a peace talk. You said we must be bold in our operations. No more fighting from the shadows. I agree. And this is how it begins. Victory lies before us. Niskari came over to Ubar's body with a sword. The general bent down and began hacking at the youth's neck. So what will it be? Are you with us? Jaram exchanged glances with Emanon. Doesn't look like we have much choice. Ramagesh placed a hand on Jaram's shoulder. Every man has a choice, son of Hiran. We want you with us to share in our eventual triumph over the Akeshians. What say you? His words took Jaram back to another time, back to Pardisha, when he'd been faced with the choice between slavery and death. In the end, it was no choice at all. We're with you. Ramagesh smiled. Behind him, Neskarig held up Ubar's head. 
twilight had slipped into darkness by the time Horace returned home. He passed more donations from his adherents and went inside. Candles illuminated the foyer. He stepped into the dining room and saw that Mulsabar's body had been removed. Good evening, Master. Harxes stood up from a chair in the corner. He looked half asleep. Where did the body go? I had it taken down to the cold cellar. The better to preserve it. I want to send a message to Lady Anshara to make arrangements. Mistress Alira has already taken care of that. Is everything all right, Master? Fine. Go to bed, Harxis. As you say. Horace went to his bedroom, tempted to call for a cool bath, but he didn't have the patience to wait. Where did you go? Huh? Alira sat in the low-backed chair in shadow on the other side of the room. <laughs> Why are you sitting in the dark? I was waiting for you. Are you all right? Horace sat on the end of the bed. I don't know. I feel bad about Mulsabar. That wasn't your fault. I told you before, Lord Mulsabar swam in dangerous waters. He knew the risks. He accepted them as the price of supporting the Queen. No words could erase the guilt welling up within him. <sighs> Everything feels distorted, like my life has been twisted inside out. What happened? How did it get to this? Nothing here was ever as simple as you wanted to believe, Horace. You brought down the Sun Temple, but you couldn't change the reality that this city and the entire Empire is corrupt to its core. So what can I do to make things right? Maybe you can't. So we can't get back to what we had? I don't know. I care for you, Horace. But I'm not sure what I want or, or where to go from here. We're on different paths. Is there someone else? I wouldn't blame you if there was. There's... Is it all right if we don't talk about it tonight? He could make it tough on her, force her to spell it out. <laughs> sure. I went to the chapter house. Horace! Why would you go there? It wasn't the best idea, I know. But I had to strike back at them. The Order killed Mulsabar. I wanted them dead, all of them. What did you do? He told her about his destruction of the fortress and ended up telling her more than he intended. How he admired Mulsabar and how his new duties as First Sword were overwhelming him. He even told her about sending Lord Ubar to deal with the rebels. That last bit seemed to surprise her. Did the Queen consent to that? Horace shrugged and tried to hide a yawn. Not exactly. But she told me to handle the matter. I took that to mean do whatever was necessary to stop the fighting. Horace, Byleth will never make a deal with the rebels. You have to understand that. How do you know? Has anyone ever tried? As far as I can see, the Empire only has two ways to deal with anything. To kill it, or lock it in a collar. I think it's time someone tried a different approach. Don't you think the Network would have tried that if it had any chance of succeeding? You have to understand how someone like the Queen thinks. She isn't seeking a peaceful resolution. She wants a great victory. No, she needs it, because that elevates her in the eyes of the other kings. And she's chosen you to lead this enterprise. You think I would go along with such a plan? I shouldn't have to remind you that I actually wore an iron collar. And not one of those pretty golden chokers you got to prance around in while people were dying outside your gilded cage. Her eyes stabbed at him. I can't believe you. You, of all people, should understand what I went through all those years. What I suffered for my beliefs. That is, until you came along and ruined everything, just like you're doing now. You have no idea the trouble you're stirring up. Horace knew he was being unfair, but he was too angry to take it back. Especially after all the attacks she leveled at him. No one expected him to succeed, but he thought Alira would side with him. But what if she was right? What if everything he'd been trying to accomplish was impossible? And you've been shutting me out ever since that night at the Sun Temple. Of course I did! How could I trust you now that you've gotten so close to her? Her? Huh? Did it ever occur to you that the Queen deserves the chance to repair her realm? Or that I could help make that happen? Because you're suddenly so important, is that it? That was it. He could see the truth in her eyes. I've lost her. Maybe for good this time. <sighs> I'm going to bed. Her face was ashen as she got up and went to the door. She paused at the threshold. Horace, I... Oh.
Alira left the cattle quarter, heading northwest. Oh, focus on the task at hand. Horus must fend for himself. The new safe house stood on a smaller lane branching off the main thoroughfare of a modest, though well-maintained, neighborhood, nestled in the shadow of a five-story tenement. She would have walked right past the innocuous little house if not for Cypher's directions. The entrance door hung on the side at the top of a short stoop. She went to the door. The door swung inward. No old woman this time, just a dark hallway beyond. I've had enough of the creepy theatrics, Cypher. She noticed a faint shine of light along the bottom of the door at the end of the hall. Stealing herself, she crept forward. Doorways on either side led to dark rooms. She got to the end of the hall and pushed the door open. Cypher stood in a large kitchen, wearing an apron, humming as he sliced onions on a cutting board. He looked up at her. Oh, ho, you're early. Yes. Alira let the door swing closed. I suppose I am. You cook? Oh, I'm just making supper. I was hoping to be done before you arrived. Uh, give me a hand, will you? He pointed to a second knife and a slab of lamb on the counter. Alira hesitated. Part of her wanted to turn around and walk out. After the argument with Horace, she wasn't in the mood for games. Yet she needed information only the network could provide. <sighs> she picked up the knife and started cutting the meat into cubes without asking how Cypher wanted it done. So? Cypher added the onions to a pot simmering over a low fire. Did your mission go smoothly? Smooth enough. Katara held up her end of the arrangement, though I don't think she's interested in assisting you anymore. Uh, that's too bad. She's a good asset, but we can work around that. Here, here, let me have that. Cypher placed the lamb cubes in an iron skillet and began sprinkling them with salt and other spices as they seared. Alira took out the letters from Lord General Kafanum's house and put them on the counter. Here's the proof you wanted. At least 13 houses have pledged their support of a coup in Aragash. Half of them have local ties, so you shouldn't have any trouble applying pressure on whichever side you want. Cypher picked up the skillet and poured the meat, juices and all, into the simmering pot. Oh, this city is ripe to fall, Alira. I think you know that, but what would be the repercussions? The nearby cities, Nisus, Chirish, Hirak, would rush in to claim some share of the spoils. Exactly! The same cities marching to Aragash at this very moment. At the same time, the cult of Amor works to undermine the queen from within. It's all connected. The war, the cult, and rebellion? The network did all this? We had a hand in it, but we've been aided by some unexpected events that turned in our favor. Such as the arrival of your housemate and the curious effect he's had on several key players. Horace's elevation to the court. The ultimatum leveled on the queen, which led to the fall of the Sun Temple. Holy stars, they've been manipulating everything. You're starting a civil war. It will start here, but other cities will be pulled into the conflict as everyone takes sides. Akeshia will be ripped apart. Possibly, although it's difficult to make projections that far into the future. Still, enough turmoil to distract the Empire for a generation. That is our mandate, after all. No, I haven't forgotten. But the cost in human lives will be astronomical. Is this what it takes to save a country? And the attack on the chapter house? Another fortunate accident. So what comes next? Do you stand back and let the city tear itself apart? Uh, not exactly. There's still one more step before our recipe is complete. What step? It is time for Queen Byleth to die. Alira didn't speak. She didn't move. The words echoed in her mind, but she couldn't quite grasp them. They were too ridiculous, too far beyond reason even for the network. You can't mean... I received a communication this morning. The network believes the time is ripe for the Queen to go. Now that Prince Zazil is gone and the Sun Cult banished from Erogash, her absence would plunge this territory into chaos as the Zawaniai houses fight over the spoils. But we need someone willing and able to commit the act. One last mission to preserve our homeland security for years to come. Even if I thought it was right, you must have someone better suited for the task. Oh, this is the moment, Alira. If you wish to rejoin us and share in the downfall of the Empire, this is what you must do. As we speak, the Queen is planning a major operation. If we're too late, 
the rebellion might be crushed and our chance to put our thumb on the scales of history will be lost. Will you do it? She tried to answer no, that she couldn't take his offer and never to bother her again, but the words halted on her tongue. The network was right. If the queen died, the city would come apart as all the vying factions fought to take over the throne. If they were left alone, a winner would eventually emerge from among the noble families. But the other cities would never sit back and let that happen. Nisus and Chiresh would both move to take over Aragash, shattering their temporary alliance. And the war would spread from there as every city in Akeshia tried to gain some piece of the cake while preventing their rivals from benefiting. In the past, the priesthoods kept such internecine wars from getting out of hand. But since the gods' war, only one cult held enough power to stop it. Alira didn't think they would. No, the cult of Amur might even fan the flames, hoping to profit from the devastation. Oh God in heaven, is this what you want me to do? I'll do it. Cypher nodded without smiling, as if he expected no less. But I want protection. We will take care of everything. After the deed, we can get you safely out of the city. Not for me, for Horus. If I do this, the network agrees to protect him. Alira! This isn't up for negotiation. Once the queen is gone, he'll be targeted by every member of the court. You'll promise me, here and now, that the network will keep him safe, or you can find another agent. He stared at her for several seconds, but she didn't flinch. Ah, <sighs> agreed. I will do everything in my power to ensure his safety. Once the queen is dead, we will send you the final instructions when everything is in place. He reached under the counter and retrieved a leather case. And uh, this is for you. It's everything we have on the chapter house killings. I caution you not to expect much. We don't know who is behind it. Also in there is the name of a city planner who favors a cause as you requested. Alira tucked it under her cloak then turned and walked back down the corridor. She felt like she'd fallen into the river, and the current was dragging her down, the air dwindling in her lungs. If she did this one thing, would the waters recede and let her go, or would she die at the bottom? At least she might be able to save Horace. If I manage to break into the most secure place in the city undetected, kill one of the most powerful sorceresses in history, then escape in one piece with an entire army on my heels. Why should I worry? Wrapped in a white sheet from crown to heels, Mulsabar's body lay on a slab of blue granite located on the eastern terrace of the Moon Temple. Byleth looked every bit a queen in a floor-length gown of purple silk with gold embroidery. Her double tiara encrusted with blue sapphires shone like a second sun in the gathering rays of morning. She also looked distracted. Perhaps this is how she deals with grief. She knew Lord Mulsabar all her life. Horus was not present when news of the body's appearance reached the queen. He heard rumors that a lot of furniture needed replacing after her reaction. Perhaps that explained the lack of recriminations from the palace about his destruction of the chapter house. The citizens of Aragash responded. Public demonstrations broke out all across the city, larger than before. A few reports mentioned new graffiti in the river quarter depicting him in sexual congress with various animals. Hairy goats seemed to be the main theme. Horace glanced at the altarpiece. Farewell, Musabar. May you find happiness in whatever paradise you've earned. I vow to avenge your spirit. Beyond the vow, Horace wanted to crush the sect of Amor to oblivion. A soft touch alighted on his elbow. I never thought this day would come. Byleth stood beside him, her eyes red, her coal makeup blurry from hastily wiped tears. Seeing her sorrow displayed so prominently struck a solemn chord. It wasn't often anyone would see a queen so genuinely vulnerable. He placed his hand over her fingers and squeezed. I was thinking the same thing. Musabar was so steady, so permanent. I didn't know him long, but I honestly believed he would always be around. We used to jest, my father and I, that Lord Mulsibar would outlive us all. When my father died, I would have been lost if not for him. He became my second father, a protector. Now that duty falls to you, I'm afraid. I will do everything I can, Excellence. In fact, 
I think I'd better get back to the palace. Things have been hectic lately, as I'm sure you know. She leaned close. Put down the rebellion, Horace. The faster the better. All things will come together in harmony once that threat is ended. He nodded. She turned and went back inside the temple with the priestesses. While the cream of Erogash's society departed, Horace waited on the terrace, wanting to be alone with his thoughts. Mulsibar was gone in body and spirit. Horace left after most of the crowd, still harboring a desire to collect his thoughts. Instead, he found himself seated across from Lord Astapta in the noble's carriage. The vizier sat dressed in his customary black robe, the hood settled around his shoulders. Pardon me. I wish only a little of your time. Horace sat back and tried to appear at ease, even as his insides were jumping. Of course. I thought I might see you at the funeral. Lord Astapta was notorious for his solitude, rarely appearing at public events. I was otherwise engaged. He closed the window curtains and knocked on the roof. Since the night Astapta and Alira rescued him from the Sun Temple's abattoir, Horace thought a lot about the reclusive vizier, about why Astapta helped him in the first place. Mulsibar warned not to trust this man with no concrete reason. For his part, Horace found the vizier well-mannered and civil, if remote. Horace felt, on account of his rescue, he should at least give the man the benefit of the doubt and judge for himself. Where are we going? Not far. Tell me, Lord Horace, how are you finding your new office? <laughs> well, to be honest, I have been feeling a little overwhelmed. That is to be expected. Even for those born to power in this country, the royal courts can be treacherous places. Hmm. Lord Mulsavar said as much before he died. Lord Astapta glanced at the window as if he were looking through the dark curtains. The late Lord of House Adalu and I were not great friends, as I'm sure you know. However, I respected his temperament. He tried to warn me about what I was getting myself into, but it seems no amount of warning could express the sheer madness of it all. Madness? No. It can seem chaotic at times, but you must remember there is always a system in play underneath the surface. How did you... Pardon me, but you're a foreigner to the Empire too, right? How did you adjust so well to the court? The ways of these Akeshians are not so different from my homeland. I come from a country beyond the sands of Esuran, where murder and coercion are tools used by both the high and the low. Sounds unpleasant. I'm not surprised you left. My leaving was not of my own choosing. I was exiled because I dared to challenge the old ways of my people. I saw a path that would lift us to new heights of knowledge and prosperity. However, my message was not well received. My countrymen banished me into the desert with nothing more than the clothes I was wearing and a gourd of water. I was meant to die. And you came here? After a long exodus, yes. Byleth took me into her household, and so I came to be in her service. Although this foreign-born nobleman made him uneasy, Horace thought Astapta might be the only one in this city who understood his predicament. I need your advice, and your assistance. Ask. How can I convince the Queen to make concessions to the rebel slaves? The Vizier leaned back deeper into the shadows of his seat until his features were all but hidden from sight. You cannot. The only thing Akashians respect is strength. Attempting to persuade or barter will only make them more obstinate. But I've shown them strength. The personal challenges have stopped coming. So why won't they listen to me? Your experiences prove my point. When you showed your power in the arena, the challenges ceased. When you defeated the priests of Amor, the cult fled the city. You must continue to project strength and authority at all times, in all things. Do not be burdened by feelings of compassion, as they will make you appear weak. Horace didn't like the advice, but he had to admit it sounded accurate. The men and women of the royal court were an arrogant bunch, constantly seeking to exploit each other for personal gain. If he wanted to impress the queen, perhaps he needed to play by the same rules. One more piece of counsel, Lord Horace, if you will allow me to offer it. Oh, of course. Act swiftly. The city of Nisus, with the backing of the Sun Cult, is sending an army to attack Aragash. 
it would be regrettable if the priests regained their stranglehold over the city, as I'm sure you're aware. Horace squeezed the edge of his seat harder. He had enough problems already, and the last thing he needed was for the cult to take back the city. Oh, in that case, I have a confession. He struggled with opening up about this, but he knew it had to be done. I've lost control of the Zoana. Lord Estopta leaned forward slightly. Mm. Explain. Ever since that night at the Sun Temple, the power doesn't seem to obey me. I didn't have the best control before that either, but at least it came when I called for it. Now, it's random. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't, or too much comes, and then I end up going too far. I've tried meditating and working with a mentor. Lord Ubar was kind enough to tutor me, and of course I worked with Lord Mulsabar before his disappearance. But now, I feel lost. It's just a, a mess. The vizier rested his chin on his clasped hands. Is there discomfort? when you use the power. Yes. It feels like something is trying to break out of my chest. Perhaps I have access to resources that could help your situation. If you are willing to place your trust in me. Aye, aye, please. Any help you could give me would be greatly appreciated. The carriage came to a stop with a slight lurch. Very well. I will send my carriage for you tomorrow at dawn. And we shall begin. Ah, oh, Kanadu Bellum. For everything. I didn't get the chance to thank you properly after the Timoris, but I want you to know I'll never forget what you did for me. Perhaps someday I may grant you the chance to repay that debt, First Sword. Of course. I look forward to the opportunity. The final images of the scene decayed into sepia emptiness as Byleth withdrew her power. Horace leaving Astopta's carriage standing on the street outside the Moon Temple as the vehicle drove off. Then, her first sword walked away, his head down as if deep in thought. Byleth released Kelsia's head as the memories evaporated between them. She didn't like seeing her vizier conferencing with her first sword, especially without her knowledge and consent. Lord Estopta was difficult to control. She did not want him influencing Horus. Even worse, she didn't want to imagine what kinds of plots the two might hatch together. If there was a more volatile and dangerous pair of men in the Empire outside of the Imperial Court, she didn't want to know. Standing up from the chair where she'd been sitting during the mind scrying, she sent the girl back out into the street to follow Horace. That was as much as she could do at the moment. Byleth glanced at Lady Anshara, who stood in the doorway of the antechamber they had borrowed. Go home, my dear. Mourn for your uncle. With all respect, Majesty, my place is here. This is where I wish to be, doing my duty. My uncle would expect no less. As you wish. Byleth took a deep breath and walked down the wide corridor bisecting the Moon Temple's second highest tier. They'd left Jean Tu and the rest of her bodyguard below in the main chamber, out of deference. No males were allowed above the ground floor of the temple. But Lady Anshara was more than enough protection, especially here in the heart of the crown's most ardent supporters. Byleth often felt more at ease amid these pale blue hallways than she did in her own palace. There was something calming about this place. Or perhaps it was the serene looks on the faces of the priestesses here, old and young. She felt she was among sisters. The door at the end of the hallway was watched by two ancient priestesses. They sat on stools outside the door, combing flax from large baskets into long strands. Byleth entered the high priestess's cell, a plain affair, barely as large as Byleth's bathing chamber. Rough plaster covered the walls and ceiling without decoration, save for a coating of light blue paint, chipped and cracked in several places. A narrow cot sat against the far wall, flanked by a chamber pot and a small washstand. In a niche over the bed stood a simple idol of Sipa in alabaster. Heat radiated from a small fireplace and two coal-filled braziers. Three young novices stood around the high priestess, looking as if they were about to cry. They held a sheet of black cloth in front of the bed as Byleth entered. It was an old ceremonial tradition to separate the dying from the living with a symbolic veil of death. Uh, 
Leave us. The novices hesitated a moment until the high priestess waved them away with a frail hand. Go, 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 my darlings. The young girls moved past Byleth and fled into the hallway. The queen closed the door behind them. They mean well, the poor children. Help me up. High Priestess Iltani looked painfully old. The linen undershift hung loose on her bony frame, and the age spots down her cheeks and across the backs of her hands appeared darker in the pale lamplight. Her silver hair tumbled loose about her shoulders. Byleth hurried to help her sit up, grabbing a cushion from the foot of the bed and placing it behind the old woman for support. As she did so, she probed the priestess with a trickle of Zoana. She'd never had much talent for healing. She could do little more than determine whether the old woman's heart was failing, its rhythm fluttering every few beats, causing blood to pool in the large arteries. But the high priestess had already been seen by the best healers in the city. She was simply dying. Nothing could stop that. The priestess leaned back. Thank you, your majesty. Please, no titles. Not today. As you wish. But if you're going to stay, you'll have to make yourself useful. Fetch me that cup. My throat's as dry as the desert. I can't seem to make enough moisture anymore. Byleth got the cup and refilled it from a pitcher on the washstand, noticing as she poured it that it was wine instead of water. She brought it over with two hands. I hope this isn't from the goddess's sacred vintage. <laughs> that swill. No, this is the good stuff. Lord Mulsibar's steward sent it over yesterday. I've been sampling it vigorously. <laughs> the queen couldn't help but smile at the old woman's words. I think you're justified. Of course I am. I'm dying. Oh, don't bother shaking your head. I know it. I've known it for months. I have my good days and bad days. And lately the bad days have been taking over. It's the way of things, that's all. Byleth sat on the side of the bed and placed her hand on the priestess's arm. The bones felt like kindling under the thin sleeve of the shift. She tried to subdue the feelings bubbling inside her, but they climbed up her throat anyway. You'll be missed, you know. Especially by me. There aren't a lot of people I can talk to. Oh, stop feeling sorry for yourself, Byleth. Life is hard. For queens, as well as washerwomen and net haulers. <laughs> your father had it harder, let me tell you. He didn't have half your ability with the Zoana, and he was forever putting out fires inside his own court because of it. He had to forge strong alliances to win the proper respect, and even then, most of the nobility were licking their chops to see him fall. No, child, I won't permit any peevishness in here. Lift up your chin. There you go. That's the girl I remember. <laughs> That's what I mean. No one else tells me the truth. I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to say no one will ever replace you. Sadly, that is not true. There will be a new high priestess of this temple soon, and you would be wise to bind her to you as soon as possible. You're intent on rolling the dice, child. Yes, I can see it in your eyes. You've been planning something, and what happened on the Tamuris was only the tip of the spear. I almost feel bad for your enemies. Well, not really. The bastards deserve every bit of what they've got coming. Iltani, cursing in the temple. They'll bury you out behind the refuse pits. The high priestess took another sip. <laughs> Ah, it's a distinct possibility, but the goddess is forgiving. She knows we're all flawed vessels. This flawed vessel could use some good advice. I'm sorry, but that's in short supply these days. The high priestess reached up to pat Byleth's cheek. Trust in yourself, child. 
and trust in the gods who created us and breathed the spirit of life into our bodies. These are the secrets of success. Now go. I'm feeling tired. Of course. Is there anything you need? No. I'm content. But thank you for coming to see me. It was my last wish. And the lady made it come true. Byleth blinked through her tears, nodding as she got up and went to the door. She thought she heard a whisper behind her, the words so soft she couldn't be sure, but they had sounded like a blessing or a lullaby. The queen opened the door without looking back. Horace strode the upper levels of his house. His brain felt scrambled. Though tired, he couldn't sleep. He wanted peace and quiet, but was afraid to be alone. His meandering took him to his solarium in the manor's east wing. The room was large, but it felt close because of the floor-to-ceiling bookcases built into the side walls. A large, stained-glass window dominated the east wall. The orange, red, blue, and green slices of glass cast a mosaic of lights across the hardwood floor. The air was warm and smelled of paper. Most of the books on the shelves came with the house. They covered a wide range of subjects, from farming techniques to astrology. Horace had read a few of them already, using them to bolster his grasp of the Akeshian language. A long desk of yellow wood sat beneath the window. Low to the floor in the Akeshian style, a padded stool took the place of a chair. Since he didn't spend much time in here, preferring to work in his office at the palace, he hadn't taken the time to change the furniture. As he walked over to the desk, he saw the wooden chest he brought back from Mulsabar's estate tucked behind a map stand. <laughs> Horace pulled the chest over to the desk. He opened the latches and started to lift the lid, but paused, remembering the day Mulsabar educated him on the many devious ways containers could be trapped with malicious sorcery. He was about to tap into his zawana to examine the trunk more closely, but the lethargy haunting him since waking convinced him to chance the opening. Inside, he found a variety of items. Two leather-bound books stacked beneath a bundle of papyrus scrolls. Horace scanned the scrolls as he placed them on the desk. They read like journal entries at first glance, but as he read further, Horace got the gist they were research notes. The topics included religion, astronomy, mathematics, and architectural drafting. He even found a treatise on the construction of a new kind of sailing vessel, larger than anything he'd seen. Impressed, he dug back into the trunk. The books were studies on magical theory, both written by Mulsibar. Horace picked them up eagerly and fanned open the gilded pages. The script was strange, a Keshian, but in a style he'd never seen. He found diagrams as well, showing geometric shapes with lines and labels in the same script. These volumes went far beyond his meager understanding of the magical arts. He put them on the desk as well, determined to study them later. On the bottom lay several objects wrapped in oilskin cloth. Horace took them out one at a time. The first was a sailor's sextant in brass. <laughs> the next parcel turned out to be a set of pens in a lacquered box, complete with two inkwells and a pearl-handled sharpening knife. He put that aside also, thinking it would look good in his office at the palace. <laughs> when he reached down for the last parcel, a shock ran up his hand and arm to his brain. Like a fog scattered before a stiff sea breeze, the lassitude infecting him disappeared as if he had plunged his head into a bucket of cold water. He reached for the cube-shaped package again. It was heavier than he expected. He unwrapped the cloth to find a silver box with four tiny clawed feet. Each of the sides and top were cast with abstract, crisscrossing designs, resembling the winding tracks of earthworms crawling through the dirt. He cleared a space on the desk. Then he tried to tap into the Kishargal dominion, to probe the box with thin tendrils of energy. Pain erupted along the backs of his hands and up his arms like steel nails driven into his flesh. He pulled back. His power had left him in a rush, snuffed out like a lamp wick. Zohadin. Why would Mulsabar keep a box made from a metal antithetical to sorcerers? What could be inside that needed such protection? He took the knife out of the pen set. He used it to push up on the lid. It refused to budge. 
He pried at it for several seconds. <sighs> to hell with this. Just take the bull by the horns. <clears throat> he grabbed the box's lid with both hands and lifted. As if a hidden catch had released, the lid flew open. A small sphere sat inside on a bed of black cloth. Horace leaned forward for a better look. The sphere was completely smooth and translucent. The outer shell was red gold, while black swirls lurked within its depths. The material was a mystery to him. Was it glass? Some exotic alloy? Horace touched the sphere with his forefinger. The surface felt slippery, cool to the touch. He looked at an engraved silver plate affixed to the inside of the lid. And thus did Harutuk arm himself with the flame of Endu and go forth to battle the Great Mother of Night. Horace looked back in the trunk, but found no more parcels. Nothing else to explain what this might be. He was no closer to knowing why Mulsabar died than before. Then he remembered the nobleman had visited the royal archives the night he vanished. Horace plucked the orb out of the box and shoved it into his pocket for later study. Why did Mulsabar bequeath this to me? Maybe the archives will have the answer. The Royal Archives looked different in the daytime. A stolid building, as ancient as the city's oldest temples and palaces. In many respects, the stewards of its contents reflected the nature of the building. Good morning, Archivist. Perhaps you remember- The first sword, Horace del Rosa of Arnos. Can you explain why I was interrupted from a very delicate restoration of a Fourth Dynasty Cyclopedia? My apologies, sir. The last time I was here, I was searching for Lord Mulsabar. The old archivist's head bobbed up and down between his narrow shoulders. I heard of his death. Very tragic, but I fail to see how this concerns the archives. You told me the tomes Lord Mulsabar was studying that night, but I've forgotten which the titles. The Hag Codex of Theolon Cigaratum, the Magano Book of the Dead, translated by Garoma Parimi, and Ipsu Amur's The 99th Day. Ah, yes, those were the ones. I was hoping I could see those volumes. This way. Horace hesitated for a moment. Then he motioned for his guards to stay behind as he followed the old man. They passed through a grand hall floored in white marble. Light poured in through rows of square windows high along the walls. Motes of dust danced in the sunlight, but everything remained remarkably pristine. The archivist shoved open a door at the back of the hall, and Horace followed him into a smaller chamber, dim without any windows. The old man fretted with a lamp on a stand near the door until it sparked to life. Wait here. He left. The room had plain walls of cedar wooden paneling, unlike the stone walls he'd seen elsewhere in the archives. Their pleasant, faintly musty scent filled the air. The only furnishings were a low table, large enough to seat a dozen people, and a single footstool. Not sure what to do, Horace stood as time passed. After a half a bell or so, the door opened and three novices entered. Each youth held a large book. They placed them all on the table with special care. Then, after a bow to him, they filed out. Horace sat down. The first tome to his left was as tall as his arm from wrist to shoulder. Bound in leather so dark it looked almost black, faint characters in gold leaf read, Nine and Ninety Days. The other two books were even larger. Their antiquity was evident in the aged pages. Horace began with the first book. Reading by the single lamp soon made his eyes ache as he leafed through the pages. The book detailed, according to its author, the nearly 100 days the gods of the Akeshian pantheon dwelt on Earth during the Annunciation. It was precisely what he expected it to be, a collection of ludicrous myths dressed up as historical fact. He went on to the next tome, the Gahahag Codex. The tall leaves of this bronze-bound tome were made from some kind of leather hide, tough yet supple. Because of its age, translating the text was difficult for him, but it seemed to be a testimonial. The author's claims were fantastic, even ludicrous, and Horace found himself skipping passages, though he paused at a section devoted to demonology, describing a host of evil spirits believed to haunt the dark hours of the night. There was even an entry on Idimu, the kind of flesh-eating demons that attacked the palace on a night Horace would rather forget. He was about to move on when he spotted a handwritten notation in the margin of the page, written in Arnasi. We cannot afford to ignore this. 
the thread is growing. Did Mulsabar write that? Beside the notation lay a passage about the demons of the underworld. Seven are the lords of Absu, the beings from the outside who ever desire to enter our world. Their names are forbidden, for to call upon them invites death for mankind. Do not seek to descend the seven steps to the gates of death. The netherworld is formless, containing all the elements of chaos, unbounded and against which no charm can protect. Below the passage, a disturbing illustration depicted a huge underground sea. At the bottom of its depths dwelt a serpentine creature, possibly a dragon, that appeared to sleep. Studying the picture, Horace tried to understand what Mulsabar was trying to tell him. Damn it, old man. Why couldn't you just tell me like a normal person? He read the entire page twice, and part of the next section, which chronicled how demons once ruled the world in a time of darkness, until the new gods of Akeshia banished them to some place called the Outside, apparently also an ocean deep underground. He closed the book and pushed it away. The whole matter made him uneasy. He'd never been a believer of supernatural things. He tended to think about such forces in metaphorical terms. However, he witnessed things since coming to this land that shook his philosophy. Hell, I've done things that would get me exiled from the church if anyone back in Arnos found out, if not tied to a stake and burned as an agent of darkness. So what am I to make of all this talk of demons and gods? Obviously, the Akeshian people believe these stories, but what's so important about them now? Lord Mulsabar warned he suspected people in the court were working against the queen, though he never offered names. Was there a connection between the two warnings? It seemed dubious. Horace held back a yawn as he stretched. He thought about going through the third book, but it looked awfully long and he was getting tired. He went to the door and found a young novice standing outside. Pardon, I'm going to need to take these books with me. Can you fetch my guards? The novice's eyes almost popped out of his head. Without answering, he ran off. It took some wrangling, but eventually Horace was able to pull rank and get permission to take the books. With his guards, burdened with the bound books in tow, Horace set off toward the palace. The sky laughed at him. Horace dropped his head back to the earth and felt the gritty crunch of the soil beneath him. He lay alone on a vast field of dark earth, the gray firmament stretched above him. A zephyr toyed with his hair, but he tried to ignore it as he listened to the sky's murmurings. Those rumblings carry a message. We see you lying in the cold earth, Storm Lord. Why do you not rise up to meet our call? I can't fly. My wings are gone. No, no. You have only forgotten them, as your kind always forgets. In time, you will forget us, the one who gave you life. We breathed our spirits in you, but you no longer remember. Horace wanted to reach up, but his arms were held fast to the earth. Wait, I don't want to go down into the ground. It is too late. The darkness comes, and from that we can no longer shelter you. The poke of the earth is closing, and a new age dawns. <clears throat> Horace struggled against his bonds, but couldn't break free. The voice was gone on the wind. The opening of a door woke him. Horace blinked up at the ceiling of his bedchamber. He could still feel his ears straining to hear every note of the thunder in his dream, now fading as he came to full wakefulness. Dharma entered with a covered tray and placed it across his lap. Under the cover lay a small plate of sliced oranges, a brown roll, honey, and a clay cup. Thank you. Dharma opened the curtains. The warmth of the sun's rays across his blanket made Horace want to go back to sleep, but the echoes of the dream prickled at the back of his mind. What time is it? Just past the first hour, Master. A carriage arrived for you. Carriage? Oh! Dharma, tell Garita to meet me at the palace. I'll be there in an hour, or maybe two. The carriage took him on a bumpy ride east to the Silver Gate leading out of the city. Horace had never been this way. He watched through the window as they passed under the great battlement gatehouse, through the long stone tunnel, and finally out the other side. The road angled northeast from the gate through sections of empty fields. 
His mind was distracted, making him antsy and sapping his energy to do anything. Maybe it's that bizarre dream. I've been having a lot of them lately. It's probably the stress. I could use some time away from all this responsibility, but this time without anyone trying to kill me. Less than a bell later, they turned onto a dirt road. The fields petered out to be replaced by copses of sturdy cypress trees, surrounded by long stretches of open plain. In the distance, high up on a lone hill, Horace saw an old structure consisting of tall pillars with capstones. The ride became more uncomfortable for several minutes as the wheels seemed to find every hole and rut in the road. Then the vehicle jerked to a halt. Horace let himself out before the driver could climb down from his seat. They had arrived at an outdoor amphitheater. Rows of stone seats carved into the side of a low hill encircled one half of a wide stage. The open end of the theater looked out over a bucolic expanse of meadows and trees. The walls of Aragash gleamed on the horizon. Two men stood on the stage platform. Horace recognized Lord Astapta, his black robes an ominous contrast to the gorgeous countryside around them. The vizier stood beside a younger man, possibly 30 years of age, in a gray robe with a leather belt. A stranger to Horace, the younger man had a solid build and a full head of hair cut short above his collar. As Horace walked up to them, Lord Astapta nodded to the other man. Lord Horace, this is an associate of mine. You can call him Uriam. I brought him here to work with you today. Uh, I thought you and I would be working together. I shall oversee the exercises. Now, step up on the platform, if you will. Opposite your opponent. Horace wasn't sure he liked the designation, your opponent, but he said nothing. As he took his place, he noticed several large symbols drawn on the stage in red paint. He didn't recognize any of them. They certainly weren't Akeshian characters. What are these for? Please focus. Lord Estopto walked off the stage. I have considered your difficulty. It's my opinion you are unsure of yourself, and thus the power refuses to respond. Before Horace could respond, the vizier held up a hand, and Uriam attacked. A narrow jet of water shot across the distance between them. It came so fast, Horace almost couldn't react. He grabbed for his Zoana out of pure instinct and wove it into a crude shield of compacted air. The water struck it with a hissing roar. Horace dug his heels into the stage to keep from being pushed backward by the force. Stop! Uriam immediately ceased his assault, which left Horace stumbling for a second. <laughs> he dropped the air shield. You must use all the tools at your disposal, Lord Horace. I'm not sure what you mean. The void! It is your primary weapon and your greatest defense. But Lord Musabar said that the mastery of the Shinar allowed me to use all of the Dominions. Exactly. But the true strength of the Shinar comes from incorporating it into every other element. Only by blending them together will you achieve this so-called mastery. Horace remembered how effectively the flow of void energy merged with his sorcery to bring down the chapter house, and also how frightening it had been. He didn't relish feeling that loss of control again, not to mention the intense pain that ate at him every time he tried to use the power. <sighs> Breathe. Musabar always said to focus on breathing. You can do this. Lord Estopta gestured again. This time, Uriam hurled two jets of focused water across the stage. Horus focused on his flows. He drew out the Imovar as before, and this time pulled a thread of Shinar along with it. Knitting them together into a new shield of air and void, he was surprised by how easily the power came. He grew so enraptured by the simple joy of using the magic that he almost jumped when Lord Estopta shouted again. Stop! The water vanished. Horus allowed his shield to linger for a moment before dropping it so he could appreciate the fineness of the weave. He was rather proud of himself, though a dull ache throbbed behind his breastbone. What now? Lord Estopta smacked his palm with a closed fist. You must turn back the attack. Defending merely encourages your opponent to continue his attack. After all, what price does he pay? Uriam stood still as blood dripped from a long cut on his left hand. Horace watched it splash on the platform, drop by drop. All right. Again! They ran the exercise over and over. 
Each time Horus met the attack and turned it aside, and each time Lord Astapta exhorted him to press harder, to strike back faster, to go for the kill. With every bout, the pain in his chest grew. After an hour, he could hardly stand upright. Uriam was only in slightly better shape. Though the Zoanii managed to evade all of Horus's counterattacks, his gray robe was soaked with his own blood. It poured from his face, chest, and both arms. A strange sort of pride filled Horus. Yes, he was suffering, but he had pushed past the pain again and again, proving it was not his master. He also noticed the odd sensation he felt at the chapter house, the feeling of being watched, and he had felt stronger now. It almost felt like a presence lurking in his mind, listening to his thoughts. He tried to shove it out, but it felt like pushing wet sand. It just oozed around his mental grasp. The symbols on the stage seemed to shimmer for a moment. Enough! <laughs> Horace's chest burned with pain. Uh, is it really supposed to hurt like this? Lord Estopta approached the stage. That pain is the cost of power. Horace found himself somewhat unnerved that the vizier could read him so easily. Uh, I didn't feel like this before. As he stepped up on the stage, Lord Estopta indicated Uriam, who was wrapping his hands and forearms in thick bandages. Most Zoanii suffer the Immaculata. Practitioners of the Shinar, however, pay a different price. An internal price. Why? That is the way it is. The sooner you accept that and embrace it, the sooner you will find the control you seek. Until then, you will be a danger to those around you. Yes. Lately, whenever I use the power, I get this sense. It's hard to describe, but it's like I'm being watched. But from inside my mind... Does that make any sense? That is you, watching yourself. It is called the inner eye. Do not fear this presence. Instead, like the pain, you must draw it closer and make it one with you. I suspect this is what happened on the night of the Tumorus, though you did not realize it at the time. Now, you feel the power more keenly. They started walking back to the carriage. Horace was exhausted and glad to be done. Lord Estopta walked with his hands folded behind his back and his head bowed. This is a difficult period of transition, Horace. But you will do better if you refrain from fighting it. That's not easy. The pain becomes so intense. Focus on that pain. Breathe it into your body and merge it with your essence. The more you resist, the harder your path. They came to the carriage and the driver opened the door. Kanadu, Bellum. This gives me a lot to think about. We will try again tomorrow. Tomorrow? God in heaven, I don't think I can go through this again. You honor me with your attention. The vizier bowed his head. Hmm. The honor is mine, first sword. Horus climbed into the car and sagged gratefully into the seat. <sighs> he hurt all over, but the pain in his chest was slowly fading, leaving behind an ache that seemed to punch straight through to his spine. He considered going home for a nap or a soak in the tub, but called up for the driver to take him to the palace instead. As the carriage rattled over the bumpy dirt road, Horace closed his eyes. He thought back over the training, reliving it in his memory. Some of the things Lord Estopta said conflicted with Mulsibar's teachings, but he couldn't argue with the results. Shifting onto his side, he felt a bulge in his robe pocket and pulled out the orb from Mulsibar's trunk. The slick coolness of its surface soothed him. Crimson light swirled with the black inside the small sphere, like an early morning sky over the ocean as night's cloak slips beneath the horizon. He gazed into its depth as he considered what to do about his troublesome powers. The sun beat down, flogging everything that walked or crawled across the Earth's surface. It wasn't even mid-morning yet, and already the temperature hung as an insufferable weight. The river looked inviting, green and cool, but danger lurked in the hidden currents beneath its rushing surface. Currents that could grab hold of a man or a full-grown ox and drag it to a watery end. Abdiel wiped his forehead with a damp cloth. All of nature, he observed, was a killer of one kind or another. He stood behind his master on the high promontory, gazing down as the combined army of the three kings crossed the Typhon. This was only the first crossing they would need to make. A second crossing across the northern branch of the river would happen later as they closed on their target. 
Lord Pumash remained behind in Nisus to see to his business concerns. However, true to his word, the noble merchant coaxed the rulers of three cities to begin their march toward Aragash. Progress was slow, but expectedly so, with a force of nearly 15,000 soldiers, not including the train of attendants and camp followers. He himself had been born in an army camp. His childhood had been one long struggle to find enough to eat, of wearing rags his mother sewed herself from whatever scraps she could find. He'd not worn his first pair of sandals until he was 10 years of age, and those were taken from a dead man's feet. As small skiffs ferried units across the turbulent waters, Mibishnu raised a hand to shade his eyes. Abdiel squinted against the sun's glare. His eyes were not as good as they once had been, but he spied something happening on the northern shore. Parties of scouts had been sent ahead to secure the far side, but the initial reports returned an all clear. Now at least one of those parties stood on the other shore, waving to gain the attention of the skiffs. Time seemed to crawl as the boats made their way across the river and unloaded their human cargo. Once the scouts boarded, the vessels started back on their return trip. Mabishnu started down the rocky path to the river embankment. Abdiel followed after him. The river was so swollen the desert ran up to its silty shores. As they approached the bank, a group of officers spotted Mabishnu's arrival and turned to bow. Lord General Zalthus, commander of King Moloch's army, gestured toward the river. We are waiting to hear the latest report from the far shore, your eminence. Mabishnu waited silently, and Abdiel began wishing for some shade. He was tempted to ask his master if he wanted something to drink, but he did not want to embarrass him in front of the officers, all of whom sweated as they stood together, watching the boats. Once the skiffs finally made shore again, the scouts poured out. They were a motley lot, looking as run down and filthy as a pack of dogs, but it was what they brought with them that had everyone's attention. Three men, tightly bound and gagged. Two had the look of soldiers themselves, though they wore no colors over their travel-worn leathers. Empty sheaths and scabbards hung from their belts. The third man cowered in his bonds, his fine silken clothes torn and ruined by the sweat leaking out of him. His hair was shaved to mid-scalp, and the rest pulled back in a tail that mimicked a warrior's cue, but this man was clearly no fighter. He looked soft, despite his sun-bronzed skin. We were hunkered down beside a road on the far shore when this caravan came rolling along. Thick black stubble covered the man's chin, and long hair dangled in greasy locks. Three wagons pulled by oxen, which sprung an ambush. These survived. Mabishnu inspected the captives.